The Way to Truth by Mallory Ford Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel so you never miss an upload. Prologue Fall, 1899 Pine Creek, Texas Callum clutched the bouquet of flowers he'd picked for Rose, time seeming to have halted around them. Rose, I don't understand. He could barely breathe. What have I done? Tears flowed down her cheeks, marring her beautiful features. Her normally captivating strawberry blonde hair was a mess as they stood on her family's front porch, her eyes darting back toward the curtained windows of the large White House every few seconds. I'm sorry, Callum. I'm so sorry. You didn't do anything, but I just can't marry you. The words, once she'd just spoken a moment before, twisted the knife in his gut. She'd missed the Harvest Festival, something she'd been looking forward to, and he'd come to check on her. The flowers, a last-minute decision as he passed his mother's garden, now fell from his hand in a crumpled heap at their feet. The petals that fell from the mangled blooms mirrored the pain that clenched his heart. As though of their own accord, his hands came up to settle on each of her arms. Please, whatever has happened, we can work through it together. Just talk to me. Shaking her head, sobs shaking Rose's small frame. I can't, as much as I want to, I can't. Her hands clutched the skirt of the pretty blue dress she wore, one he'd complimented her on a hundred times. The war waging within her was clear on her face until she lifted both hands and her head fell forward into them. Callum wished with everything in him that he could fix whatever it was that had hurt her. Whatever it was that had convinced her she couldn't marry him. This doesn't make any sense, Callum said as he let go of her arms. I saw you yesterday at the bakery, and everything was fine. Is it cold feet? Are we moving too quickly for you? He wasn't sure how that could be the case, as he'd courted her for years before she agreed to go on a date with him, but he'd do whatever was necessary to save their relationship. If you're not ready, we can dash. Rose put up a hand, cutting him off. No, Callum. Please, just, just don't ask questions. I can't answer them. Raising her eyes to meet his gaze, he noticed a wholly unfamiliar look there. Her forest green eyes looked almost haunted. You can't tell me not to ask questions, he growled. If something's wrong, if you're in danger, I won't leave you alone. She'd been acting odd since just before he asked her to marry him the month before, then she wanted to keep their impending wedding quiet, but he'd thought it was just nerves. But maybe it went much deeper. She shook her head furiously. I'm not in danger, Callum. Just, please, leave it alone. If you love me like you say you do, you'll leave it alone. No words could have cut him deeper. If I love you like I say I do? He struggled to keep his voice down. I've loved you since I was 14. The day they came back to school after the summer Rose had gone to stay with her aunt in Austin. She'd left a girl in braids and returned a young woman. That scene would be etched in his mind forever. He'd been in the schoolyard with his cousins playing baseball, and Simon had nearly beamed him in the face with a pitch he'd been so distracted as she walked up. She hadn't given him the slightest bit of attention until after he graduated and toned down some of his flirting a little. But since then, they'd been on a slow and steady path to marriage, or so he'd thought. Nothing, he continued, desperate to make her believe his words. Nothing will make me stop loving you. She let out another sob and glanced back at her house as the sun set behind the trees, to the west. Seeing her like that, all he wanted to do was pull her into his arms and calm her. He moved to do just that, uncaring of the consequences, when she placed both hands on his chest and pushed him backwards. Don't. I can't, she said with a hiccup. Please don't tell anyone we were engaged. Don't tell anyone about this. We can go back to how we were, we can be fr- dash. Don't say friends, Rose. Don't you dare say friends. There was no way he could be friends with Rose after he'd built his whole future with her in mind. He'd purchased the land north of the Circle H, and he'd planned to visit Rose's father in the coming months about a building loan for their cabin. I can't be friends with you. The hurt in her eyes made him wish he could pull the words back, but they were true regardless.
He couldn't just be friends with her, not when he knew what it felt like to love her and have her love him back. Rose nodded solemnly before taking a step toward her front door. I'll always love you, Callum Carmichael. I probably shouldn't say that right now, but I need you to know that. What I'm doing, it's for your own good as well as mine. She stepped through the large oak door at the home her family had moved to after her father took over at the bank, the one just next door to it, and took wobbly steps inside. The click of the lock from the inside felt like it blocked him from more than the inside of the house, it felt like she just shut and locked the door on his entire future. At least, the only future he wanted. Chapter 1. May 1900. Pine Creek, Texas. Uncle Jake rushed forward, Circle H, branding iron in hand. You flip him over, and I'll get him branded, Cal. The sun beat down on them as they finished up the last few busy days of branding cattle that had been born that spring. It was tough work, but the satisfaction of seeing the Circle H brand on the calves they prayed so hard for was worth it. The heat might have been stifling but it was nothing compared to what they'd experience later on through the summer or on the cattle drive in August. For that, Callum was thankful. Following Uncle Jake's lead, Callum deftly flipped the calf onto his side so his uncle could do the branding as quickly as possible. The cry the calf let out at the feel of the hot iron on his flesh was loud, but it only lasted a second before Uncle Jake nodded. Callum let the calf loose to join his mama. Is that the last of them? I think so, Jake said before turning to where his foreman Ray perched atop his mount, counting each branded calf. Is that it? Ray nodded. Yes, sir, that's it. Uncle Jake whistled loudly enough for the rest of the hands to hear, and everyone jogged forward to hear what he had to say. He grinned, the familiar easy temperament Callum had always shared with his uncle until recent months. Well done, fellas. This may be our best year yet, and I know Beth and I have all of you to thank for that. The cow hands, most of which were generally uncomfortable with too much praise, stood awkwardly with hands in their pockets. Ray, Callum's cousins Simon and Nicholas, and longtime cowboys Mateo, Julian, Jr., Eduardo, and the rest of the ranch hands had worked hard through their spring branding. A handful of other traveling cowboys had been hired through the end of the season, when they'd take their cut from the drive and move along. Uncle Jake dismissed them and clapped a hand on Callum's shoulder. I'm right proud of ya, son. I hate to lose you when you go off to work your own herd, but I know you'll make a fine rancher. Callum sighed. He'd finally saved enough of a down payment to ask the bank for a building loan, unwilling to take any of the money his family offered to give him. Not that it would matter much anyway. Not anymore. Thank you, Uncle Jake. I should be able to get a small cabin set up out there over the summer, then I'll work on building my herd with my cut of the summer cattle drive money. Compassion filled his uncle's face. I'm glad you decided to still move forward with your plans, even after, he paused, even after everything happened. Everything meaning Rose. His family, save Malachi, still didn't know Callum and Rose had been engaged, but they knew enough to know she'd drastically altered his plans for the future when she cut things off. Thank you. I appreciate all you've done for me, all you've taught me. Uncle Jake had taught Callum everything he knew about ranching and had worked hard to train him to be ready for his own herd one day. Every summer since he turned 13, he'd worked as a ranch hand and done every task a ranch had to offer. No grunt work had been too dirty or long for Callum as he relished the opportunity to learn from such a successful outfit. After he graduated, he didn't even think he'd ever asked Uncle Jake for an official job. He just moved his things into the bunkhouse and started receiving his pay with the rest of the men. About that, Uncle Jake said as he ran a hand through his blonde beard. I know you don't want to take any money from the family to get started, and I can respect that, but I have an offer that might interest you. Callum's eyes narrowed. What kind of offer? Cows bellowed in the background, a sound Callum was as used to as he was folks talking to him. Cows might be unpredictable, but he preferred their surprises to the kind humans doled out. His uncle motioned for Callum to follow him, and they headed toward where their horses were tied to a tree by the creek. I'd like to give you some of your first herd to get going, but as an investment of sorts. He removed his old Stetson from atop his head and wiped his forehead with a cloth before untying his mount's lead rope. 
I'd like to give you your first 100 beeves with the agreement that I'll earn back 10% of your profits for the next 5 years. Callum wasn't overly strong in math, but his limited skills told him how lopsided that deal likely was. If you do that, you'd deserve much more than 10%. The man waved his hand in front of his face. Son, I worked hard to earn the respect of Mr. Hyatt when I inherited the ranch from him. You've done the same for me. Now, I'd have been more than happy to just give you the cattle, but I know you're too proud for that. You've worked hard for me over the years, and I'll barely miss 100 head. For you, it's a leg up for your future. Callum thought it over, his pride warring with his reason. All right, I'll take it. He put out a hand, still in some disbelief over the blessing he'd just been given. Thank you. It's my pleasure. A few hours later, Callum reclined on his bed in the long, wooden bunkhouse. Windows let in enough light to see, but not enough to make it tough to sleep. He, along with Matteo and Julian, had all come back and opened the windows for a bit of a breeze. They'd been given the rest of the day off, and he thought he might get a nap. Just as he drifted off, the door slammed open and the boisterous laughter of his twin cousins, Simon and Nicholas, filled the air. Cal, Simon said much too loudly as he tapped Callum's shoulder. Get up, we've got news for you. Ray followed them inside, hopefully to tell them they'd be on light duty the next day. He and Uncle Jake often did their best to give them some time off after seasons of long hours. For the moment, he just leaned against the wall and glanced out the door as more of the hands piled in. Callum sat up, his nap long gone. What news? Identical grin split Simon and Nicholas's faces. We got you a date with Sophie Hightower. Callum's heart sank. How many times did he have to tell the twins he wasn't interested in courting anyone? He took a deep breath and shook his head, willing himself not to knock the twins' heads together in an effort to get them to listen. No. See, we knew you were gonna say that, Simon replied. But you don't know the whole story. So, here's what happened dash. I don't care what happened, Callum said firmly. Sophie's a nice girl, but I'm not interested. Sophie really was a sweet young woman, smart too. She worked as his sister Edie's nurse in the clinic, often alone as Edie was called out to the sawmill or needed by her children. As pregnant as Edie was now, he had no doubt Sophie would be picking up more slack than normal. She'd make some man a fine wife someday, just not him. Nicholas opened his mouth to argue, but Callum stood and crossed the room. Ray, Callum said, I assume you're not here to try and get me a girl. Did you have something to tell us? Ray's lips twitched in the corner. I do. I was waiting on the rest of the men, but I guess I'll just tell them when they get here. You've got the rest of the week on light duty, so use it to rest up. Every man in the room grinned. Light duty still had an hour or two of work in the morning, just ensuring the cattle had plenty of food and water, the horses were taken care of, and everything was accounted for, but it was a far cry from their normal tasks. Perfect, Nicholas said as he approached Callum. Then you being tired won't be an excuse not to go out with us and the girls. Callum didn't even ask what girls his cousins had roped into spending time with them, but he imagined Sophie wanted to participate even less than he did. She didn't strike him as the kind who'd scheme to get a man. The answer's still no. Ah, come on, Nicholas said before he glanced at Ray and threw up a hand in Callum's direction. Ray, don't you think it's time he moved on? Ray ran a hand over his face and sighed. He'd grown up on the Circle H too, his father coming out to work cattle after President Lincoln freed the slaves. Ray was a good bit older than Callum, but he'd always felt more like an older brother than Callum's fellow ranch hand or boss. His cow sense and quiet wisdom had also made him the perfect choice for foreman. No, boys, I don't. Callum knows his mind. He'll move on if and when he's ready. Matteo and Julian, two of the men who'd been at the Circle H as long as Callum had, nodded along. Both were well above him in age, but neither had ever married that he knew of. Have it your way, Simon said as he made his way toward the door. We'll just have to break Sophie's heart for you. Callum shook his head as he watched them leave. He couldn't be too angry with them, neither of them had ever loved anyone the way he'd loved Rose. The way he'd love her for the rest of his days.
Ray put a hand on his shoulder. Don't do anything before you're ready, Cal, but don't waste your life wishing for what was either. He was probably right, but Callum couldn't just turn off the feelings he'd held for years. If only it were that easy. Rose finished scrubbing the last of the Jensen's laundry on the washboard. Her chapped hands screamed at her to step away from the lye soap. Ever since she'd started taking in laundry to help with family finances, it seemed they stayed red, angry, and peeling. The goat's milk soap Abigail had given her had helped tremendously, but she'd run out and couldn't bring herself to ask for more. To do so would likely strike up yet another conversation in which Helen demanded answers Rose couldn't give her. If there was anyone in the world who didn't take no for an answer, it was Helen Jones. Wringing out the last of the garments into the washtub, she grabbed hold of the basket of wet clothes and stood to hang them on the line, her lower back aching right along with her hands. The braid she'd haphazardly thrown her curly locks into had wrestled free of their ribbon and limp strands hung about her face. Oh papa, she said quietly, why did you do this to us? She'd never truly asked him what motivated him to invest most of the town's money in the mineral rights scam he'd been hoodwinked by. Greed, she supposed, was a powerful motivator. It had been nearly eight months since Papa had come home that evening, face bright red and pouring sweat. He'd paced in his study for hours, finally breaking down late into the evening after one too many glasses of scotch and lack of sleep. Rose would never forget the defeated look in his eyes the night he'd told them he'd lost everyone's money and it would take all they had in savings to keep folks from finding out. Mama had taken to bed that very night from the shock, and suddenly Rose was in charge of day-to-day -day household tasks. The household tasks weren't too difficult with her sisters Violet and Bonnie to help, but Bonnie was still in school, and Violet nannied for a widower in town five days a week. As soon as Papa had laid the situation out before them, Rose began taking in laundry and working as many hours at the bakery as she could. The official word was that she was saving her money for some traveling she wanted to do, but nothing could be further from the truth. Helen hadn't believed that story either. As she pinned one of Polly Jensen's dresses over the line, the light spring breeze aiding the drying process, Rose fought back tears at how different her life looked than it had a year ago. She worked from sunup to sundown every day to keep food on the table and clothes on her sister's backs. Every dime Papa made went back into people's accounts people who had no idea it was missing. Most days, Rose only got one square meal at home and did her best to eat something at the bakery. Still, the purple calico dress she wore, one Callum always thought looked so pretty on her, hung on her thin frame. Taking a deep breath, she smoothed her flyaway locks back as best she could before taking a pair of Randolph Jensen's pants to hang over the line as well. Crying over Callum and her dream of being his wife would do no good. Callum. Their relationship had to be the greatest casualty in all that had happened. The day Papa confessed, the day Mama took to bed, had been the night before the Harvest Festival. The look in his eyes when she'd broken his heart would haunt her forever, but he was better off without her anyway. She couldn't leave her sisters or Mama, not now. Papa had acted oddly about her relationship with Callum for a few months before they got engaged, but the night everything came to light, he outright forbade her to continue their relationship. He said his father, Sheriff Carmichael, couldn't mind his own business. Finishing up the last of the laundry and checking her watch, she glanced at her reflection in the outside window. Not that it mattered anymore, but even she could see all the light had gone from her eyes. Her shoulders drooped in a way they never had, and her cheeks were sunken to highlight the dark circles under her eyes. No use fretting about what you can't change, she chided herself. Hurrying not to be late to her shift at the bakery. She placed the basket back on the porch and did her best to put the dream of what could have been from her head. It was a far cry from the day Callum had told her he'd purchased the land north of the Circle H, that had been one of the best days of her life. He'd picked her up and twirled her around, the deed firmly in hand. It had been the first step to the rest of their lives, and now he'd have to take the next ones without her. Chapter 2 Callum debated with himself, as he did every week, as he and his gelding Rudy approached town. Clouds had rolled in overhead, and a breeze from the northwest floated across the pastureland, filling the air with the sound of tall grasses rustling. Should he still be visiting the bakery every week? 
At first, it had been his only chance to see Rose at all, not that she was always there when he stopped in. She came to church but sat in the back with her father and sisters, all but ignoring him. Since then, it had become more about checking on her, as she'd looked more and more worn down every week. She wouldn't talk to him about it, wouldn't talk to anyone, but something in him wouldn't let him walk away. Knowing what the Lord would have him do in the situation with Rose had been difficult. It was tough not to let the bitterness cloud his prayers, especially when he sometimes felt like the Lord wasn't listening anyway. A year before he'd been so certain that Rose was part of the future the Lord had for him. Now, as he looked out onto the pasture land on either side of the road, he wondered if he'd been wrong all along. Most days, it felt as if his prayers for answers got no further than the ceiling. Hopefully, the rain wouldn't come in for the next few minutes, or he'd be dripping water all over the bakery floor. It wasn't something he expected Helen or Rose to appreciate. The sky didn't look too threatening yet, but he could always stay overnight with his parents if the bottom dropped out. He'd left the bunkhouse shortly after the twins did, but waited long enough for them to be well ahead of him coming to town. The last thing he wanted was for Simon and Nicholas to witness him going into the bakery, though he imagined his whole family knew he was a frequent customer. Maybe one day he'd be able to forget Rose, but not today. Town came into sight, the livery and parsonage the first beacons that he'd gotten close. He nudged Rudy into a trot and closed the last of the distance, passing the mercantile, jailhouse, and dress shop Aunt Beth used to own with Aunt Abigail. He passed the bank as well, scowling as he normally did. Mr. Gilbert had more to do with the demise of their engagement than Rose had let on, of that he was sure. A thousand scenarios had run through Callum's head over the past eight months, none of them sitting any better in his gut than the last. Was Mr. Gilbert involved in something he shouldn't be? There was also the question of where Rose's mother had been for all this time. She'd apparently been fighting some illness, but the family had refused Edie's many offers to come see her. None of it made any sense, and Callum was quickly losing his patience over the unanswered questions. Approaching the bakery, the light blue exterior with white shutters calmed his racing heart. Despite the pain of seeing Rose there week after week, seeing her get thinner and more gaunt each time, it had always been a special place for them. It had been where they had their first kiss and where he'd finally gotten her to agree to court him. It had been over a picnic by the creek, complete with pastries from her work, that he'd told her he loved her and wanted to marry her one day. He'd picked her up after work multiple times as they went on walks through town and dreamed of their future. The bakery was more than a shop to him, and it always would be. The bell over the door jingled as he opened it and stepped over the threshold. A loud crash in the kitchen told him Helen was likely on another recipe testing frenzy as she was the mastermind behind most of the unique and delicious wares they sold. Rose was good with numbers, just like her father. When Mrs. Ida had moved away to live with her daughter, it had been with the assurance that Helen would run the kitchen and Rose would keep them in profit. Diners filled the small number of tables, and Callum knew Rose wouldn't be able to talk long even if she'd wanted to. He took a seat at the last, small table and waited for either Rose or Helen to appear behind the counter. He didn't have to wait long, as Rose quickly surfaced from the back of the shop holding two dessert plates in each hand, her apron decidedly cleaner than Helen's always was while working. She wore the purple calico dress he'd always loved, but the way it hung loose off her thin frame set his lips in a thin line. She clearly wasn't eating enough, and the look of her eyes told him she wasn't resting enough either. His fists clenched, and he stared at his feet long enough to work the anger out of his jaw at whatever circumstances had brought Rose to this point. The last few times he'd seen her hands, they were chapped and angry from all the laundry she'd taken in. He didn't believe for a minute that she'd been working herself into the ground to go traveling. As much as she'd enjoyed the visits with her aunt in Austin, Rose had never been bitten by wanderlust. Helen, he could believe, but not Rose. The sound of chairs scraping across the floor jarred him from his thoughts as he watched Rose scurry to clear the table's plates. He itched to rise to his feet and help her but knew from experience it wouldn't be welcome. She passed by quickly, the tray of dirty dishes stacked high and barely glanced his way as she spoke. I'll be with you in a moment. I'm in no rush, he replied. She slowed, though didn't quite stop, and it was clear she hadn't looked long enough to realize he was her next customer. Take all the time you need. Her back turned to him as she rounded the counter.
She shook her head lightly. Hopefully, the double meaning of his words would sink in. She wasn't alone, and he didn't plan on going anywhere for the foreseeable future. Perusing the menu, Callum noticed Helen had added cinnamon rolls and three new muffin flavors to it. A small grin spread over his face as pride for his cousin's talents moved through him. Helen had always been curious and creative, but she'd found her passion with baking. All right, Rose said as she appeared at his table. She brushed a lock of hair from her face and raised her notepad and pencil. What can I get for you? He hesitated. Should he try and strike up a conversation with her? Should he tell her about the deal with Uncle Jake? No, it wasn't the right time. I think I'd like a cinnamon roll and a cup of coffee. Rose nodded, taking his order with pursed lips. Anything else? He didn't dare speak his thoughts of what he'd really like from their encounter for the knowledge that he'd spook her and likely get a slap, across his face. What he really wanted was to kiss her again like he had when they had nothing ahead of them but hope and a future he could look forward to. No, he replied, that's all for now. Rose nodded, her dark green eyes meeting his for the first time since he'd walked in. She was still beautiful, she'd always be the most beautiful woman in the room, but everything about her had lost its luster and shine. Whatever had forced her into this situation was taking its toll on her, and Callum didn't think he could be patient for much longer before he went searching for answers. Rose's eyes missed it over, and she turned quickly to go back to her post behind the counter. He'd never done well with female tears, even those of his sisters. To see Rose fight so hard to keep them from spilling over onto her cheeks nearly broke his heart all over again. Not only that, but it made him want to put his fist through the face of whoever was responsible for it. He had a hunch it was her father but couldn't do anything about it until he knew for sure. Helen, Rose whispered as her friend put the last tray of colaches in the oven. Will you go out there and check on our diners? I'll watch everything back here. Staring into Callum's green eyes, only a few shades lighter than hers, had nearly been her undoing. She'd busied herself behind the counter while he ate, but didn't think she could go collect his money. The few hours of sleep she'd had over the last few nights weren't helpful in holding back her emotions, not to mention she desperately needed to pilfer a few of the colises Helen had already made, if she planned to make it to the end of her shift. As usual, they'd run out of eggs and bread that morning before she'd had a chance to eat, Bonnie eating more than normal due to a growth spurt. If nothing else, Rose would forever be proud of how she'd held back the worst of their situation from Bonnie, named for the beautiful blue bonnets of a Texas spring. The pan Helen held clacked against the oven grates as she slid it in. Why? Is everything all right? Her eyebrows rose with confusion, but Rose knew she'd figure it out as soon as she looked into the dining area. Please. It was all Rose could muster at the moment, as the stress was speeding up the faintness she always felt when she'd gone too long without eating. It wouldn't be long before her head would feel like it was swimming and her vision began to blur. Helen's eyes narrowed, but she didn't comment. All right, she said as she removed her soiled apron and replaced it with a clean one. I'll go take care of the customers for a bit, and you take your break. I have some extra colaches over there that we didn't sell this morning, will you finish them off for me? Both of them knew Helen had baked the extra food on purpose, but she'd stopped hounding Rose for answers about a month after she'd broken things off with Callum. The colaches were warm. The saltiness of the pork combining with the fluffiness of the pastry to create an experience Rose wished she could take the time to relish. Instead, her stomach growled loudly as the sound of the bell over the door jingled again, signaling her to get out front and take care of the rest of the customers. She stuffed another one into her mouth, leaving the last as a snack before she left for the evening. Most nights she was able to eat dinner, but occasionally they ran out before she had the chance. She'd always told Papa she grazed as she cooked and was no longer hungry, but truly she'd rather her sisters have full bellies than everyone get low rations. As normal as she could keep life for Violet and Bonnie, she would. Helen returned to the kitchen, knowing eyes trained on Rose. He's leaving now, and he told me to tell you to keep his change. It wasn't the first time Callum had left double or even triple what his food cost, the extra going as her tip. She split all tips with Helen, but lately she thought her friend was purposely miscounting to give her extra. Tips had gone up by half, but business hadn't grown that much, 
tell him thank you next time you see him. I'll see him tonight, Helen said as she poured another cup of flour into the mixing bowl. You're welcome to come to family dinner with us, it's at Uncle Matthew and Aunt Carissa's. Her eyebrows raised hopefully, but there was no way Rose could spend more time with Callum's family than absolutely necessary. Thank you for the invitation, but I need to get home. Helen's shoulders slumped, and Rose saw her debating with herself. You know, Rose, one day you're going to let the rest of us in on whatever's going on with you. We want to help, but we can't help you if you won't let us. The tears Rose had been fighting earlier threatened again, but she swallowed them down. Helen couldn't know what was wrong, and neither could Callum. Not only would they most assuredly get Sheriff Carmichael involved over the missing money, but Papa would never forgive her. Were it not for her mother and sisters, she could deal with his cutting her off, but she wouldn't abandon Violet and Bonnie when they needed her the most. She'd practically raised Bonnie due to Mama's frequent bouts with nerves and melancholy, feeling more mother than sister. I can't, Rose said. Just know that I wish I could. Helen's eyes softened and she crossed the kitchen to pull Rose into a tight hug. Your family. You're just as much my family as Edie and Lily are. I won't abandon you, and neither will Callum. Rose could no longer swallow down the drops that spilled over onto her cheeks. It wasn't just Callum she'd sacrificed due to Papa's misdeeds, she'd lost an entire family that had welcomed her in with open arms. Growing up, Papa had always provided for the family well, but he'd never been particularly loving. Mama had taught them everything they needed to know, but her nerves and disposition often got the better of her. As a result, Rose had provided much of the nurturing for her younger sisters, especially in more recent years when Mama had become more and more detached from the family. Her prayer was that her sisters would never want for affection the way she had. And in more recent months, that they would never feel the miserable pangs of hunger either. Callum's family had been a bomb, his mother and aunts opened with their warmth and affection as though they simply couldn't help themselves. Helen pulled back and handed Rose a clean rag to wipe her tears. Never forget it, your family. Chapter 3 Sweat poured from Frank Gilbert's brow as the man he only knew as Jack slammed him up against the wall of his office. Night had fallen, and the men he wished to heaven he'd never gotten involved with had descended upon his office once more. You're not gettin' cold feet, are ya Gilbert? Jack tightened his grip on Frank's collar until spots danced in his line of sight, and he struggled to draw a breath. N, N, no sir. Jack chuckled and released him, his nearly black eyes more and more sinister each time he summoned him. Frank gasped for breath, and his vision cleared once again until he could clearly see the man who'd haunted his nightmares for months. Jack's bushy dark eyebrows and thick mustache contrasted to the thinning locks atop his head. He was tall and muscular, at least an inch or two over Frank's six feet, but his confidence and the men he brought with him created an intimidating presence. I sure am glad Ola Tommy sent us your direction, Jack said as he tweaked Frank on the nose. It sure is a shame you lost all them folks' money, but it's worked out for us. The men around him grinned, and Frank had to swallow down the wretch that threatened to spill out onto the floor. If only he'd never met Tommy Pascal, he wouldn't be in this mess. The summer before, he'd met Tommy in Dallas and been convinced to heavily invest in the mineral rights of some property west of Pine Creek. Years ago, a company called Wilson Oil had come to Pine Creek and made a fair profit drilling, until they'd been forced out due to some unscrupulous business practices. It had made sense at the time that the property Tommy claimed was swimming with oil was indeed an underground gold mine. After Tommy brought in some business associates who wove tales of how much money they'd made off the land, Frank thought he'd invest money from the bank and make the people of Pine Creek some returns on their savings. Instead, he'd lost every dime. Then, to add insult to injury, a few months after he'd taken all their life savings and nearly every dime he made to keep the town from finding out, Tommy had told Jack about a banker who might be desperate enough to work with him for a percentage. At the time, Frank had been clawing for every raw cent and agreed out of pure hopelessness. Now, he was in too deep to back out without the whole operation coming down on him. Jack's boots clapped on the floor as his men began to load all the goods they'd stolen from various bank robberies, trains, and stagecoaches into the safe. 
After his last stash had been found by the U.S. Marshals, Jack had decided to keep his goods in the last place they'd look for an outlaw to keep his treasure, a bank. Frank still wasn't sure why Jack wanted to store the money rather than just divide it amongst his men to spend, but the last time he'd asked questions he got a swift punch to the gut. The last of the bags of cash went into the safe before Jack extinguished the low light from the lantern on Frank's desk. His gravelly voice filled the air as the safe closed with a soft click. I don't have to remind you what happens if you try and snitch on us, do I eh, Gilbert? He slammed his fist against Frank's chest before opening it to reveal a small wad of cash, Frank's cut and more cash he could put back into the accounts of the people of Pine Creek. More cash he could use to actually feed his family rather than relying on Rose and Violet. No sir, Gilbert stuttered even as shame rose up and threatened to choke him. You don't have to remind me. Callum walked down the steps of his parents' house that evening and let out a long breath. It was exhausting seeing his family and trying to pretend his heart wasn't firmly with a woman who lived no more than 100 yards away. The bank in Rose's house sat across the street and down past the mercantile. He could see it clearly from where he stood in the bright moonlight. Seeing Rose that morning had only strengthened his resolve to get to the bottom of whatever was going on. He couldn't mention anything to Pa until he had solid evidence, but the feeling in his gut had only intensified with the time that had passed. Something was wrong, and he suspected it had to do with her father. Frank Gilbert wasn't a bad father to Rose and her sisters, but he'd always been somewhat cold to them. Where Callum's family was warm and loving, Rose's had felt more like acquaintances who lived in the same household. She and her sisters were close, but neither parent seemed to pay them much mind. Mrs. Gilbert wasn't really to blame for her part, as Mr. Gilbert would never allow Dr. Light or Edie to treat her for her nerves. Still, it had made Rose's youth decidedly more difficult. Laughter spilled out from inside the house, and he figured he had a few minutes before anyone came looking for him. He could take off the fake smile he'd borne for months a bit longer. Callum relished in the silence around him until it was interrupted by the sound of a door opening and closing down the street. Boots sounded on the boardwalk outside the bank, and a small group of men walked out the door, apparently unaware of his presence. That was odd. The bank was closed, and most everyone else was home for the evening. The only reason he remained at his parents' house after the rest of his family left was that he had an early delivery, to pick up for Uncle Jake in the morning from the livery. Unable to help himself, Callum ducked and crept down the steps before moving behind the row of buildings that sat parallel to his childhood home. Small alleys ran between a few of them, and he figured he might be able to get close enough to make sure the men weren't up to no good. But then, he couldn't imagine why else they'd be at the bank this late. Logic screamed at him to go get Pa, the actual lawman in town, but Logic rarely won out when Rose was involved. And if the men at the bank were as unscrupulous as his gut told him they were, she might very well be in danger. Creeping up the alley beside the cafe, he ducked behind a barrel where he could see across the street to the bank. Mr. Gilbert stood on the boardwalk with the men, but he looked wholly uncomfortable to be there. He'd always held a considerable amount of girth around his middle, but he'd lost weight in recent months right along with Rose. Callum couldn't see his expression, and couldn't hear exactly what words he spoke to the balding, mustachioed man in front, but his hand shook as he reached out to shake the man's hand. Indecision warred within Callum. His instincts told him to go down that moment and tell Pa his suspicions, but meeting with men at night wasn't illegal. He couldn't even put words to his hunch, but just as he'd believed since that day last fall, Mr. Gilbert was behind Rose's decision to leave him. The men moved down the alleyway beside the bank, and Callum's fists clenched as they moved past Rose's window. He didn't know yet if Mr. Gilbert had done anything illegal, but if he found out that the man had put Rose in danger, it'd take an army to hold him back. They kept moving, and Callum let out the breath he hadn't realized he was holding. The soft sound of horses' whinnies drifted to him before all the men save Mr. Gilbert rode out to the south of town. He hadn't witnessed a crime, but the whole thing sat poorly with Callum, and he'd be keeping an eye on things in the coming days. The second he had any real proof of wrongdoing, he'd bring in Pa and Malachi. Rose might never forgive him if he got her father arrested, but he'd never forgive himself if something happened to her when he'd had the knowledge to stop it. Chapter 4 
Rose woke the next morning with a headache that stretched from her temple to the back of her neck. It wasn't all that surprising, as the last meal she'd had yesterday had been what she'd eaten at the bakery. Helen had given her another before she left mid-afternoon, but it had long since stopped satisfying her empty stomach. As happened on occasion, there hadn't been enough chicken and potatoes last night for them all, so she told her father she'd eaten at the bakery. The smile on Bonnie's face when Rose placed the fried chicken in front of her was worth the gnawing in her belly, but she couldn't help but hope Violet had been able to bring back more eggs from Mrs. Coulson after she delivered her mending. Their basket had run low yesterday morning, and Rose doubted there would be enough to feed everyone. There was only a small piece of bread left from yesterday's baking. Wiping the sleep from her eyes, Rose dressed in a soft blue gingham dress with a lace collar that had always made her feel delicate and feminine. In recent months, the collar had become worn from all the times she'd soiled it while doing laundry, but she couldn't help but wear it and dream of an easier time. Her door creaked as she opened it, but most of the house was probably awake already. She'd been up late the night before hanging out laundry for the Thompsons in the hopes that it would dry enough for her to deliver first thing this morning. Not only were they low on flour and eggs, but also sugar and a number of other dry goods from the mercantile. John and Rachel were always more than generous with what they allowed her to take in exchange for the laundry. Without their kindness, Rose didn't know how they'd make it. Papa stood in the kitchen munching on the last two slices of bread. Good morning, he said without looking up from the notebooks he scribbled in. You slept late today. Rose fought down the bitterness in her that surfaced every time her father made comments like that. I was up late finishing the Thompson's laundry. Her tone was clipped, but it was his fault their lives had been turned upside down. Apparently oblivious to her frustration, Papa nodded. And they don't suspect money troubles, right? You're telling them the money is for travel? Fighting the desire to roll her eyes, Rose thought how to answer the question without either lying or telling the complete truth. Her father assumed everyone paid her in cash, when instead most paid her in goods. There was no way the townspeople didn't suspect something, but everyone had been kind enough not to pry. I understand the gravity of the situation, Papa. Papa narrowed his eyes at her for a moment and opened his mouth to speak until Bonnie's light footsteps sounded from down the hall. Good morning, Papa, she said as she kissed him on the cheek. Good morning, Rose. Bonnie's arms went around Rose's waist in a tight embrace, and Rose returned it with gusto. Bonnie was twelve years old and had been the sweetest of surprises for the Gilbert family as they thought there would be no more children, after Rose and Violet. For a while, her infectious laugh and sweet personality had even brought Mama out of her melancholy, but not for long. With ten years separating them, Rose had raised Bonnie as much as if she were her mother. As she watched Papa greet Bonnie as though she were a business associate rather than his daughter before walking down the hall to the bedroom, she felt the weight of being both mother and father to the girl. After kissing Bonnie atop her dark blonde hair, Rose pulled back and tweaked her nose. I trust you slept well. She hadn't woken up to any nightmares in years, but Rose had spent quite a few nights rocking her to sleep even after she started school. Bonnie nodded feverishly. I did, but I'd have been in a good mood this morning regardless. We're going into the woods today, and Miss Johnson is going to show us all sorts of insects and plants to identify for our science projects. Eliza Johnson had been a surprising but perfect option to fill the role of teacher after Lily Hall had married and moved on. Not only was her father a staple out at the sawmill, even after the injury that could have claimed his life a few years back but Edie Brown's gentle coaxing had brought the whole family to church on a regular basis. They'd all made professions of faith, and Eliza had studied with Lily to take over the post. Bonnie raced over to the stove, then turned back with a frown. Where's breakfast? It's right here, Violet said as she breezed through the door. Mrs. Coulson said to tell you thank you, Rose. She didn't have as many eggs for us as she normally does but she said she'd bring us some more as soon as her hens end their laying strike. Fighting to keep the smile on her face so as to not alarm her sisters, Bonnie in particular, Rose took the basket of four measly eggs from Violet. It's all right, Papa's already eaten anyway, and we have a few left from yesterday. Thank you for helping with and delivering the mending for me. Violet grinned and tugged on Bonnie's braid. It was no trouble.
Of course, it wasn't, Bonnie teased, Elijah Coulson is home from college visiting his mother, and I'm sure you two found lots to talk about. Violet's fair skin turned red. I barely even saw him, Bonnie. Besides, Elijah wouldn't be interested in me, anyway. Rose swatted Violet with the dishrag in her hand. Don't you think that, not even for a minute. Violet was not only a beautiful young woman, with mama's dark brown hair and stunning hazel eyes, but she was smart and kind as well. Any man would be lucky to have you. Violet pinned her with a look as Bonnie set to cracking eggs in the pan. I could say the same for you. Bonnie was oblivious to the meaning behind Violet's words, but Rose knew exactly what her sister meant. Violet still didn't understand why Rose had broken things off with Callum, but she knew it had to do with Papa's misdeeds. Only two years younger than Rose's 22, Violet had been privy to much of the information Papa had divulged that evening while Bonnie was fast asleep. Rose hadn't let Violet take on more work than the nannying job she had for a wealthy widower in town, but Violet had done everything she could to take some of the weight off Rose's shoulders. Bonnie finished scrambling the eggs and dished them up onto three plates. Rose sighed. There was no way the measly serving would give her sisters the energy they needed until lunch. Ignoring the pang in her belly, Rose split her serving in half and divided it between her sisters. I've got a shift at the bakery this morning anyway, I'll just eat there. It was true, but her shift didn't start until nearly noon. Thanks, oh Rose, Bonnie said as she shoveled in her eggs so fast Rose imagined she'd give herself a stomachache. I've gotta get to school, but I'll see you when I get home. Wrapping Rose in another hug, she grabbed her lunch pail and took off skipping out the door. She'd enjoy the kolaches Helen sent home with Rose yesterday, and maybe they'd have one more day where she didn't have to understand all the ways her world had changed. Violet's soft steps approached. Rose, I'm worried about you. Your skin and bones, and that's now two meals that you've said you'll have at the bakery. You're working yourself to exhaustion when you could marry Callum and not have to be hungry every day. Keep your voice down, Rose hissed as she glanced back to her parents' bedroom door. If Papa hears you, he'll go on another tirade. Violet rolled her eyes. I don't think I care anymore about Papa's tirades. This is all his fault that we're in this situation. You'll barely let me help you with the laundry or mending, and you'll only let me do deliveries if you've been up so late the night before you can barely keep your eyes open. Let me help, Rose. You are helping, Rose said gently. The money you bring in helps more than you know, and between that and what I make at the bakery, we're going to be all right. You know, Violet said in a frustrated tone. If you just marry Callum, he'd probably take me and Bonnie as well. At least until I get married. Rose's eyebrows shot up. Is there someone I should know about, Violet? I know Bonnie teased me about Elijah, and I doubt he even knows I exist. But Mr. Paulson told me once he'd marry me instead of just having me nanny for him. It would help take me off your hands, and I love the children already. Mr. Paulson was a good man, a lawyer who'd lost his wife to consumption a few years prior, but that wasn't what she wanted for Violet. The man is nearly twice your age. You deserve a man who makes your head spin. It was what she'd had with Callum, and she wanted it for her sisters. So do you, Rose, but your sense of duty to us holds you back. Violet placed one hand on Rose's arm and squeezed lightly. Don't work your life away because you've resigned yourself to being Bonnie's surrogate mother. I know Callum would take her in, and I could probably find a place of my own anyway. The parsonage cottage is free. Lily told me so. Rose shook her head, tears filling her eyes at the hope she saw in Violet's. You know Papa would never let us take Bonnie. Us moving out, even if I got married, would look terrible on him if we took Bonnie with us. He'll never allow it, and I won't leave her. All the stress of the morning had caught up with her now, and the familiar swimming head she experienced when she'd missed too many meals caught up with her. Blinking rapidly to make it go away, she pulled from Violet's grasp. Promise me you'll only marry for love, not out of some desire to make life easier for me. Black dots swam before her vision, but she willed herself to stay upright. Violet let out a long breath. All right, but I want to help more. This isn't healthy for you. Just be happy, Vi. Rose did her best to summon a smile despite her swirling head. 
That's all I want for you. Callum strapped down the last of the grain delivery for Uncle Jake in the buckboard. Thanks, Pete. We appreciate it. Pete, the livery owner and a good friend of his parents, tipped his hat forward. My pleasure. Just tell your uncle he can settle up next time he's in town. Will do, Callum replied and moved to climb into the driver's seat. As he did so, he spotted the familiar strawberry blonde hair that filled his dreams during the night and thoughts during the day. Rose stepped out onto her front porch with a basket full of laundry. Something about her looked off, and it wasn't just because her hair threatened to come loose and her blue gingham dress hung on her too thin frame. She listed to the side, and Callum hopped down and ran the thirty or so yards to where she collapsed to the ground in a heap. His heart beat wildly and not just from the sprint he just employed to get to Rose. He skidded to a stop inches from her and put a hand to her clammy forehead. Her face was pale, paler than normal, and the bones in her face jutted out at harsh angles from her low weight. Rose, he pleaded as he stroked her face. Rose, wake up. Had she simply fainted? Or was something much bigger wrong with her? Looking around, he noticed a few people had stopped to look at what was happening and had created a bit of a bottleneck on the boardwalk. Knowing Rose, she wouldn't want to be a spectacle. Moving the laundry basket to the side, he lifted her to his chest and prepared to take her to Edie's clinic, praying she was in town today. It wasn't the first time he'd lifted Rose, and his jaw clenched at how much lighter she felt as he hurried down the boardwalk. Something was very wrong with her, and he wouldn't let her leave the clinic until Edie figured out what it was. She'd fight him, of that he was sure, but it didn't matter. He was done accepting the way of things simply because something at home had pulled her from his arms. This was the woman he loved more than he knew possible, and they'd be fighting whatever it was together. The bell above Edie's clinic door jingled as he barged in, only keeping the tiniest of reins on the panic welling up inside him. Edie. Edie, come quick. I'd rushed, or more accurately waddled, out of the patient room. She was weeks away from giving birth to her third child, but moved with the purpose of a woman not expecting. Is that Rose? Bring her back here and lay her down. Callum moved to follow her instructions as her nurse Sophie rifled through cabinets and pulled out a vial of smelling salts. Yes, she was delivering laundry this morning and fainted just outside their fence. I don't know what's wrong, but she's lost more and more weight recently. Edie nodded. I've noticed. And her mother's not been seen in public for months. She waved the salts in front of Rose's nose. I've tried to get Mr. Gilbert to let me take a look at his wife, but he won't let me near her. A low growl emanated from Callum's throat as he thought of Rose's father and the men he'd met with last night. He had something to do with all this, of that Callum was certain. He had a meeting with the man the next day to apply for his building loan, something he decided to move forward on regardless of where he stood with Rose. It would take every ounce of his self-control not to run his fist into Mr. Gilbert's face over letting his daughter get to this point. He'd heard of women starving themselves to gain a certain look or due to emotional distress, but Helen said Rose ate nearly anything she could give her at the bakery. No, he'd bet his boots they were short on cash and Rose gave her portion to her sisters. It would explain everything. Sophie ran a damp rag down Rose's face as Edie continued to hold the salts under her nose. After a few more seconds, Rose's eyes fluttered open and she took in her surroundings with confusion. Her dark green eyes met his and widened in alarm. Callum? What are you doing here? Where am Dash brows rising in recognition, she sat up quickly and listed to the side once more. Callum's arms wrapped around her to steady her, but the anger on her face was evident. You fainted, and I brought you to the clinic. His gaze bore into hers, as he silently begged her to see reason. Please, let Edie help you. Rose shook her head. I'm fine. I just missed breakfast when I lost track of time doing the dash, her head whipped around, panicked eyes searching the room. Where's the Thompson's laundry? Edie, ever the voice of reason, but her hand on Rose's shoulder. Callum will go get the laundry while you rest for a minute and we talk. Or he can even do the delivery for you. You said it was John and Rachel's? Rose slumped, her defeated posture cutting Callum to the quick.
Yes, just let them know I'll be by later to get our things. It was on the tip of his tongue to ask her to give him a list and he'd not only shop for what she asked for, but fill her pantry to groaning. But he refrained. Rose's pride was a force to be reckoned with, and he knew what it took to get her to agree to let him do the delivery. His eyes met his sister's, and she nodded over Rose's head. Edie would help her, and she wouldn't let her leave before he got back. If there was one thing he knew, it's that Edie Carmichael, now brown, generally got her way. Thankfully, very little of the clean laundry had fallen out of the basket, and that which had was easily beaten clean. Rachel Thompson was gracious about the delivery and the few spots of dirt from where the clothes had fallen out, even more so when Callum told her an abridged version of what had happened. Oh no. She said as she brought her hand to her mouth. Is she all right? I think so, Callum said quietly. She'd woken by the time I left to get the laundry, and I imagine Edie will have given her something to help by the time I get back. Rachel shook her head, her lips set in a grim line. What that girl needs is food, and lots of it. I try to give her more than we originally agreed on when she does the laundry, but she won't take it. I'd give her more work, but she's already worked to the bone as it is. I don't know how else to help her. You're not the only one, Callum said. Rachel leaned closer and lowered her voice to a whisper. I don't know what's going on in that house, but I don't believe for a minute Rose is just trying to save money to travel. Not only would she never leave Bonnie, but she's just working too hard for something frivolous. Callum didn't reply, but Rachel had just echoed the thoughts he'd been having for months. It went much deeper than anyone had been told. Chapter 5 Rose bit into the ham and cheese Edie had given her, trying to ignore how delicious the welcome food was in her current state. Thank you, Edie. Expression full of compassion, Edie placed her hand on Rose's shoulder. Rose, before this meal, when was the last time you ate? A sigh escaped before Rose could stop it, and she wished she could pull the crisp white covers of the patient bed over her head. Around three yesterday, I just got busy and forgot to eat. Edie's brows furrowed, but she didn't pry. Do you work at the bakery today? Yes, Rose nodded as she noted how much better she felt already. She tried not to wolf down the ham and cheese, but couldn't deny how pleasant it felt to have something coating her belly. The clock on the wall told her it was already past ten. I'll need to go over shortly. All right, Edie said as she handed Rose a second cup of water. Just take it easy, all right? Has Mrs. Ida been by recently? Ida Davis was the widow who owned the bakery but lived in Hunter's Gap with her daughter and son-in-law. She came by occasionally to see how things were going, but generally left the work up to Helen and Rose. With Helen's creativity in the kitchen and Rose's head for numbers and business, it had worked out nicely. No, she doesn't come by as much in the winter and the spring has been wetter than normal. I expect she'll be by before too long. Edie nodded, and Rose hoped she didn't plan to bring up what happened with Mrs. Ida. She needed this job, needed it to put what little food they had on the table and keep Bonnie in dresses with how fast she grew. Boots clapped on the boardwalk outside the clinic again, and the outside door opened moments before Callum appeared in the doorway to the patient room. His eyes were closed as he spoke hesitantly. Can I come in? Rose couldn't help but chuckle and realized how long it had been since she'd felt any real humor. When she'd been with Callum, it seemed he stopped at nothing to make her laugh. It's fine, come on in. His eyes opened, and Rose tried not to remember how expressive they were. To the world, Callum's eyes were the same beautiful light green as his father's. To Rose, they were a window into all his thoughts and feelings if one looked hard enough. Right now, they held an ocean of meaning, worry and compassion chief among them. Are you feeling better? He reached toward her but pulled his hand back. You gave me a scare. The worry made Rose uncomfortable, and she shifted on the bed. I'm sorry, but as I said, I'm fine now. She turned to where Edie organized and catalogued her vials of medicine. Edie, is it all right if I get on over to the bakery? The doctor looked like she had more to say, but nodded. Yes, but please make sure you eat something when you get there. That ham and cheese won't last long on your feet all day. I will, Rose nodded before reality slammed into her.
She didn't have any money to pay Edie, nor did she have any goods to barter for her services. I, um, I'll settle up with you Dash. Don't worry about it, Edie said with a wave of her hand. All I did was give you a place to come to and give you a little food. But please, Rose, try to take care of yourself. I know you're accustomed to putting yourself last, but you won't be any use to your family if you don't start eating more. Heat rose up and rose at the feeling of being scolded. She slid out of the bed and stood too quickly, swaying just a little. Callum held out both hands to steady her, but she jerked away. Thank you both for your help. I'll just get going now. The sound of Callum following her only increased her humiliation. Rose, stop. Please don't leave yet. She stopped and whirled around, knowing her reaction lacked the graciousness his help deserved, but couldn't help it. What? Callum stopped short as though she'd punched him, then closed the distance between them in two long strides. Are you sure you have to go to the bakery today? I'm sure Helen could handle Dash. Callum, I told you I'm fine. I can't take a day off work, not for something like this. Bitterness at her father rose up again. She did a better job of hiding it than Violet did, but Rose couldn't deny how the thought of his getting them into this mess soured in her belly. She took a deep breath and did her best to soften her tone. I appreciate your concern, but it's unnecessary. I simply forgot to eat, and it caught up with me. He ripped the Stetson off his head and ran his fingers through his light brown hair. That's not all it was, and you know it. You've been losing weight for months, your clothes hang off you now, and your hands look like a cowboy's from all the laundry you've been doing. There's more to this whole thing you're not telling me, and I've about lost my patience being left in the dark. The comments about her weight and her hands stung more than he knew. It's none of your business, Callum, you've been released from any responsibility over me. And I'm sorry if I'm no longer as attractive to you as I once was, but that ought to make it all the more natural for you to move on. His eyes went wide as saucers. Ah. Uh. Rose, I didn't mean it like Dash. No, she said as she held up a hand. I don't care how you meant it, it doesn't matter anyway. Thank you for delivering the laundry to the Thompsons, and for getting me to Edie's. Good day. She spun on her heel and stomped down the boardwalk toward the bakery. A lack of footsteps behind her told her Callum hadn't followed her but she didn't dare look back for fear he'd see the tears welling in her eyes. Of course he hadn't meant the comments about her appearance like they sounded, but they still hurt nonetheless. Folks on the street eyed her warily as they passed by. Whether from her earlier episode or the way she moved with fury now, she didn't know or care. They gave her a wide berth, and for that Rose was thankful. Reaching the bakery, she wrenched open the door and met Helen's surprised gaze with a scowl. I don't want to talk about it. Helen's eyebrow rose as she nodded, but she didn't say anything as she moved from the cash register around the counter holding a broom. The breakfast customers were long gone, and they likely wouldn't get another rush of customers until the afternoon. Rose rounded the glass case holding their treats, the cinnamon rolls and muffins, calling to her still not full belly. You can get going when you're done if you want. Her friend hesitated for just a moment, her fiery red hair sparkling in the sun that shone through the window. Are you sure? I didn't really expect you to be in today. I heard Dash. You heard I fainted, Rose finished flatly. As I keep telling everyone, I'm fine, and this whole town needs to mind their own business, your family included. Rose knew she was being completely unreasonable, but she couldn't help it. It wasn't fair, none of it was fair. The fact that she'd lost the one man who'd made her feel wanted for who she was, not for what she could do for everyone else. Losing his family right along with him. Bonnie having to grow up in this mess of a life just because their father had fallen for some scam. Papa's insistence that no one could know what he'd done. Violet considering marrying a man she could never love simply to give her one less mouth to feed. Mama taking to bed when they needed her the most. None of it was fair. Her face must have relayed the raging emotions within her, as Helen leaned the broom against the wall and hurried around the counter to pull her into a tight hug. She rubbed Rose's back and murmured soothing words. It's going to be all right. You're not alone.
her assurances only broke Rose further, and the dam just barely holding her tears back shattered. The tears she'd not allowed herself to cry fell in droves, and Helen just held her tight as though the shoulder of her light yellow dress wasn't soaked with Rose's tears. After allowing herself one more moment, Rose collected herself and pulled back with a sniff. I'm sorry for what I said. You didn't deserve it. Helen handed her a clean napkin and quirked up one corner of her mouth. Maybe not, but I'd be a hypocrite not to forgive the occasional fit and rashly spoken words. She winked, and Rose chuckled again for the second time that day. Her friend was normally the one to light up any room, but she had the tendency to fly off the handle now and again. Where Rose's emotions were buried deep down, visible only to those who knew her best, Helen simmered just below the surface. Between that and her deep love of dime novels, Helen was often mistaken for immature, but Rose knew there was much more to her. Her compassion and empathy ran deeper than anyone Rose had ever known, and she provided sanctuary to anyone who needed an understanding ear. Rose wiped her eyes and blew her nose on the napkin, trying not to think about how dreadful she must look after her crying jag. Thank you. Smoothing a lock of Rose's hair from her face that had come loose from its long braid, Helen grinned. Your family, it's what we do for family. That evening, Callum sat at the ranch's kitchen table with Pa and Uncle Jake. He hadn't told them about the men Gilbert met with, wanting to take a little more time to observe, but everything else had come spilling out. Pa sat back in his chair. But Edie said she'd be all right for now? He ran a hand over his beard, his brow furrowed in thought. Yes, for now. But if she doesn't start eating more and resting the way a person ought, Edie's afraid she'll do more than just faint. His gut twisted at the idea of something happening to Rose. Not being with her the rest of the day had severely messed with his concentration, but he could conjure up no reason to stay in town after she'd gone to the bakery. Uncle Jake shook his head, the frustration evident on his face. Gilbert ought to be ashamed of himself. I've half a mind to go banging on his door and bring all three of his girls here with us. It ain't like we don't have the room. Callum had to agree. I understand, Pa said calmly, but you can't go kidnapping young women because they've lost weight. He paused and thought for another moment. What I don't get is why Rose broke it off with you in the first place. It would seem that one less mouth to feed would have been a blessing if they're truly struggling for money. Absent-mindedly following the wood grain in the dining room table with his finger, Callum shook his head. She'd never leave Bonnie. Rose is more Bonnie's mother than she is her sister. His uncle's brow furrowed. But Rose was only what, eight or nine when Bonnie was born? Ten, Callum verified. Her mother has struggled with melancholic episodes for years. It's why she'll disappear for months at a time. Though it had never been this long before. But it got worse after Bonnie was born, and Rose said her father would never let Dr. Light look at her. Edie either, Pa said solemnly. You don't think he's more than just neglectful, do you son? He knew exactly what Pa meant and had considered the possibility of abuse on more than one occasion. I don't believe so, not when Gilbert's been acting strangely about his wife for years. From what Rose says, he's just incredibly prideful and doesn't want to accept help from anyone. Not to mention, appearances are the most important thing for him. Uncle Jake ran a hand over his face. I'd like to see what he thinks of his appearance if I let my fist do a little talking. Imagine, letting your daughter work herself to death and your wife hide from the world when someone could help her. For now, Pa said, let's just keep a watch. The mayor's been alerted to some odd behavior from Gilbert lately, mostly minor things at the bank, but I think he's planning to step in before long. Keep your appointment with him tomorrow, Cal, and see if you can't get him to see reason. If nothing else, maybe you can get a read on what's going on. Callum nodded as the clock chimed nine o'clock, much later than Pa had intended to stay. I will, Pa. You get on home to Mama so she doesn't worry. I'll stop by tomorrow after the meeting and let you know how it goes. The next day, Callum took a deep breath before opening the large oak door of Pine Creek Bank. Ms. Edna, the short, Round woman who'd acted as teller longer than he'd been alive, smiled and waved as he walked in. Callum Carmichael, aren't you a sight for these old eyes? He removed his Stetson and flashed her a grin.
Hello, Ms. Edna, you do look beautiful this morning. She blushed, her skin flaming to the same shade as the red notebook on the desk in front of her, contrasting with her white hair. You are a charmer, son. The blush left her cheeks as she chuckled, and she checked the appointment book in front of her. I'll let Mr. Gilbert know you've arrived. Her expression sobered as she turned to make her way to his office toward the back of the bank. Callum waited a moment, twisting his hat around in his hands, but too keyed up to take a seat. He didn't think he stood there long, but it felt like an eternity before Ms. Edna moved slowly back to her post. If her expression was any indication, Gilbert wasn't in a good mood. Mr. Carmichael, Mr. Gilbert will see you now. Thank you, ma'am, he said as he passed. An uneasy feeling settled in his gut as he approached the man's office door, the frosted glass pane rendering him unable to see inside. He knocked, and the man he held responsible for most of his and Rose's problems opened the door, his appearance haggard. The bags under his eyes matched Rose's, and he'd lost plenty of his girth. The difference was, he'd had it to lose where Rose didn't. Come in, Callum, he said gruffly as he backed away to let Callum enter. How can I help you? Chapter 6 Callum crossed the threshold and realized he'd never come into Mr. Gilbert's office before. The oak from the doors and desks outside continued into the room on the bottom half of the wall. The top half was covered in a red and brown wallpaper with some fancy design. Two windows let in light from behind Gilbert's large desk, as the room was otherwise dark. Getting his bearings as to the positioning of the building, Callum realized the white building he could see across the alleyway had to be the Gilbert home. A large oak cabinet filled one wall, while a bookshelf of the same material covered the other. Gilbert's desk was more cluttered than Callum would have thought a man of his position would keep it, but he didn't dare say anything. Gold sconces hung on the wall in a few strategic places, but weren't lit at the moment. Rose's father pulled on the lapels of his suit jacket before gesturing for Callum to sit in the lone wooden chair in front of the desk. Take a seat, son. What brings you in today? Callum pulled an envelope from his back pocket, one that contained his deed to the land he'd purchased. Letters from his father and Uncle Jake willing to co-sign his building loan, and the business plan he'd outlined for the ranch. He'd also drawn up plans for the house and worked with Lucas to determine exactly how much lumber he'd need for the house he had planned. Originally, he thought to scrap his dreams of the four-bedroom house with a kitchen and dining room any woman would envy, but he'd decided to go ahead. If, by some miracle, he could convince Rose to marry him again he wanted to be ready. I'm here about a building loan, sir. I've already got the land purchased, and the deed is here. He pulled the paper from the pile and placed it on Mr. Gilbert's desk. And here are the plans I've drawn up as well as the price Lucas has given me on the lumber. He knew Lucas had given him a sizable discount, and he was mighty grateful for his brother-in-law's generosity. Mr. Gilbert moved his glasses from the chain around his neck to the bridge of his nose and studied the documents. When he got to the house plans, his eyes narrowed. Why such a large house for a single man? Callum's heart beat wildly. Should he be honest and say he was hoping Rose would take him back, or be vague in the hopes of actually being in the man's office long enough to bring up his daughter? He decided on the latter. One never knows what the future will hold, Mr. Gilbert. I'd like to go ahead and do the best I can from the start. The man studied Callum for a moment, returned the house plans back to the pile without even glancing at the other documents. Be that as it may, Callum, I'm afraid we'll not be able to approve your loan today. To this point, the only job you've held is that of a ranch hand, and building a herd is hard work. Callum worked to keep his voice even. Sir, if you'll look at the letter from my Uncle Jake, he's decided to gift me my first 100 head of cattle to get started. Not to mention, both he and Pa have agreed to co-sign my loan. He started to pull the letters from the stack of papers, but stopped when Gilbert shook his head. It's just not in the best interest for the bank right now, Callum. I'm sorry. That was it. Callum had nothing left to lose, so he went for it. You and I both know this isn't about me not qualifying for a loan. This is personal, though I'm not sure why you care so much. As hard as you're working Rose, it would seem you could benefit from one less mouth to feed. Mr. Gilbert stood so quickly he knocked over his chair. You insolent little dash. 
I'm not done, Callum roared. Rose is sick. She fainted yesterday in town from hunger, but you didn't know that, did you? Her hands look worse than most of our Green Ranch hands, but you don't notice that either because you don't notice her. The light has gone from her eyes, and I don't know what it is but you can rest assured I'm going to find out why. Gilbert pointed to the door, shaking with rage. Get out of my office, boy. Don't stick your nose where it doesn't belong, or you might just get Rose hurt. It was as though something inside Callum erupted, shredding the last of his self-control. He rounded the banker's desk and took hold of both the man's lapels. Rose's father wasn't short, but Callum still had three or four inches on him. Not to mention, Gilbert was soft from sitting behind a desk all day, whereas Callum had the broad build that came with the type of work he did. I don't know what you've done, he growled, but you can rest assured that if one hair on Rose's head is harmed because of your stupidity or greed, I'll hold you personally responsible. I don't care if my pa has to arrest me himself, you'd better make sure no harm comes to her or Violet and Bonnie. With a light shove that pressed Gilbert into the wall, Callum let go and pulled the door back so roughly that he wouldn't be surprised if the glass shattered as it knocked against the wall. Storming down the hallway, he tipped his hat to Ms. Edna. I'm sorry if you heard any of that Ms. Edna. Her lips were pursed and one eyebrow raised as he walked by her. If he didn't know better, he'd think the seasoned woman looked impressed. The rage boiling his blood was too thick to stop and think on it, though, and he flung open the bank doors with nearly as much gusto as he had the one in Gilbert's office. He needed to clear his head before storming into the jail or his parents' house to see Pa. Taking off toward the south of town, he passed the clinic, the dress shop, and a host of other businesses before coming up on the saloon that sat separated from the rest of the businesses in an attempt to keep some of the noise down. Ironically, it wasn't that far from the church, but services didn't cross over with times of heavy business so it didn't cause much of a problem. That, and a couple of stipulations of the saloon coming to Pine Creek a few years back had been that they'd close before midnight, and have no ladies of the evening. They had saloon girls, but all they did was serve and flirt to the best of Callum's knowledge. He was sure some funny business went on, but at least it wasn't out in the open. Just as he moved to walk past the saloon, a flash of strawberry blonde hair moved behind the building, sending his nerves on high alert. It couldn't be. Not only was the saloon not even open at this time of day, but Rose would never be so desperate she'd take a job there, would she? If she had, he wasn't sure he had enough self-control not to hoist her over his shoulder and demand Alex. Marry them immediately so he could take care of her properly. Rose would subject herself to the leering gazes, roving hands, and rude comments of the men who frequented the saloon over his dead body. Callum moved closer to the saloon and walked as close to the side of the building as possible. It may not have been Rose he saw, but he'd make sure before he took another step. There's our little lamb, Annie said as Rose approached. Annie was one of the saloon girls who'd been there since the saloon opened, and she had taken a liking to Rose from the moment she'd approached about doing their laundry. Phew, you sure are skin and bones. Rose closed the last few steps between her and the patio area behind the saloon where the girls tended to drink their coffee in the mornings. Daisy, Jenny, and Lila all sent friendly but concerned glances her way. I'm fine, just been really busy lately. Rose had been doing laundry for the saloon girls for six months or more, and she'd grown to think of them as friends. She only went by once a week to drop off their clean clothes or pick up more, but they'd always welcomed her to sit and chat if she had time. Not that she ever had much time anymore. Most of the townspeople viewed the saloon as a blemish on the otherwise family-friendly town, but Rose was incredibly grateful for the rates Mr. Warden paid her. He'd offered on more than one occasion to hire her as a waitress and double whatever she made doing laundry, but she couldn't bring herself to accept. Not to mention, Annie had told her more than once that the place was perfectly safe in the daytime, but she was to stay far away at night. Child, Annie said as she approached in her day dress that looked far different from her costumes Rose laundered every week. Her long brown hair hung in loose curls, though Rose knew she kept it up in a fashionable twist in the evenings. We know you're busy, but you lose more and more weight every time we see ya. It ain't healthy. Annie was only about 10 years older than Rose, and had more or less taken on the role of Rose's protector whenever she ventured to that side of town, 
not that Pine Creek really had a bad side, just that the mornings around the saloon were decidedly safer than the evenings for someone like Rose. Rose met Annie's earnest gaze and lifted her lips into a small smile. Thank you for caring, but I'm really fine. I'll do my best to take more time to eat. At least take a biscuit with you, Daisy said as she rushed over from the small table where the girls sat her egg and maybe two. In her hand, she held a biscuit and two pieces of ham. One is fine, Daisy, and thank you. Rose lifted the biscuit to her mouth and relished in the buttery flavor. She then took a bite of the ham, trying not to groan at how long it had been since she'd had honey ham. This is delicious. Rose hadn't realized Mr. Warden had opened the back door and now stood on the back steps until he spoke. We'd be happy to give you three square meals a day and reimburse you heavily if you'd like to come waitress for us. He smoothed his mustache and placed his familiar bowler hat atop his bald head. Annie let out a guffaw. You know she don't belong in a place like this, boss. Those men would eat her alive. I run a respectable establishment here, Mr. Warden insisted. His eyes narrowed at Annie, but not in a threatening way. Rose would be perfectly safe should she decide to come work for me. A familiar voice sounded from the other side of the saloon. She'll not be doing any such thing, Callum said as he came into view. The look on his face was murderous. She needed to get him out of there before he said something that cost her the highest paying laundry job she had. Thank you again, Mr. Warden, but I'm happy with the laundry. She crossed the yard, doing her best to ignore the wide eyes of Daisy, Jenny, and Lila as she went. Annie's expression was more a smirk than anything else. Callum's chest moved up and down, and she could feel the tension radiating off of him. Stopping a breath before him, her back to Mr. Warden and the ladies of the saloon, she pinned Callum with a glare of her own. I just do their laundry, not that it's any of your business. Now, go home before you say something I'll regret. His eyes widened, then softened with compassion. Rose, you don't need to be over here this often. What if some man decides he wants more than liquor? Annie approached then, apparently able to hear Callum though he spoke softly. She don't ever come around here at night, and I aim to make sure it stays that way. As Mr. Warden said, we run a respectable establishment here, but it's still no place for her. Something Rose could only describe as respect flashed in Callum's eyes. Thank you, I appreciate that. I don't believe we've met before, I'm Callum Carmichael. I know who you are, Annie said with a wave of her hand. You're that handsome Sheriff Carmichael's son. Your pa's a kind man, and he's always been good to us here. I'm Annie Barstow, saloon singer and waitress. This here's Daisy, Jenny, and Lila, and of course you know Mr. Warden. Callum tipped his Stetson toward the ladies. Nice to meet you, ladies. The fire emanating from him earlier had simmered, but Rose still thought it best to steer him back down the street. Placing both hands on his strong arm and broad chest, she did her best to turn Callum back the way he came. He allowed her to do so, but glanced back to ensure she came as well. With a wink from Annie, Rose followed Callum back out to the main street through town. They walked in silence for a moment before Rose determined they were far enough away from the saloon to avoid being heard. Stopping short, she whacked Callum on his arm. He stopped as well, looking at her as though she'd lost her mind. What was that for? That was for thinking you have the right to tell me where I can and cannot go, Rose said with a quiet venom. And for thinking you get to tell me who I can work for. It's not your job to take care of me, Callum. Well, someone has to, he shouted back. Your father's certainly not going to do it, a fact he made clear to me today at the bank. Humiliation and anger washed over her at the thought that Callum had told her father about her episode yesterday. You had no right to discuss me with my father. Callum ran his hand down his face and let out a frustrated breath. I'm not just going to leave you all alone in this, Rose. Whatever your father's up to that caused him to reject my loan application probably has to do with why you seem to be supporting the whole family on your shoulders. His voice lowered, and he placed his large hands on her arms. Let me help you carry the load. Tears stung her eyes at his earnest plea, but she couldn't accept his help without spilling her father's secret. Suddenly, the realization of what he'd said dawned on her. He rejected your loan?
Callum, I. I'm so sorry. She didn't add that it wasn't all that surprising, as they didn't have the capital to approve any loans at the moment. Still, the ranch had been Callum's dream, their dream together. He shook his head. It doesn't matter, I'll go to Hunter's Gap and get approved there. There was no reason for him to deny me, no reason other than wanting me to not build a place for you to call home. Rose fought down the images in her mind his words conjured. Him coming through the door after a long day on the ranch. Taking her in his arms and kissing her until she went weak in the knees. Her telling him she was expecting their first child, and him spinning her around like he had when he'd bought the land. No, Rose said with more conviction than she felt. It's not going to happen for us, Callum. You have to let me go. He lifted his hand to run the backs of his fingers gently down her cheek. I'll never be able to do that. You're it for me, and you always will be. Lowering his hand to clasp hers, he moved closer. His forehead pressed to hers, his lips so close she could feel his quick breaths. You're it for me, he repeated, though this time it sounded more like a vow. Suddenly, the realization that they were in the middle of the street washed over Rose, as did all the reasons they couldn't be together. She jerked back, swallowing back the tears that threatened as she hurried back toward the bakery for her shift. He called her name a few times, but thankfully didn't chase her. If he had, she'd have fallen apart in his arms the way she cried on Helen's shoulder. If there was one thing she knew about Callum Carmichael, it's that a woman's tears were his undoing. The minute she fell apart on him, he'd march back into the bank and demand the truth from her father, a truth Papa would never give him. Chapter 7 The next few weeks passed with Callum busier than he'd ever been at the Circle H and preparing his own land for the cattle, that would be coming after they returned from the cattle drive. He hadn't seen Rose except for church as all the tasks had kept him from his weekly visits to the bakery. Ray approached from the north field of the Circle H, to where Callum pounded fence posts, into the ground in preparation for the barbed wire he'd ordered from Dallas. Need some help? I'd be grateful for it, Callum said as he wiped the sweat from his brow, but don't you have enough on your plate without adding things from mine too? Ray shrugged. What can I say? You're a brother to me, Callum. Ray had grown up on the ranch just like Callum had, though he hadn't come until he was into his teens. As much as the rest of the country seemed to care about the color of a man's skin, ranches in Texas employed cowboys of all types. As many of Uncle Jake's hired hands were black or Mexican as they were white, and Callum had a hard time understanding why anyone would have a problem with it. Then I won't stop you, brother, Callum said with a chuckle. The two worked in comfortable silence for the next few hours, the setting sun signaling it was nearly time for dinner. Ray wasn't one to pry, but as he took a swig from his canteen, he eyed Callum warily. Just spit it out, Callum said. Ray grinned and took another swig. Just wondering how things were going with you. Your pa said Gilbert turned you down for the loan. I'm right sorry about that. Callum fought the anger that rose up in him thinking of all that had happened that day. He hadn't told his family about most of it as he didn't want to make things more difficult for Rose. After he'd been turned down, Pa had told him to let it go. Apparently, he wasn't the only one in town who'd been unfairly rejected. The mayor had noticed it as well, and he'd decided to do some investigating into the matter. Pa hadn't said any more. He'd told Callum not to say a word to anyone but it gave Callum a little relief to know he wasn't the only one suspicious of Rose's father. Right now, I'm so busy I can barely think straight, Callum said. Which is probably a good thing. I don't do well lately with time for my thoughts to go idle. Ray picked up his mallet and began to drive another post. Been in situations like that a few times myself. But I'll say, it always feels a mite heavier until I give it to the Lord. Conviction pricked at Callum. I suppose I've been holding on to it all myself. If he were honest, he'd have to admit it had been somewhat of a choice. Rose leaving had felt like a betrayal of both her and the Lord. Ray nodded understandingly. For some reason, it seems easier in the moment to stew on something, rather than surrender it. I'm not sure why we do that, but it's a fool's errand. He was right. Callum knew he was.
They finished up a few more posts before mounting up and riding back to the main house of the Circle H, where Aunt Beth had dinner ready for them. Ray, Callum said as they climbed the stairs to the porch, thank you. Anytime, Ray said with a wink and a clap of his hand on Callum's shoulder. Give it to the Lord, brother. His ways are better than ours. The rest of the week passed a little easier as Callum had taken to praying twice as much as he worried. By the time Sunday rolled around, he was in a decidedly better mood than he had been the last few weeks. Mama noticed. Someone's chipper, she teased as he pulled her in for a hug in the churchyard. They'd happened to arrive at the same time as his parents that morning, and Callum gently pulled on a lock of his sister Emily's hair as well. What's got you in such a good mood? I had a good talk with Ray, Callum answered, thinking back on all they discussed. I'm still not happy about whatever's going on with Rose. I'm sure I'll need to be reminded another five or six dozen times, but for now I'm just doing my best to give it all to the Lord. It's generally the best option, Mama said with a small smile. He knew she'd been concerned about him ever since Rose had broken things off, and he hoped his new outlook would give her some peace. They moved inside the church and took up their usual four or five pews, the family having grown so much. Malachi shook Callum's hand as he held his little girl Eliza on his hip. Callum tweaked her nose, and she let out a giggle, though if the last few weeks were any indication, Malachi or his wife Sarah would end up having to take her out minutes into the sermon for fussing. The sound of Titus and Penelope, Edie's three-year-old twins, filled the church. Unca Callum. Unca Callum. He turned just in time to catch Titus, where he flew into his arms, seconds before Penelope did the same. Holding one twin on each hip, he caught sight of Edie and Lucas doing their best to rush in behind them. How's my favorite set of twins in all the world? Simon turned from where he talked with Malachi and Alex. Hey! I thought Nicholas and I were your favorite set of twins. He walked over and feigned annoyance. Have we been upstaged by these two half-pints already? Uncle Jake approached and clapped a hand atop Simon's head. Have you seen those two? Of course you've been upstaged, and it'll happen again and again as more of your generation has children. It's true, Edie said as she approached. Once you have children, you more or less become invisible. She smiled warmly at her twins and placed a gentle hand on her belly Callum was convinced should have popped by now. But you don't really mind. Speaking of which, Simon said, how long before you pop that one out? If you think it'll be today or tomorrow, let me know, and I'll bet Nicholas a day's worth of barn chores over it. Edie rolled her eyes. Haven't you two outgrown such things? She looked around for a quick moment before lowering her voice. I'd say three or four more weeks will be safe, though. Everyone in earshot laughed, and Alex made his way to the pulpit. Just as Callum moved to his seat, he spotted Rose, Violet, and Bonnie move quietly through the back door and into the back pew. Their father was nowhere in sight. Bonnie spotted him and waved before tugging on Rose's sleeve. She pointed Callum's way, and her lips formed a sad smile. He knew his did too, and turned before others noticed him staring. Somehow, he didn't think Rose would appreciate his drawing attention to her. After church, the whole family moved out to set up for the church picnic they had every week after services, and Callum spotted Rose and her sisters leaving the same time Edie did. Rose, Edie called, why don't you three come join us for lunch today? Bonnie looked up at Rose with pleading eyes, but Violet just looked curious to hear what her older sister would say. Oh, Rose replied, thank you, but we've got to get home. Come on, Mama said as she approached. We'll even send you home with some leftovers for your parents. Surely, you've got a little time. Bonnie hopped up and down next to Rose. Please, Rose. Papa never lets us stay, and I want to see my friends. Rose sighed, but nodded. All right, but make sure you eat a good meal before you go gallivanting. Head bobbing furiously, Bonnie raced off to join a group of girls who just found their place in the line. Mama chuckled. It's the way of things, they follow us around as children and want nothing to do with us as they get older. Finally, she placed a hand on Edie's shoulder and grinned, things come back around, and they become our friends. No one commented that Mama's statement was generally more true of a parent-slash-child relationship than that of sisters.
but his whole family knew Rose had always been as much Bonnie's mother as she had been a sibling. From the expression on Rose's face, she appreciated the gesture. Callum stepped forward and offered one arm to Violet, the other to Rose. May I escort you ladies to the line? If you don't get there early, all of Aunt Beth's fried chicken will be gone and that's just a crying shame. Violet laughed, and Callum noted how much lighter hers sounded than Rose. She hadn't lost near as much weight as Rose had either. It seemed Bonnie wasn't the only one Rose was protecting. I'm sure it would be, Violet replied. Both women took his arm, Rose's grip much more hesitant than her sister's, and Callum noted both women filled their plates to the brim. From the widening of her eyes and loud growl that ripped from her stomach, Rose had likely skipped breakfast that morning as well. He tensed at the idea, and Rose shot an embarrassed look his way. I just got busy this morning and forgot to eat breakfast. Callum didn't dignify the obvious lie with a response, and the narrowing of Violet's eyes would have given things away if he wasn't already well aware of what was going on. That, plus the sight of Bonnie further down the line tucking an extra biscuit in her dress pocket, gave him more motivation than ever to get Rose out of whatever mess her father had gotten her into. Rose remained mostly quiet during lunch, letting the much more loquacious Violet do the talking. She answered questions when directly asked but couldn't shake the overall feeling of sadness at being around Callum's family again. All it did was remind her of how close she'd been to being part of them. Alex's sermon that day had been about trusting the Lord when his plans didn't match up with the ones folks made for themselves. If she were being honest, Rose would have to admit that she had moments in which she found it easier to trust the Lord, but she hadn't asked for his strength nearly enough. That strength was something she desperately needed. At least the sight of Nicholas Carson attempting to flirt with Violet provided ample entertainment. So, he said with his handsome brown eyes twinkling. You've kept yourself busy since we graduated, Violet. I hardly ever see you around. I've been around, Violet said cheekily, but I wouldn't expect you to have noticed. I don't follow you around like so many of the young ladies do. Rose elbowed Violet and did her best to communicate with her eyes to be polite. Not that Nicholas or anyone seated around them seemed to care, as they all did their best to hide laughter at her sister's direct statement. Well now, Nicholas said as he feigned offense. You act as though I have legions of adoring followers. Perhaps I'm just looking for the right girl to settle down. His eyes met Violet's just as Callum faked a gag at his obvious insinuation. Violet pushed up to her knees on the blanket. How nice, be sure to send us an invitation to the wedding when you find her. With a wink, she stood and turned to Rose. It's probably time for us to leave, do you want me to go get Bonnie? Rose shook her head at her sister's quick wit. While entertaining, Rose cringed at her boldness. That would be helpful, thank you. As soon as Violet got out of earshot, Rose turned to apologize to Nicholas. I'm sure she didn't mean that the way it sounded. Rather than looking put out, Nicholas stared after Violet as though she'd hung the moon and the stars too. The rest of his family noticed as well, and Simon elbowed him in the side. You gonna respond? Oh, Nicholas said with a start, it's fine. He sent a genuinely warm smile Rose's direction. Y'all be sure to come back and join us next week. Once again, Rose was reminded that likely wouldn't be happening. We'll have to ask Papa, but thank y'all for having us. Helen jumped to her feet from the other end of the blanket and hurried to Rose. Rose? I just remembered I forgot to take the contents of the cash box to the bank yesterday after we closed. Would you mind walking over to get it and giving it to your father? I'll just be sick about it if it's sitting there a second night. Rose's eyebrow raised. It wasn't the first time they'd forgotten to take the money over on Saturday evening, and it had always been fine until Monday morning, but she didn't press. I'll be happy to, do you need anything else? Helen pulled her in for a quick hug. Thank you so much. Callum, why don't you walk her over so Violet and Bonnie can take Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert their lunch? Violet, who she hadn't realized had returned with Bonnie, spoke up from behind her. That sounds like an excellent idea. You don't mind, Callum? Was everyone conspiring against her? Not only did Rose frequently walk the streets of Pine Creek alone, but Helen and Violet did too, 
she opened her mouth to say that when Callum spoke. I'd be happy to. It's not a great idea for a woman alone to be carrying a bag of money anywhere, even in a place like Pine Creek. Rose nearly groaned. Everyone in Callum's family wore Cheshire cat grins, though at least the women, save Helen, tried to hide them. It didn't appear she was going to win. All right, thank you for offering, Callum. Turning to her sisters, she handed them the basket full of food Callum's mother had handed her for their parents. Get on home and bring this to Papa, no doubt they're wondering where we are. Bonnie nodded while Violet smirked. We'll see you at home. Taking the basket, both sauntered off as though they hadn't just thrown their sister to the wolves. Well, maybe not wolves, but it felt that way. Callum tipped his Stetson at his family before offering his arm to her. Uncle Jake, Aunt Beth, I'll see y'all out at the ranch later. Everyone else, I reckon I'll see you Thursday at family dinner. She took his arm, and he steered them out of the churchyard and down Main Street. The saloon sat a few hundred yards to the north of the church, but still not close enough to town to bother anyone with the noise. As they passed it, Rose wondered if Callum would bring up their conversation or almost kiss from the day before. It had certainly been on her mind. They walked in awkward silence for a few minutes before he spoke. How are things going at the bakery? Good, a relatively benign topic. Helen's an artist, Rose said honestly. We're busier than ever since she introduced three new flavors of muffins, cinnamon rolls, and she's experimenting with this pastry she found in a cookbook called a cannoli. It's from Italy, apparently, and is supposed to be delicious. Callum chuckled, and Rose couldn't help but notice how strong his arm felt next to hers. It's not hard to believe. Helen's always been good at most things she does, and she's got a knack for flavors. It helps that quite a few young men in town come in the bakery just to spend a few minutes with her, Rose said with a grin. Seeing them line up on payday is a sight to behold. Suddenly, Callum tensed. The smile was gone from his face as he turned to her. And these men. Are you sure they're just there for Helen? His green eyes burned so intensely she felt sure they could see straight through to her very soul. I. I'm sure, she said a little breathlessly. They ask for her by name. Callum relaxed a little. You'll let me know if any of them give you trouble? Or Helen, for that matter. She didn't speak for a moment, not sure how to respond. When they'd been together, it made perfect sense that she'd come to him with such things. Now, she had no idea where they stood. Were they friends? Rose, he said a little more firmly. You'll let me know if any of them bother you. It wasn't a question that time. We're perfectly safe, Callum. She hoped her words conveyed the depth of meaning she intended, but the flash in his eyes told her that wouldn't be acceptable. Stopping abruptly, the bakery in sight, Callum turned her to face him. Please just tell me what's going on. I want to help you, but I can't do that if I don't know what's happened. A war raged within her. If she told Callum what her father had done, it might be the saving grace she needed. But then, there was no way her father would allow her to take Bonnie, even if both she and Violet left of their own accord. Still, the way things had been going had become exhausting, and she didn't know that she could keep going much longer. Maybe if she told Callum why they couldn't be together, he'd leave the subject alone and she could determine her next steps without the guilt of his longing glances. Letting out a long, shuddering breath, she nodded. All right, but we need to go to the bakery. There wasn't anyone on the street that she could see, but there could be no risk of someone overhearing their conversation. If they did, Papa might be run out of town, and then where would they be? Chapter 8 Callum did his best to keep a lid on the fury that rose in him as Rose finished telling him the whole story. He leaned against the wooden block counter in the kitchen of the bakery, lest folks see them through the window and become curious. Pots, pans, and baskets hung from hooks above the large island in the middle, while clean plates and bowls stacked up neatly next to the oven. If Rose's father was in the room, he might have thrown a bowl or two at the man's head. Calm down, Callum, he told himself. None of this surprises the Lord and taking this into your own hands will only cause more hurt. The pride of believing he knew better was a struggle Callum knew well.
Rose paced from one end of the kitchen to the other, gesturing wildly as she frequently did when agitated or excited. Her hands and facial expression communicated more than her words did. I won't leave Bonnie to fend for herself, Rose said as she finished the tale. Her hands dropped to her sides, shoulders slumped. Crossing the kitchen to stand just inches from Rose, Callum pulled her into his arms and placed a gentle kiss to her hair. She made no move to push him away, so he simply held her and hoped she knew the anger rolling off him was aimed at her father. I knew rumors were going around town, but I never imagined how deep it went. People had been whispering for months about why Rose was really working so hard. After that, it was why Mr. Gilbert had put a cap on bank withdrawals and rejected loans. He'd said the laws had gotten tighter surrounding such things, but apparently Mayor Hinson hadn't believed that any more than Callum did. He pulled back, taking in Rose's distressed face. She was as beautiful as ever, but his heart ached each time he saw how the once gentle slopes of her face were now harsh angles. I can help you, Rose. I can marry you, and we can adopt Bonnie if we need to. If nothing else, she can come live with us. If you don't want to marry right away, the parsonage is empty. I know Alex and Lily would let y'all stay there. His hands grasped for hers, but she backed away. No, she croaked. I can't. Papa would never let me take Bonnie with us. She hesitated for a moment, and a surge of fear and protectiveness rose up in Callum. Should he tell her about the men he saw her father with that night at the bank? If she knew anything about it, she'd have told him. As it was, he could put her in danger if he told her about it, and she went snooping around. As though his hands moved with a mind of their own, they wrapped around her once again and sheltered her the only way he knew how. Her hair still smelled of the bakery, one of the few things about her that hadn't changed since she'd broken things off. The light shaking of her shoulders nearly broke Callum's heart. Give him a rattlesnake or bucking bronco any day over Rose's tears. They undid him. Speaking softly, he said aloud the words he'd vowed to himself over and over. I'll help you out of this, Rose. You're not alone anymore. Rubbing circles on her back in a too small gesture of comfort. Callum tried to enjoy the moment. She still felt perfect in his arms, like they were made for her, even after all this time. With a heavy sniff and a wipe of her eyes, Rose stepped backwards again. Her eyes met his, those beautiful emerald green ones that had haunted his dreams for so long. Callum leaned down until their lips were a mere breath apart, his hands moving upward to cup either side of her face. As soon as his fingertips grazed her cheeks, Rose jerked as though broken from a trance. I. I can't, Callum. She took another sniff as her eyes filled with tears once more. It hurts too much. With that, she took up the cash box and nearly flew out of the kitchen and around the counter. Callum stood behind the large dough preparation area feeling as though his heart fled the bakery along with her. Rose. Don't leave, please. I'm sorry. She paused at the door, her back still to him. You don't need to apologize. Just understand that I can't just kiss you and then go back to how things are. That was the furthest thing from what he wanted, but he didn't respond. It wouldn't do any good. She knew where he stood and seemed to have made her decision for the time being. Lock up when you leave, she said quietly. The spare key is still in the planter out front. With that, the bell above the door jingled as she stepped outside into the bright sunshine. Callum stared after her, much like he had when she'd run from him in the churchyard that morning after she'd broken his heart. The same desperation and pain welled up in him, but this time the helplessness was gone. The temptation to try and wrestle control from the Lord Ward within him, but he fought it. If nothing else, he'd make life a little easier for Rose and her sisters. If only the Lord would show him how. Rose did her best to keep her face to the ground as she hurried home. Walking away from Callum the first time had nearly broken her in two, and today hadn't been any easier. Opening the short picket fence into their front yard, Rose hoped with everything she had Papa wasn't in any of the front rooms. He'd no doubt start asking questions, and he wouldn't like her answers. The familiar bitterness at Papa rose up in her again and had her wishing she could take Bonnie and Violet far away from the tidy white house that looked so perfect on the outside. The roses bloomed in the front flower bed, 
as did the daylilies Violet had planted years prior. Gardening had been one thing Violet shared with their mother in childhood, but Mama hadn't turned a single patch of dirt since Bonnie was born. Where Rose grieved the loss of a mother still very much alive through nurturing her younger sisters, Violet had done so through the hobbies they'd shared. Gardening and embroidery were things both girls had learned at Mama's feet, but Rose hadn't taken to either like Violet had. Rose climbed up the steps to the front porch, sighing in relief as she opened the door and found no one in the dining room or parlor. Papa must be out, or at least in one of the back rooms. The peace she felt at his absence jarred her. Some days her bitterness over his role in their current situation threatened to choke her. Other days she felt guilty thinking such things. Violet's voice from the kitchen startled her from her thoughts. Where have you been? She walked out with a sly grin on her face and a dish towel in her hands. I didn't expect you to be delayed this long. Her sister was only two years younger than Rose, a gap that seemed further and further apart over the last eight months or so. I had to go to the bakery, remember? Helen asked me to get the cash box. Eyes twinkling, Violet whipped the dish towel to lay it over her shoulder. She crossed her arms and leaned against the frame of the opening separating the dining room from the entryway. I know where you were initially, it just took longer than I'd imagined. If Rose didn't know better, she'd think Violet knew about Callum coming dangerously close to kissing her. Violet had always been the most supportive in the family of Rose's relationship with Callum, Bonnie close behind. What would her sister say if she knew the whole story? Rose had never shared their engagement with anyone, not even the sister she knew would have wept in joy with her. At the time, Papa's odd behavior had thrown Rose off enough that she'd thought the best option was to hide it. Now, she wondered if she'd have been better off if she hadn't. Where's Papa? Rose strained to listen down the hall, but could hear nothing. If she was going to come clean about Callum with Violet, she couldn't risk Papa overhearing. Violet rolled her eyes, her distaste for their father clear. He's at the bank, of course. He barely even batted an eye when I told him where you'd gone. Bonnie is down the street playing with some friends from school, and Mama didn't want her lunch when I brought it. When's the last time she ate something? Rose barely saw her mother these days, as she was always working. Violet had taken the lion's share of her care, something for which Rose was incredibly grateful. This morning, Violet answered with a nod. She had some eggs on toast for breakfast, and two good meals a day for her is a victory these days. I've got some vegetable soup simmering for dinner. Maybe she'll eat some of that. Vegetable soup? Has the garden been producing that well already? Their kitchen garden would be a godsend come summer, but Rose didn't realize it had already done well enough to feed them from its bounty. Some of it did. Violet said with a shy smile. Nicholas Carson brought the rest of it by while you were at the bakery. Nicholas was Callum's cousin and worked the ranch for his father, but the whole town knew his true love was farming. In more recent years, he'd become one of the main suppliers of fruits and vegetables for folks in town. It didn't quite make sense, though. Why did he have extra produce in town on a Sunday? Violet cocked her head to the side, as though trying to remember something. He said something about bringing a wagon load into town this morning for John at the Mercantile. I'm not sure if this was surplus, but I didn't ask too many questions. She cut her eyes at Rose. I'm not blind, Rosie, I know we need all the help we can get. A wave of shame washed over Rose at the realization her sisters might have noticed more than she realized. Still, Nicholas was known for making his rounds with the young ladies in town. Her expression must have betrayed her thoughts, as Violet narrowed her eyes. I'm not interested in Nicholas, but what he did was kind. I'm not about to slap the hand of someone offering us a little help. Her feet thudded softly on the floor as she closed the distance to Rose. Placing her hands on Rose's shoulders, she looked her straight in the eye. You've fallen on your sword enough. It's time you let me help you. I won't marry anyone out of convenience, but I can take in some more sewing and help you with more things around here. I understand why you want to shield Bonnie from what's happened, but I'm not a child anymore. Rose hung her head, tears threatening to spill over onto her cheeks. Callum asked me to marry him. After a short gasp, Violet pulled Rose in for a hug. Oh Rosie, that's wonderful. I'm so happy for you.
She paused, lifting Rose's chin with a gentle hand. Why do I get the feeling it's not a cause for celebration? I don't mean today, though he did mention it. We were engaged in the fall before everything happened with Papa. The memory of it haunted Rose daily, as did the look on Callum's face when she'd broken off their engagement. Surprise and hurt flashed in Violet's eyes just as the clock on the wall chimed three o'clock. But, why wouldn't you have told us? Why didn't you tell me? Papa had been acting strange about my relationship with Callum for a month or two before that. I suppose I was hoping whatever was bothering Papa would calm down and he'd resume his support. Rose took Violet's hands in hers. I wanted to tell you, but I didn't want you to have to lie to Papa as his moods became increasingly more sour. Their short engagement had been both the happiest and most anxious days of Rose's life. It had been an odd feeling, the paradox of hope for the future and a desperation to understand the past. I understand, Violet said, her brown eyes full of sadness. What I don't understand is why you broke it off. Did Papa make you? Yes, Rose confirmed. I truly don't know why. For a while, I thought it might be because he needed me here to help earn money. Violet shook her head. No, you're right, I don't think that's all. Do you think it has something to do with Sheriff Carmichael? That seemed the more likely scenario. He's mentioned Sheriff Carmichael on occasion, how he can't keep his nose out of other people's business. I'd say that's the safest assumption. Eyes narrowed, Violet's jaw clenched. And you can't leave here because he'd never let you take Bonnie. He can't keep me here, but he can keep her. Exactly. Releasing a sigh, Violet stepped back and leaned against the pale green and white wallpaper. This is so utterly unfair to you. Papa's done something careless, and I'm more convinced than ever he's involved in something illegal, yet you have to suffer. To hear Violet speak of their father with such vitriol in her tone saddened Rose, but she couldn't blame her sister. At least she voiced the thoughts she harbored in her heart. The smell of the vegetable soup simmering on the stove wafted into the entryway, and Rose inhaled the savory aroma of garlic, onions, and spices. It grounded her, the simple pleasure of delicious food. I'll be all right, she assured Violet. There have been many days through this mess when I've wondered if God still hears my prayers. Many nights, I've wondered if my prayers simply hit the ceiling and bounce back. Violet's eyebrows rose as she pushed off the wall. And you're not still wondering? Oh, I am, but things like Nicholas bringing by produce at just the right time remind me of the Lord's faithfulness and provision. I imagine my encouragement will last until the next time my hands are screaming at me to stop with the laundry or my belly growls, but for now, I'm going to thank the Lord for the bounty He's given us. Speaking the words to Violet, Rose realized they were as much a message to her as they were to her sister. She didn't know what the future held for Mama and whether she'd ever leave her bedroom again. Papa's misdeeds could be anywhere from a ghastly mistake to downright illegal. The once delicate skin of her hands was constantly red and inflamed, and the pleasant reflection she'd seen when she looked in the mirror was merely a ghost of who she used to be. But then, they'd not been completely without food. Work had been available for both her and Violet, and Bonnie excelled in school. From what Papa said, they were slowly clawing their way out of the pit he'd created, and friends such as Helen had stood by her in their time of need. If she searched for troubles in her days, she'd find them. But if she searched for blessings, as she'd always done in days gone by, she might just find those too. Chapter 9 That night, long after his wife and daughters had gone to bed, the door swung open to Frank Gilbert's office and the room seemed to shake with the force. Howdy there, Gilbert, Jack said as he sauntered into the room. The faint scent of whiskey filled the air, and Frank reached up to loosen his collar. As Jack's cronies filed in, the room seemed much smaller than it had a few moments before. We've got another deposit for ya, but soon I think we'll be able to make a withdrawal. Jack grinned, his strong jaw and charming smile obvious even in the low light. That's fine, Gilbert struggled to speak. He cleared his throat and wished he had a wet rag to run over the back of his neck. Will you withdraw everything? Most of it, Jack said. My associates in Colorado have a lead on some land just upriver from a spot where gold's been found, 
It's over 100 acres and purchasing that land will make me a very wealthy man. Frank hadn't known exactly what the stolen money he held was for, but that made as much sense as anything. See, congratulations, Jack. Will our, ah, partnership be over at that point? Part of him wished he'd never met the man they called Jack, but the other half knew how valuable the extra 5% had been in keeping the townsfolk off his back. The rest of Jack's men chuckled, and he ran a hand through his close-cut dark beard. No, I think we'll continue to utilize your services. After all, when the authorities start poking around, why in the world would they suspect a bank? Sweat beaded at Gilbert's temple and rolled down his face. Do you, do you think we could negotiate a higher fee for my services after you purchase your land? Jack's eyes narrowed, and he whipped his pistol from the holster at his hip. You seem to have forgotten one thing, Gilbert. We're not partners, no matter how badly you wish we were. You work for me, and you'll take what I give you happily. Leaning forward to place one hand on Gilbert's desk, his voice lowered dangerously. And if I happen to decide that one of your daughters would work nicely in exchange for our continued arrangement, well that's just how it'll work. The corner of his mouth tipped up as one of his cronies elbowed the other. Both had terrifying grins spread over their faces, and Frank swallowed down the wretch that threatened at the thought. My, my daughters? He thought he'd done a good job of hiding their existence from Jack and his men, but he'd apparently been wrong. Jack leaned back and placed his gun back in the holster. I haven't had the pleasure of seeing Em myself, but a few of my men say they're mighty nice to look at. Frank's eyes must have betrayed his surprise, as Jack continued. What? You thought I'd just let you stay in town with my money and leave no one here to check up on you? Think again, Gilbert. I have eyes everywhere. Frank's heart raced, a bitter heat rising to his cheeks at the idea Jack knew anything about Rose and Violet. Bonnie was much too young to interest him, but it didn't mean he wouldn't hurt her. Maybe he should have let Rose marry the Carmichael boy when she had the chance, but he couldn't risk Callum's father growing suspicious of any activities at the bank. Jack nodded for his men to place their stolen goods in the bank's open safe. Remember how this works. What I say is how it will be. Callum drove one last post into the ground surrounding his property, grateful the backbreaking work would soon be over. He still had to run the wire, no doubt a job that would leave his hands with a few nicks, but at least the posts were in. Ray had helped him every evening that week, as had Julian, Matteo, Simon, Nicholas, and a number of the other ranch hands. Malachi and Sarah lived close by, and he'd come by on a few different weekends to help as well. Uncle Jake had even made a point to come help on occasion, though he'd been mighty busy in his office preparing for the late summer cattle drive. It was hard to believe they were closing in on the end of June already. I think that's it. Ray shouted from down the line where he drove in his last post as well. You're gonna have a mighty good-looking fence when this is done, Cal. Looking over the property he'd purchased, Callum couldn't help the sense of pride that welled up in him. It was good land to raise a herd and, Lord willing, a family. He turned to see Ray approaching. I really appreciate all your help. There's no way I could have done it this quickly without you. Ray removed his Stetson and took a swig from the canteen he'd tossed on the ground. It's been a pleasure, brother. I'm proud for you. He paused for a moment. Have you? Ah. Uh. Made any progress with Rose? Not much, Callum said. It feels like I take a step or two forward with her, but then we take three steps back. Thinking back on their near kiss at the bakery earlier that week, he remembered just how right she felt in his arms. You want to talk about it? Ray had never been one to pry, but he'd always been a good confidant if a body needed one. Callum thought it over for a moment. You'll keep it between us? Of course, Ray said as he wiped his brow. A welcome breeze blew over the pasture land, gently rustling the leaves and the few trees that dotted the landscape. The sun had begun to set painting the sky with the familiar yellows, pinks, and purples of a Texas summer. Callum took a deep breath. Rose's father got caught up in some scam and lost a bunch of the town's money. She's been working so hard to support the family while he gives his whole paycheck right back to the bank. What kind of scam? Shrugging, Callum shared all he knew.
something about mineral rights. Rose didn't know much more than that, but she believes it was an honest mistake. Ray narrowed his eyes. Do you believe that? It might have started that way, Callum said honestly, but that doesn't explain why he made her break off the engagement to me. Engagement? Ray's confusion was understandable. No one but Malachi knew Callum and Rose had actually been engaged. Yep, I'd asked her to marry me about a month before she broke up with me. At the time, she'd asked that we keep it quiet as her father had been acting strangely and her mother's melancholy had gotten worse. I think she wanted to make sure Bonnie and Violet would be all right before she announced a wedding. Ray nodded as compassion filled his eyes. She's always been good to those girls. She's as much Bonnie's mother as their actual mother is. Whatever it is that gives Mrs. Gilbert such sadness, it's been worse since Bonnie was born. She's only been to church a few times a year since then, but Mr. Gilbert won't allow Edie to treat her. Pride is a stubborn fool, Ray said as he rubbed his hand over his face. It's been the cause of more than one man's demise. What are you going to do? That was the question, wasn't it? I don't know, Callum said. I've been watching but can't find anything specific to pin Gilbert with that's illegal. I'm not sure I want to bring Pa in until I'm sure. The men who'd been at the bank that night were suspicious, but alone they weren't a crime. That seems wise, Ray said. You don't want to go and push her away right when she needs you because you brought the law in prematurely. Be her friend and keep watch. The Lord will guide you if you keep surrendering the battle to him. Ray was right. I'll do that. Thank you again for all your help. Callum hoped his friend knew he didn't just mean the fence. It was nothing, Ray said. I'll be praying for you too, but right now I need to get on home. Paula has a roast on, and I can nearly smell it from here. Callum waved as Ray mounted his palomino and trotted off toward the home he and his family lived in on the grounds of the Circle H. Lord, he prayed, please keep Rose safe from everything related to her father. Show me how to help and, if it's your will, bring her back to me. I'm just saying, Helen spat as she took out her frustrations on the bread dough. Warren could have at least given me warning before he decided to ask Lucella Jenkins to the spring festival. Rose truly didn't know how to respond and had done her best to insert the expected responses to Helen's tirade, when her friend stopped to take a breath. I'm sorry. I know that's disappointing. It was a bit silly that they were even calling it the spring festival, as summer had well and truly set in. They'd initially had to move the festival due to the spring rains in April, but then May kept the ranchers busy with all their new calves. Mrs. Hinson had settled on June, though the barbecue competition they were slated to have would no doubt be scorching for the ranches who participated. It's not so much disappointing, Helen said. It's more embarrassing. I'd only had one or two dates with Warren, but he never even mentioned that he was courting Lucella as well. She needed the dough a moment longer before plopping it in a large bowl for its first rise. Placing a towel over the bowl, Helen wiped the light sheen from her forehead with the back of her wrist. I suppose I'm being petty. Maybe not petty, Rose said with a chuckle, but your dime novels haven't helped your impossible expectations of men. Not Warren, what he did was wrong, but you've had a parade of them trying to court you for ages. Can you truly say none of them caught your eye? Helen's eyes twinkled. I won't say none of them caught my eye, but they were all either terrified of my father and Robert or they were incredibly boring. To be fair, Helen's definition of a boring man was highly skewed by the stories she voraciously devoured. To her, a man who didn't hunt down villains and swoop in to save the heroine was classified as boring. Any man willing to court you should have the courage to ask your father, Rose said. But sometimes an exciting life isn't all it's made out to be. If anyone should know that, she should. Rolling her eyes, Helen moved over to stir the pot of cherry filling that simmered on the stove. You sound just like Papa. He doesn't realize how intimidating he can be, or maybe he does, and it's all intentional. I don't know. If Rose knew Kay Jones as well as she thought she did, he knew exactly how intimidating he could be. Her mother, Abigail Jones, was as kind and proper as they came. Her father, on the other hand, was well over six feet tall and had the build of a brick wall. As a blacksmith, he spent all day doing manual labor, 
Helen's little brother, Robert, was not far behind his father at 18. The right man won't be boring to you. He also won't be afraid to speak with your father. Rose moved over to place her hand on Helen's shoulder. For what it's worth, you can do much better than Warren. The bell above the door jingled, and Helen's cousins Edie and Lily breezed in with their children. Edie's three-year-old twins, Titus and Penelope, ran over to the glass case and excitedly discussed among themselves which treat they'd be having. Hunter, Lily's two-year-old, toddled behind them. He couldn't participate in the conversation as well, but his joy over the bounty was clear in how he pressed his whole face to the glass. The bell sounded again, and Malachi's wife Sarah stepped through with baby Eliza on her hip. Hi all, she said with a smile. Rose couldn't help but be a bit jealous of the beautiful dark-haired woman in front of her. She arrived in Pine Creek with the same darkness in her eyes that Rose knew she sported now. What had once been a battered and terrified woman was now a content wife and mother. If only Rose could reach the same fate. Welcome everyone, Helen said as she scurried out from behind Rose. Did I know you were all coming in today? No, Edie said with a grin as she handed each of the twins a coin. Her belly was just about the size of Lily's, both of whom were expecting their next children within the next few weeks. Lily and I ran into Sarah at the Mercantile and decided to make an event of it. She knelt down to Titus and Penelope. What do we say when we ask for our treat? Please and thank you, the twins repeated in unison. Goodness those children were adorable. Rose waved Helen around the counter. I'll take care of serving, you go enjoy your family. Helen put a hand on her hip. Only if you join us. Yes, Lily said. Please join us, Rose. Edie and Sarah nodded along, so Rose gave in. All right, I'll take a break unless we get more customers in. I doubt you will, Sarah said. Most everyone is over preparing for the festival tomorrow. You'd think the prize for the barbecue competition was $500 with the way the men at the Circle H are acting. Edie shook her head. Lucas has joined them as well. They went over early this morning to dig their pit and lay the sticks on top just so. Simon mentioned Ray had taken the lead on building the pit, Lily said. Apparently, barbecue was a common way of preparing meat when his family was still on the plantation. His grandfather passed down the recipes and method to his father who passed it on to him. I've had his recipe once or twice over the years, and I can vouch that it's delicious. Sarah shifted Eliza from her hip to her lap as she sat down at the table Edie and Lily had commandeered. The only one who hasn't been quite as overtaken is Callum, and that's just because he's been busy getting the fence up on his property. Helen snorted before grabbing a muffin out of the pastry case for Hunter. That's not all that's distracted him. Her face scrunched up, and she turned to Rose. I said that without thinking, I'm sorry. I know you know you've been on his mind, but you probably don't want to hear about it. It's fine, Rose said with a wave of her hand. I'm used to you speaking without thinking. She winked at Helen, to show her she was just teasing. All right you single gals, Edie said with a conspiratorial grin. Have you prepared your baskets for tomorrow? Helen nodded excitedly before launching into an explanation of everything she planned to put in her basket. When she finished, she turned to Rose. What about yours? Rose barely had enough money to feed herself, much less fill a basket. I'm not planning on going. Eyes widening in realization, Helen shook her head feverishly. Absolutely not. I know you're not really into these types of things, but I won't let you sit at home while we have all the fun. Meet me here at 8 in the morning, and we'll pack our baskets together. Most people discounted Helen for her bubbly nature and tendency to keep her head firmly in the clouds, but she was one of the most generous friends Rose had ever had. Not to mention, she'd made her cousins believe the reason Rose wasn't participating was due to an aversion to social functions. It wasn't true, but Rose much preferred that story to her reality. All right, she said. As long as I can get all my chores done tonight, I'll meet you here tomorrow morning. She glanced at the clock on the wall and realized it was later than she realized. Speaking of which, I'd better get home. Violet will have dinner ready. Since their talk that Sunday, Violet had taken to preparing dinner as often as she could.
it had certainly freed up rows for more laundry deliveries, and they were still working through the large basket of produce Nicholas Carson had brought by. I'll see you then, Helen said as she quickly hugged Rose. Have a good night. Chapter 10 The next morning, Rose awoke early and dressed quickly. Violet stirred in her bed. Where are you going? I'm going to meet Helen at the bakery before the festival, but I have to finish my chores first. Rose kept her voice low in case her father walked by the door. Do you want to come? We're supposed to make baskets, but if there aren't enough supplies, you can make one and I can watch. If she could just get out of the house, there was no way Papa would come to the festival. He'd always found such things silly. Violet grinned. Basket making? Are you hoping a certain cowboy will bid on yours? Rose blushed and rolled her eyes. Helen wanted me to put a basket in, I doubt I'll even get any bids. I highly doubt that, Violet said with a smirk. Need I remind you of Callum's family's history with the basket bidding competition? A few years prior, Alex had waged a bidding war against two other men for Lily's basket. The price had gone so high that Lily fled the bidding, too embarrassed to stay and witness the spectacle. That's not going to happen, Rose replied. If anyone's basket goes for a high dollar, it'll be Helen's. Though, I suppose that's only if she's convinced her papa to stop bidding on hers and scaring all the men into hiding. Chuckling and sitting up with a stretch of her arms, Violet glanced out the window to the sunny morning. If Bonnie's not already awake, I'll get her up, and we'll meet you at the bakery in a bit. Rose nodded and opened the door quietly so as to not disturb her parents if they were still sleeping. She hadn't heard any footsteps that morning, but Papa might already be gone and at the bank. It was only open in the mornings on Saturday, but he frequently stayed all day. Hurrying through her chores, Rose made sure there were plenty of eggs in the basket from their last trade with Mrs. Hattie. Violet had done some mending for her in addition to Rose's laundry, and the woman had been so grateful she doubled the eggs butter, and milk she normally gave them. The loaf of bread Violet had baked yesterday sat on the counter, and Rose breathed a sigh of relief that she'd be able to eat breakfast before she left for the day. Slicing a healthy piece from the bread, she buttered it before bringing it to her lips. Violet's bread was much softer and more flavorful than Rose's ever was, and she savored the rich, earthy flavor mixing with the creaminess of the butter. As she suppressed a groan of pleasure at how good the slice was, heavy footsteps behind her startled Rose from her trance. You're off early, Papa said with furrowed brows. Yes, sir, Rose said. I'm going to meet Helen at the bakery for a bit before we go to the festival. Papa's suspicion was evident. Don't you have work to do today? No, sir, I've finished all the laundering for the week, and the bakery is closed today on account of the festival. She prayed Papa wouldn't make her stay home. As long as you stay far away from that Carmichael boy. His gruff words shocked Rose, and she wondered if Papa knew about his accompanying her to the bakery that day. He can't keep his nose out of other folks' business. It's liable to get him hurt. Not sure how to respond, Rose stayed silent. The last thing she wanted was for him to put a target on Callum's back. With each passing week, Rose's suspicions that her father was involved in something illegal grew more difficult to ignore. She had to keep Callum far away from whatever it was, yet another reason they couldn't be together. Papa grunted and gave her one last look of warning before stalking past her and out the front door. Rose let out the breath she hadn't realized she'd been holding and spotted Violet's widened eyes glancing around the doorframe of their bedroom. Is he gone? I think so, Rose answered. Violet stepped out onto the plank floor, her blue calico dress looking beautiful with her dark blonde hair. As pretty as she looked, frustration marred her features. I don't understand him. He never used to be quite this, angry and suspicious. Rose didn't voice her suspicions, but rather chose to change the subject. Your bread is delicious, Vi. I'm impressed. A sad smile spread over Violet's face. It's mama's secret method, but I'll be happy to teach you. She taught me years ago, and it took me a few tries to remember how to do it. It takes some patience, though. Probably why she never took the time to teach me, Rose said with a chuckle. I wasn't quite the pupil you were in the kitchen dash. Or the garden, Violet finished. 
but you've got all the best parts of Papa. You're ambitious and brilliant, a good head for business and numbers. Not to mention, you're as kind and nurturing as they come. Rose was touched by her sister's unexpected praise. Thank you, that means a lot. Just speaking the truth, Violet said. Now scoot before Helen gets started without you. Bonnie and I'll be along shortly. Helen was already hard at work in the bakery by the time Rose arrived, her basket overflowing with paper-wrapped sandwiches and jars of sides. She looked up and a smile lit her face. There you are. I thought I was going to have to come break you out. She pointed to a pile of food and a basket to Rose's right. There should be plenty there for any young man who'd like to bid. It might even drive the price up a little, she said with a wink. Thank you, Rose said as she took in the extravagance her friend had brought along. Not only were there fixings for sandwiches, but there were also two jars of potato salad, honeyed carrots, and lemonade. Helen, this is too much. You shouldn't have gone to so much trouble. Helen waved her concern off. It was no trouble at all. Mama and I were already cooking the food for my basket. Throwing a little extra in the pot was easy. Oh, I didn't tell you. Mama made Papa promise not to bid on my basket or scare off the men like he always does. She says I'm old enough to make my own choices. Removing her luscious red locks from the braid that held them back while cooking, Helen flashed a mischievous grin. I know it's petty to say so, but I suppose I'm hoping there will be a bidding war for my basket like there was for Lily's. Wasn't there only a bidding war because both Lucas and Lily's brothers had told the other men to bid? Simon and Nicholas had been in a prank war with Lily while Lucas had been attempting to spur Alex to admit his true feelings. Sure, but that just means it would be even more exciting if it happened for me. Helen stood back from the light pink bow she tied on her basket, one that matched her dress perfectly. Rose always felt that shade of pink made her look paler than she already was, but somehow it was just another of the many colors that enhanced Helen's beauty. After a few minutes, the bell above the door jingled, and Violet and Bonnie walked through. Oh Rose, Bonnie said excitedly, your basket is perfect. The food did look delicious, and Rose had to admit she hadn't done a bad job tying the light green bow. It didn't perfectly match her dark green dress, but at least they went together. Come on, ladies, Helen said. The bidding starts at nine, and we don't want to be late. All three Gilbert sisters followed Helen out of the bakery and tried to hurry past the bank. Papa might have allowed Rose to go to the festival, but there was no way he'd allow her to take part in the basket bidding competition if Callum was going to be at the festival. The smell of cooking beef, pork, and chicken filled the air as they got closer to the area around the church where festivals were held. The creek trickled by gently, a little low as it generally was at this time of year. On the other side of the creek, each of the ranches had set up their own barbecue areas and at least five men stood around each pit. From the looks on their faces, one might think they were getting ready to run into battle. The barbecue won't be judged and eaten until dinner, Helen explained. They'll keep it cooking all day long, and the top ranch gets the title of barbecue masters. Bonnie giggled at the silly title. Is that all they get? Apparently, Helen said with a wink, but don't let them hear you disrespect the title. Apparently, it's a highly coveted victory among the men. Children ran back and forth across the temporary wooden bridge that had been anchored to the creek bank on either side. Mothers, Edie and Lily included, reminded their children to be careful and shouted to their husbands around the pits to make sure they didn't get too close to the fires. Baby Eliza toddled close to the blankets the mothers sat on. You girls go let Lily, Edie, and Sarah know we've arrived, Helen said as she took Rose's basket. I'll take these over to the table and check our baskets in. She nearly skipped off, her bouncing curls shining in the bright sun. Violet stepped up beside Rose. I'm glad you've had Helen this year. She's a bit too much sunshine for me at times, but she's a good friend to you. She is a good friend indeed, Rose replied before turning to wave at Helen's family. Hello, may we join? Helen said to tell you she'd be over soon. Lucas, Edie shouted, Titus is getting too close to the, thank you, Callum. Lucas turned around from where he held a struggling Penelope to where Callum had rescued Titus from sticking a hand into the pit. 
He held his nephew in the air by his feet, Titus shrieking as though it was the most fun thing he'd ever done. Edie turned back to Rose. We'd love to have you join us, sorry about that. I'm going to go bring the twins back over here for a while, but you ladies feel free to take a spot wherever you can find one. Rose, Bonnie said with a pleading voice, can I go play with my friends? Sure, Rose grinned. Just make sure to check in every once in a while. She leaned down and planted a kiss on Bonnie's cheek. And be careful. I will, thanks. With that, Bonnie skipped off. Her strawberry blonde braids flying behind her. Callum carefully stepped around the children running back and forth over the bridge, eager to get to the blanket where Rose and her sisters sat with his family. She looked beautiful. She was still far too thin, but the bags under her eyes were a little less noticeable than they had been the last few months. Mayor Kincaid stepped up to the makeshift stage they'd created under the large oak tree and cupped his hands over his mouth. Everyone come on over for the basket bidding. Anyone who's not needed to man the pits, come on over for the basket bidding. A pang of disappointment shot through Callum that he wouldn't have time to talk to Rose, but it was quickly replaced by the realization he could bid on her basket. The winner got to share the contents of his basket with the lady who packed it. Suddenly, the few dollars Callum carried in his pocket burned a hole in it. Approaching the blanket, he put out his hand to Rose. May I help you up, ma'am? Her dark green eyes sparkled, and she grinned the way he'd always loved as she placed her hand in his. Thank you, kind sir. Once Rose stood to her feet, Callum turned to offer the same treatment to Violet, but Nicholas had already bowed at his waist to do the same. Milady? An unladylike snort made its way from Violet as she stood on her own. Thanks Nicholas, but I'm all right. With a Cheshire cat grin, Nicholas shrugged his shoulders. Suit yourself, Miss Gilbert. I'm a patient man. The sun beat down on them from overhead, but not a hair of violets was out of place as she pushed it over her shoulder. That's not quite the story I've heard from all the young ladies in town. With that, she turned on her heel and stalked over toward where Bonnie stood next to the widowed Mrs. Hattie. Rose's face turned beet red. I'm sorry about that, Nicholas. She's a little, brash. If Callum had to guess, his cousin didn't mind all that much. If anything, the challenge Violet presented made him even more attracted to her. That's all right, Nicholas said as he stared after her, the corner of his lip turned up. As I said, I'm a patient man. He set off in the same direction as Violet but turned at the last minute to stand next to Simon and Malachi. Uncle Jake and Ray remained at the pit keeping tabs on the different cuts of meat they had smoking. It was an ingenious operation, really. Yesterday, they'd come out to dig a long trench in which they lay the wood chips Lucas had ground up for them that morning. Sticks created a grill of sorts over the trench and were secured in place with a series of twine knots well away from the heat of the flame. To that point, the pit didn't look all that different from the rest of the ranches, but Ray's next innovation was what really set them apart. He'd secured a sort of roof over the trench with another set of tied sticks and a few boards Lucas had brought over. According to Ray, it was the way his family had done it on the plantation many years ago and resulted in the most tender beef, pork, and chicken one would ever eat. The low heat he insisted on would also keep the flavor of the meat from being overtaken by char, as he believed Forest Underwood's ranch and the Double G were cooking their meats far too high. If they weren't careful, they'd dry them out three hours before judging. Callum hadn't been quite as overtaken by the barbecue competition as his cousins had, but their setup impressed him nonetheless. Once everyone had mostly gathered in their spots, Callum and Rose next to Violet and Mrs. Hattie, Mayor Kincaid, spoke again. I think most of us know the general rules for today's basket bidding, so I won't waste time by going over them again. I expect everyone will participate fairly, he said as he pinned Alex with a look, and that we'll all have fun. Callum rubbed his hands together as he leaned toward Rose. I hope you packed a feast. She tensed for a moment. Callum feared she'd tell him not to bid, but after a glance toward the bank, she winked. I think some young man will be pleased. The first few baskets belonged to Belle Thurston, Katie Griggs, and Sophie Hightower. Each basket went for around a dollar, and the young women looked pleased with the men who bid. Next, Warren James won the bid for Lucella Jenkins's basket, 
exacting a low grunt from Helen on his other side. She impatiently pushed a lock of hair out of her face before crossing her arms over her chest. You all right there, Helen? Callum wasn't sure he wanted to know the answer, but it wouldn't be right for him not to ask. I'm fine, she huffed, and I hope they'll be very happy together. A few other baskets went around the dollar range, raising a good bit more money for improvements around town. Lucas and Papa got in a good-natured bidding war for Edie's basket, but Papa won when he hoisted Titus in the air. Titus Brown would like to bid two dollars. Edie shouted, sold. Laughter rippled through the crowd as she hurried up to grab her basket and take it to her three-year-old son. As he took it, he placed a sloppy kiss on her cheek. Callum's ears perked up when Mayor Kincaid brought up Rose's basket, but he won the bid easily. Only a few men from the lumberyard and a ranch hand or two bid, his final bid of $1.15 won the basket. A glance down at Rose's smile told him she was pleased, and he had to work not to strut toward the table full of baskets to obtain his prize. Next up, Mayor Kincaid said in his booming voice, is Miss Helen Jones's basket. It looks like a treasure, fellas, and I'm pretty sure that's Mrs. Abigail's potato salad in there. He chuckled, and Callum noticed more than a few young men digging into their pockets at the idea of a date with Helen. A few shot nervous glances in Uncle Kate's direction, but his face remained impassive. I'll start the bidding at 20 cents, Mayor Kincaid said. A ranch hand from the double G held his hand in the air. 20 cents. We have 20 cents, Mayor Kincaid said, do I hear 30? The bidding continued to drive higher and higher between at least seven different young men until a few dropped out at a dollar. Helen's eyes sparkled with excitement, her expression one like a child on Christmas morning. Oh, she said as the bidding climbed, I can't believe it. Rose chuckled. It's everything you wanted. With a glance in Uncle Kate's direction, she saw the large man smirk just before pressing a wad of bills into Robert's fist. Raising a hand in the air, Robert got Mayor Kincaid's attention. Three dollars. Helen's eyes went huge, and the fire in them burned just as brightly as the excitement had a moment ago. What? Papa, you said you wouldn't dash. I said I wouldn't bid, Uncle Kate said smugly from about ten feet away where the rest of their family stood. Robert did not make the same promise. Aunt Abigail stood beside them shaking her head. I'm sorry, honey. You know I tried. We have three dollars, Mayor Kincaid said from the stage. Going once, going twice, sold to Robert Jones. Helen let out a frustrated growl before stomping past a group of disappointed cowboys to grab her basket. When she reached Robert, she thrust it in his face. Here, if you and Papa think you're so funny, you can have lunch together. With that, she returned to take her place next to Rose, fists clenched at her sides. It's not fair, she grumbled. Uncle Matthew even lets Emily have a real basket to bid on, and she's two years younger than I am. Rose placed a gentle hand on her arm. Be thankful you have a Papa who cares for the right reasons. She spoke so quietly Callum had barely heard her, but the words felt like a kick to the gut anyway. Rose deserved a father like Uncle Cade, Uncle Jake, and his own pa. They all did things differently, pa a little less protective than either of his uncles, but all loved their daughters and wanted the best for them. As discreetly as he could, Callum placed the basket on the ground and took Rose's hand closest to him. With a gentle squeeze, he prayed she understood all that was in his heart. Chapter 11. Callum led Rose over to the creek to a small patch of grass within sight of where the rest of his family had their lunch. If she daydreamed hard enough, maybe she'd forget about all the things that kept them apart, and it would be like old times. Does this look like a good spot to you? Callum gestured to the grassy knoll only about 15 feet from the pine trees of the forest. The creek trickled over the rocks, and the occasional frog hopped from the banks into the flow. Families dined close by, while other couples from the basket competition spread out in all directions. It's perfect, Rose said. But Callum Dash. He raised a hand. I know, we're only friends, but friends can share a meal. They can laugh and visit. They can enjoy each other's company. As long as you understand that. Rose hated to spoil the moment. 
but her father's words that morning had driven home the realization that she and Callum wouldn't be able to pursue any sort of courtship in the foreseeable future. Callum sighed. I do. As they pulled the lunch she and Helen had packed that morning from the basket, Callum's eyes widened. From the looks of some of this, I'd say you had a little help from Helen. A blush rose up on Rose's cheeks. She was generous with her leftovers. Callum knew good and well Rose wouldn't have had all she needed to pack such a feast, but he was kind enough not to say so. Are you excited for the barbecue judging? Relief swept over Callum's face, likely from the change of subject. I am. I know I'm biased, but the rub Ray puts on meat takes it from mighty good to absolutely delicious. I'm not even sure what all spices he uses, but I know he and Aunt Beth have been planning out what herbs she'd plant for months. Spreading a napkin over her lap, Rose glanced over to the pits. Have you been involved with the planning? Not over much, Callum said with a shrug. I've been busy putting a fence up over at my ranch and didn't have the time. I was part of the team that butchered the cow, hog, and chickens though. Some folks don't realize the way you butcher meat affects the tenderness, but it does. Rose loved hearing Callum talk of ranching. It was his passion, his dream as long as she'd known him. He'd once told her that he felt far more at home around cows than he did people, though Rose couldn't see how that was true. Like Helen, Callum had always possessed the uncanny ability to light up any room he was in. Well, until she'd broken things off with him. No one had needed to tell her how badly he was hurting. She saw it every time he stopped by the bakery or attended church. As they settled into light conversation, Rose couldn't help but want to keep that easygoing expression on his face. It's so kind of your uncle to help you get your herd started, Rose said. I know that can take a long time. Callum wiped his mouth with a napkin and nodded. It's more than I ever would have expected. I do plan to pay him back, but the gesture means a lot to me. He believes in you, Rose said as her hand moved to cover his as though it had a mind of its own. Anyone who knows you knows that you'll make a fine rancher. She didn't mention the thing that was likely on both their minds. Apparently, her father hadn't thought so, or he'd have given him the building loan. Callum stared at their hands on the blanket they'd borrowed from his mother. After a long moment, his light green eyes rose to meet hers. They were the color of prairie grass in the early spring, gold flecks making them seem even lighter. You think so, too? Of course I do, Rose responded quickly. How her father couldn't see it was beyond her. You're a hard worker, and you've learned from the best. You know cattle and the land better than anyone I know. Not to mention, anything you've yet to learn about the business side, you have your Uncle Jake there to guide you. He let out a breath. I suppose you're right. It's been the business side of things that has me nervous. Numbers aren't my strong suit. The unspoken meaning in his words wasn't lost on Rose. Numbers had always come easy to her, to the point she'd won math competitions in school and ran much of the day-to-day -day business operations at the bakery. Helen was the artist in the kitchen, but Rose was the sure hand with their books. Because of that balance, Mrs. Ida rarely even came to Pine Creek to visit anymore. She trusted that the business was in good hands and had even made noises about a year ago regarding the girls taking over officially. Nothing had come of it, so Rose put it from her mind. No use hoping for things that might never come about. Not to mention, at the time she'd been fully expecting to marry Callum and move out to the ranch. It didn't mean she couldn't work at the bakery, but it would make it more difficult to keep the hours she did now. His eyes hadn't left hers, and it was impossible to tear hers away. For only a moment, Rose allowed herself to think of what a life might have been like if she'd married Callum and they'd worked side by side for his cattle operation. Rose, Callum said hesitantly, I dash. A voice from the other side of the creek startled them both. Unca Callum, Unca Callum. Titus and Penelope ran their direction, piling on Callum like puppies to someone who had treats. Mama told us not to bother you, Penelope said breathlessly, but we had to show you what we found. Titus nodded furiously beside her and reached in his pocket. Quick, he said as he looked back toward where Edie stood under the shade of a large oak tree with Lily. Both massaged their backs and looked highly uncomfortable at this late point in their pregnancies.
As his hand emerged from his pocket, a bright green frog hopped out and onto the blanket. Oh no! Titus exclaimed as the frog hopped from one picnic dish to the other. The twins scrambled to reclaim their prize, knocking things together and creating quite a ruckus in the process. It was only a moment before Edie's voice cut through the fray. Titus and Penelope Brown, I told you not to bother Uncle Callum and Miss Rose. She waddled toward them quickly, Lucas jogging her direction from where he'd been helping at the pit. I'm so sorry, she said with tired eyes. I thought they were playing with Katie Archer, Hunter, and Eliza. Rose took in a glance at the ruined picnic. Toppled jars of lemonade flowed into the grass, jars of potato salad rolled down the slight incline toward the creek before lightly crashing into a rock at its banks, and both Callum and Rose's sandwiches had tiny shoe prints in them. Unable to hold back any longer, Rose burst into laughter at the scene before her. It's quite all right, Edie. It had been so long since she'd had such a good belly laugh that she'd almost forgotten how it felt. She put her hand down behind her and was met with an odd texture just under her pinky finger. Glancing back with a start, she burst into laughter again. I think I found your friend, Titus. Gently picking the frog up from the ground, she brought him around to show Titus and Penelope. Would you two like to help me release him back into the creek so he can join his family? Titus's eyes went wide as saucers while Penelope clapped excitedly beside him. Yes, please. Both eyes shot to Edie. Can we, Mama? She let out a heavy sigh and shook her head, clearly restraining the grin that threatened. Go ahead, but stay right with Miss Rose, and don't step even one foot in the creek. The twins assured her they wouldn't, then skipped off toward the creek bank. As Rose stood to follow them, frog still in hand, Edie turned to Lucas. How long do you think before they're wet from head to toe? Lucas made a show of looking at his watch. If we're lucky, maybe another hour. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Kinkade called from over by the barbecue pits. He gestured at the judges who'd arrived that afternoon from various towns and cities nearby. Apparently, all knew their way around a barbecue pit, as well as a cattle operation. The time has come for our esteemed panel of judges to announce the winner. As stated, the judges were unaware of which meat came from which pit. They were simply given a plate with chicken, beef, and pork and asked to score all three on a scale of 1 to 10. This gives each team the opportunity to win 30 points overall. The crowd murmured amongst themselves, as most hadn't been aware of just how seriously the competition was being taken. It had to be, though. Butchering any animal wasn't taken lightly on any real ranch. If they put an animal out of commission, particularly one that might have earned them a profit at the stockyard, it was a matter of respect. We have a total of five teams to represent the five local ranches. The Double G, Underwood Ranch, the Circle H, the Lazy R, and the Broken Silo Ranch have all submitted delicious cuts of meat. The judges were clear that each bite was delicious, and everyone should be mighty proud of themselves. Come on, Kincaid, Uncle Jake grumbled beside Callum. Let's stop with the pleasantries and just move it along. If the Circle H didn't at least put up a good fight, Callum knew the whole group of them would be disappointed. For Ray's sake especially, he hoped they'd come in toward the top. The mayor rambled on for another minute, waxing poetic about all the town improvements they'd been able to make strides toward that day, but Callum wasn't listening. Instead, he found Rose's distinctive strawberry blonde locks in the crowd next to Helen and her sisters. Nicholas hovered near Violet, but the girl didn't appear to notice his presence. It was about time some gal they fancied didn't fall at the twins' feet. Rose watched the mayor with interest until her head turned Callum's way, and their eyes met for the second time that day. Lunch with her might have been cut short, but it was worth the laughter she dissolved into after Titus and Penelope destroyed the moment. In third place, Mayor Hinson said with dramatics, is the broken silo. Congratulations, men. You've done a fine job. Ray stood on the other side of Uncle Jake, shifting his weight from one foot to the other. In second place, the mayor continued, is the double G, applause similar to that the broken silo had gotten spread through the crowd. Ray continued to bounce, his impatience clear. The recipes they'd used for the Circle H barbecue weren't just a recipe passed down from father to son, they were part of Ray's heritage.
his father had shared stories from the plantation, many of which were disturbing and heartbreaking. But occasionally, he'd share one of the gatherings they'd had near the slave quarters. They'd dig a trench just like Ray had directed them and bond over shared pain and a momentary reprieve. For Ray, the competition was about much more than meat. A grin spread across the mayor's face as he prepared to announce the winner. And in first place, the ranch with barbecue better than most of our judges have ever eaten, is the Circle H. Shouts, whoops, and applause filled the air as Ray spotted his wife, Paula, and lifted her in the air. Uncle Jake did the same with Aunt Beth, and many of the ranch hands threw their Stetsons in the air in celebration. That evening, after they'd all stuffed themselves to the brim on barbecue, a few people got out their instruments and cleared a space for folks to dance. Callum sought out Rose and approached where she sat on the blanket with Bonnie. The sun had started to set, but lanterns and a bright moon lit the space well enough. He bent at the waist, offering his hand like a gentleman might. May I have this dance? Rose's brows furrowed, and he could tell she debated the wisdom of saying yes. Just a dance, Callum assured her. Friends can dance, can't they? After a moment's more pause, Rose nodded. They can. She offered him her hand and allowed him to help her to her feet. Once they reached the dancing area, Callum took her hand in his and settled his other around her waist. Despite her tooth in frame, he was still in awe of how perfectly she seemed to fit there. It was though they'd been made for one another. I'm glad you came today. I'm glad Helen convinced me, Rose said. I've had fun. As much as he wanted to beg her to marry him once again, he knew it would only spook her. Instead, he whirled her around the makeshift dance floor, hoping she felt the deep connection he felt with her. The violin struck a beautifully haunting tone, and they slowed their dancing to its beat. Callum barely tore his eyes from hers as they moved together, dancing always having been one of her favorite things to do. The first time he'd asked her to dance had been at Nathan and Emma Archer's wedding. His heart had nearly beat out of his chest with nerves. The dance had been better than he could have imagined, but it was nothing compared to the wary anticipation he felt now. Music rising higher, Callum watched Rose's face as all her worries seemed to fall away. If only she'd let him marry her, she could look that way far more often. Life on a ranch wasn't easy. They'd have their share of heartache, but she'd no longer feel the weight of the world on her shoulders. The sound stopped all too quickly and Callum realized they'd been dancing for a long while based on the set of the sun. Stars twinkled in the night sky, the moon much higher than it had been when they began. Rose seemed to notice at the same time, as she jerked back quickly. I. I think I'd better get my sisters home. I don't want Papa to worry. Let me walk you, Callum said. All of you. Nodding, Rose glanced over to where Violet and Bonnie stood watching them with large grins on their faces. All right, one moment. As she scurried over to her sisters, Callum heard Boots step up behind him. Turning, he spotted his cousin Malachi. Looks like things might finally be going the right way for the two of you. It might be, Callum said. Where are Sarah and Eliza? They headed back to the parsonage with Lily and Hunter. We're staying in town tonight since we knew it'd be a late night, and we have church tomorrow. It made sense. I'm going to walk Rose and her sisters home, but I'll see you tomorrow. I'm happy for you, Malachi said earnestly. You two are meant to be together. Callum didn't answer, but he knew Malachi understood. There were many obstacles that still stood in their way. For all he knew, they might have to wait until Bonnie turned 18 to marry. He'd be willing to wait, of that much he was certain, but it wasn't ideal. Moving over to where the Gilbert girls stood, Callum tried to put all the troubles from his mind. Are you ladies ready to go? We are, Bonnie said excitedly. Oh, I had so much fun. Rose, can we please come to all the festivals from now on? Even if Papa doesn't want to go, we can come without him. Rose sighed, and Callum knew that wasn't a promise she could make. We'll do our best, Bonnie. The girls seemed satisfied, skipping ahead of them on the way back to their house. Once they reached it, Bonnie turned back and waved to Callum. Thanks for walking us home. Callum tipped his hat to her. It was my pleasure, ma'am.
stars overhead seemed to have grown even brighter since he'd first noticed them over the dance floor. Violet stepped ahead of them as well, but turned then. Thanks again, Callum. Just as she waved, she shot a wink at Rose and moved up their porch steps into the house. Once the door was softly shut, Callum lifted Rose's chin with his hand so that she faced him. I'm glad you had fun tonight. You deserve it, and I don't think you've had near enough recently. Rose's eyes misted, but she blinked away any tears that would have fallen. It was probably a good thing, as he never could stand to see her cry. As though his lips had a mind of their own, he lowered his head and placed a gentle kiss on her forehead before pulling back just a hair. His eyes held the questions his mouth couldn't ask, and Rose's head jerked in the tiniest nod. Closing the distance between them, Callum pressed his lips to hers. The whole world around them could be burning, but he wouldn't notice. All that mattered was the feel of Rose in his arms, her silky hair flowing down her back and over his hands. He just decided it would be best to stop, protecting her from his getting carried away, when a large hand took hold of his arm and yanked him backward. Before Callum realized who'd grabbed him, he sent a swift punch to the gut and jerked his other arm out of the man's hold. Pulling Rose behind him, he looked up to see Frank Gilbert bend over in pain. Get away from my daughter, the man growled as he stood to his full height. He only came up to Callum's eyes, but he imagined the man's face was beat red in the darkness of night. Don't you touch her again, Carmichael. I told you to stay away from her. Papa, Rose yelled as she ducked around Callum. It wasn't Callum's fault, please just dash. Shut up, girl, Gilbert said as he clutched her forearm and dragged her toward the door. When she cried out in pain, Callum stepped forward to plant his fist in Gilbert's face. No, Callum. Rose's voice shook with sobs just as the front door opened, and Violet's face appeared in the small opening. She held her arms out to Rose, and Gilbert shoved her into them. Callum, just go, Rose begged from where Violet held her. Please. Tears streamed down her cheeks, her voice thick with emotion. He'd do it for her. The last thing he wanted to do was make the situation worse for Rose, but he'd be lying if he said everything in him didn't want to pull her from Violet's arms and take her home to the Circle H. Aunt Beth would welcome her, and they had plenty of room until he could build his cabin. But she'd never leave her sisters, and he couldn't ask her to. He held up his hands, eyes never leaving Frank Gilbert, and backed down the steps. I'll go for now, but if I hear you took out your anger on her and harmed a hair on her head, you'll wish you'd never met me. Gilbert was silent, but Callum knew his face blanched despite the low lighting. Jogging back across town to where he had his horse tied, Callum fought to control the anger that welled up in him. Lord, I'm more convinced than ever that Gilbert's into something illegal. Please, keep Rose safe, and show me the way to uncover the truth. Chapter 12 Rose dipped a spoon into the cream Helen had whipped and spooned it into each end of the fried cylindrical dough. Am I doing this right? Glancing over from where she pulled another cannoli shell from the hot oil, Helen nodded. That looks right to me. I'm going to try and make some of the piping bags they have in other parts of the country, but the canvas I need isn't here yet. That'll make it easier. For now, let's just focus on getting the taste down and we'll pretty them up later. If you say so, Rose said as she attempted to wipe a glob of cream from the thin, crisp pastry. If nothing else, getting to the bakery early with Helen and filling the cannolis was a good distraction from the absolute disaster her weekend had been, since Papa caught her and Callum kissing. He'd blustered and bellowed for nearly an hour before finally storming back out into the night and slamming the door so hard the room shook. Bonnie had cried herself to sleep in Rose's arms while Violet stayed awake and seethed at their father's treatment. She was right, Papa had been completely unfair, but stewing about it wouldn't help anyone. Yesterday after church, Callum had attempted to seek her out and speak with her. Before he even got ten feet from her, Papa had pulled Rose roughly out of the churchyard as though she was a naughty child. It had been humiliating, but it was better than Callum and Papa coming to blows in the churchyard. She'd spent the rest of the day doing laundry until her fingers were nearly raw just to avoid going inside and seeing Papa. The ladies at the saloon would appreciate she had their loads done early, but her motives had been undoubtedly self-serving. Oh, Helen said as she placed another plate of fried pastry in front of Rose.
have I told you about the latest book I'm reading? It's a fantastic tale in which the cowboy takes off in search of his long-lost love, Helen continued speaking on her latest literary adventure. Rose listened as intently as she could, but her mind always wandered when Helen described books she was reading. Dime novels were Helen's weakness, the swanier, the hero the better. And if he rescued the damsel in distress? Even better. They worked along for a while, Helen doing most of the heavy lifting in the conversation. Finally, all the cannolis were more or less filled. They weren't pretty, but if the cream rose licked from the spoon was any indication, they might even outsell the colaches. Helen's eclectic treats were one of the things that made the business so successful. She poured over any cookbook she could find, and Edie had brought her back a stack of them the last time she and Lucas visited Chicago. Oh goodness, Helen said with a huff. I just realized I'm low on sugar, and we can't have that. Do you want to walk over to the mercantile with me to get some more? Rose glanced at the clock above the door. They still had another half hour before the bakery opened, and she'd noticed this morning that Bonnie was in dire need of some new shoes. Hers had worn nearly through the sols now that she was out of school and running around with her friends most of the day. She had a little cash from a delivery she made yesterday, and Bonnie needed the shoes as much as they needed anything. All right, let's go. The sky was cloudy overhead, and Rose hoped it wouldn't rain before she had a chance to take the laundry down from the line. The clouds weren't dark, but there were more on the western horizon that threatened rain. Once they left the mercantile, she'd stop back by the house and ask Bonnie to take the clothing down and fold it. Papa refused to allow her to hang the saloon's clothing anywhere folks might see, so the extra lines she'd hung back in the fall ran through their backyard. Why Papa cared, Rose couldn't say. It wasn't like the whole town didn't know she'd been taking in laundry. As soon as they stepped out of the bakery and locked up, the stagecoach rolled into town. Peen Creek. Stop is Pine Creek, Texas, the driver yelled from his seat atop the stage. I always get a little excited when the stage stops in, Helen said. Who knows who might be aboard to bring some excitement around here. Rose chuckled and shook her head. I'd say your family's had plenty of excitement over the past couple of years. Two attempted kidnappings and sabotage at the mill seem pretty exciting to me. Sure, Helen said with a wave of her hand, and obviously, I don't want anyone hurt. But none of that happened to me, I wasn't even present for any of it. Rolling her eyes, Rose threaded her arm through her friends. One of these days, Helen Jones, you're going to realize that a little boring isn't all that bad. The door to the stage coach swung open and a well-dressed man stepped out. His suit coat and trousers were dark gray while the vest under it had a dark print as well. His dark hair and beard made the entire effect a little intimidating, though he looked to be fairly young, perhaps late twenties or early thirties. To another woman, Rose imagined he'd be the definition of tall, dark, and handsome, but she had to admit she preferred cowboys over suits. At least one cowboy. The man pulled out the timepiece attached to his vest before he glanced around the town. His eyes landed on Rose and Helen, and he nodded in greeting. I take it back, Rose whispered to Helen. You might have gotten a little excitement after all. Helen cut a look sideways. Please, Rose, he's a dandy if I've ever seen one. Rose wasn't so sure about that. As the stage rolled away and the man turned to study the town, he placed a hand on his hip. The motion pulled back his suit coat enough to see a pistol strapped to his hip. I don't know too many dandies who carry a gun. But anyway, we'd better go. She began to pull Helen toward the mercantile when the man called after them. Excuse me, ladies, do you have a moment? Helen did a little curtsy that looked decidedly like flirting for someone who wasn't interested in the man before her. Of course, she said with a coy smile. The man raised an eyebrow but more or less ignored Helen's advances. Do either of you happen to know where the mayor's office is? He studied them both with deep blue eyes, his expression unreadable. Of course, Helen said in her sweetest voice. It's just down there a ways on your left. You can't miss it. Pulling her arm from Rose's, she put out a hand. I'm Helen Jones, and this is Rose Gilbert. Are you new to town? Rose didn't miss the way the man's eyes flashed at her name, but he recovered quickly.
My name's Jessie Pritchard, and it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Miss Jones, Miss Gilbert. Have a nice day. I thought you thought him a dandy, Rose said to Helen as her friend watched Jessie leave. His gait was strong, confident, as had been his air when he spoke to them. Helen blushed, and her dazzling grin overtook her delicate features. Perhaps I judged him too quickly. Did you see his eyes? Rose had noticed their deep blue, but it didn't matter, as Helen launched into a diatribe of how they were the color she'd always imagined the ocean to be. His hair was apparently a beautiful dark brown that reminded her of the bare skin rug Grandma Ruth had in her room before she passed. Jesse turned back to them one last time before swinging open the door of the mayor's office, nodding his head at them once more. Helen wiggled her fingers in a wave, but Rose merely nodded back. Something in his eyes when she'd said her name unnerved her. Was it interest? No, not quite. More like recognition. Of the two, Rose wasn't sure which she found more terrifying. That afternoon, Callum rolled Uncle Jake's buckboard into town and pulled it to a stop in front of the livery. Pete came outside quickly and shook his hand. You here for Jake's grain order? Yes, sir, Callum answered. He'd been busy since dawn moving the cattle from the north field to the east one, though he didn't imagine that was why Uncle Jake had sent him on the pickup. He'd been short with the other hands all day, unable to get the look on Rose's face as her father pulled her from the churchyard off his mind. He'd wished yet again that he could have laid the man out, but doing so would likely drive the wedge further and further between him and Rose. He'd never been one to cry about fairness, life just dealt you a bad hand at times. This time, though, it seemed mighty unfair that someone like Rose was saddled with a father like Frank Gilbert. He'd never been particularly affectionate towards her, not like Pa was to Edie and Emily, but Callum didn't think he'd ever been abusive either. At least, not until he'd seen the man grab Rose's arm and shove her into the house Saturday night. He'd waited outside for an hour, crouching in their rose bushes. If caught, it would have been tough to explain his need to stay outside and make sure all Gilbert did was shout. He hadn't heard any sounds that indicated any violence, for if he had, he'd have broken down the door and taken every woman in the house himself. Pete helped Callum load the grain order and sent him on his way. Rather than going straight back to the Circle H, Callum figured it was about time he talked to Pa about what was happening with Rose. He figured it might be best to stop by and visit with Mama for a moment before, so he headed to the house first. Climbing the steps to the old familiar porch, Callum felt a bit of peace wash over him. This house had always been that for them, and he'd missed it when he moved out to the Circle H and Mama, he called as he let himself in. You home? She was, and they had a nice visit until Pa climbed the porch steps and didn't look surprised to see him there. Son, I stopped by the ranch earlier. Your Uncle Jake said you might make it over here this afternoon, seemed he hoped you would. Mama stood from the rocking chair. I think I'd better go get dinner started. She crossed over to where Callum still sat and kissed him on the head. The Lord will work it all out, son. Once she'd gone inside, Pa's boots clapped on the porch as he went to take the seat Mama had vacated. Do you want to talk about it, son? If only it were that simple. I want to, he said as he stared off in the direction of the bank and Rose's house. Yesterday had felt like a similar scene to the one he'd lived when he chased her out of the church that day. But I'm not sure I should. Rose had shared everything in confidence, but whatever her father was involved in could be dangerous for her. If only the sky would open up, and the Lord would tell him what to do. The truth is rarely the wrong choice, Pa said. If it's not the time, I understand, but I think it's important you know that a federal agent from the United States Department of the Treasury is here to investigate Rose's father. He spoke softly, though no one was around to hear. Callum's head whipped around, looking his father in the eye. The Treasury? What would they want with Mr. Gilbert? Sure, he'd lost some money in a bad investment, but that didn't seem like something the United States government would bother investigating. Unless that investment had been illegal. Callum, Pa continued, if you know anything about this, it would be best for Rose if you came forward. He pointed over to a young, dark-haired man in a fine suit who exited the mayor's office and walked down the street in the direction of the boarding house. That's Jesse Pritchard, 
He's one of the Treasury Department's top auditors, and he's here to look into things. I met him this morning. What things? It still didn't make sense. I know he made some bad investments and is trying to pay the bank back, but that's all. Who sent for him? Callum's eyes bore into his father's. It wasn't you, was it? If his father had sent for Mr. Pritchard, Rose would never believe he hadn't tipped him off. Pa shook his head. No, Mayor Hinson came to me a while back and said that something odd was happening at the bank. Folks who should have had no problem getting a loan were denied. Gilbert put a limit on the amount of funds one could withdraw from a bank, and he's been acting awfully odd. He ran a hand over his face as his gaze followed Mr. Pritchard down the street. I thought he was acting too rashly, but he said he'd tried to speak to Frank on a number of occasions and was met with plenty of reassurances, but no real answers. So he sent for an investigator. A wave of heat rose up in Callum at the idea that Rose's father could be arrested and taken to prison. She already worked her fingers to the bone to provide for her family. What would she do if her father was convicted? She'd marry him and move her mother and sisters out to the ranch if he had anything to say about it. He did, Pa answered. I have to say, I thought it a little premature at the time. But when you were turned down for a building loan, it got me a little suspicious as well. Callum scoffed. That could just be because he doesn't want me to marry Rose. Maybe, but my gut's telling me there's more to it. Pa hesitated for a moment before continuing. I, ah, uh, I think you know this, but you're to keep this quiet. Gilbert doesn't know yet that Jesse's from the Treasury. He'll be upfront about it when he goes in tomorrow, but until then, it's important he doesn't have the opportunity to hide anything. So don't tell Rose, in other words. He wouldn't, though it might kill him. Staring back down the street in the direction of her home, Callum shook his head. The best chance for Rose to live a normal life again is for the truth to come to light. I won't impede the investigation. He considered telling his pa about seeing Mr. Gilbert outside the bank that night, but decided he still didn't have any hard evidence to go on. Rousing undue suspicion wouldn't be any more helpful than warning Mr. Gilbert beforehand. I'm sorry about all this, son. Your mama and I have been praying hard for the Lord to bring you and Rose back together if that's his will. Chapter 13 Rose glanced back to the front door from where all three sisters did dishes in the kitchen. Should we be worried Papa missed dinner? Maybe I should go take him something. Not only had all three sisters cooked the simple meal of chicken and potatoes, but they'd finished it and had nearly completed the dishes. I say just leave him be, Violet said with a shrug. He'll come home when he's decided we're worth a hello. The bitterness in Violet's tone worried Rose, but she didn't know how to broach the subject with Bonnie in the room. As it was, Rose washed the dishes, Violet dried, and Bonnie hurried about the kitchen putting things in their proper place. Rose glanced back to the other end of the house. Did Mama eat something? Violet sighed, the answer clear before she spoke. No, she's eating less and less lately. I don't know if there's anything we can do without Edie coming to see her. She paused and peered out the window for a moment. Do you think she might come if we asked? Maybe while Papa is at the bank one day? Before Rose had the chance to answer, the door swung open and slammed into the wall behind it so hard she was sure the doorknob left a dent in the wall. It slammed closed again as their father stomped into the kitchen. Bonnie, he shouted, get to your room. Eyes wide and brimming with unshed tears, Bonnie looked at Rose as if to ask permission. Rose nodded, and Bonnie scurried from the room with a glance over her shoulder. You're not her mother, Papa said coldly as Rose watched after Bonnie. Rose didn't reply and placed a hand on Violet's forearm to hopefully stimmy whatever retort she had as well. There was no arguing with Papa when he was like this, best to just comply. Would you like some dinner, Papa? We left it warming in the oven for you. His eyes narrowed, and he crossed the room in one long stride. Did you tell Callum Carmichael about what happened with the investments? I thought the boy looked suspicious yesterday at church, and now I believe someone spilled our secret. Reaching down, he clutched her wrist with a bruising grip. Was it you? Had Callum reported her father?
surely, he wouldn't break her confidence like that. I. I dash. Someone did, he spat, someone tipped off the mayor, and he sent for someone from the treasury department to audit the bank. Be honest, girl, he said as his grip tightened further. Did you do this? Rose opened her mouth to confess when she realized there was no way the mayor could have sent for someone from the treasury department, that quickly. It would have taken a letter nearly this long to get there. This wasn't Callum. Papa released her wrist with a shove, and it was only Violet's steady presence beside her that kept Rose from crumbling. Never had Papa manhandled her before Saturday evening after the festival. Now, he'd done it twice in three days. Violet stepped in front of Rose, shoulders back and head high. You've got your answer, Papa. Leave her alone. Eyes narrowing at Violet, Papa's head cocked slowly to the side. What did you say to me? I'm tired of this, Papa, Violet said with a clear voice. You've got us imprisoned, and it's no way to live. Touch her again, and I'll report you to the sheriff myself. Rose went to pull Violet back, but her sister stood firm. Were she not so terrified, Rose would have been proud of Violet's strength. It was a strength she'd once thought she possessed herself. Get out, Papa said as he pointed to the door. Get out of my house, you're not welcome anymore. If anything, Violet stood taller. It'll be my pleasure. She turned back to Rose. I know you won't go, she said as she shifted her eyes down the hall to Bonnie's room, but I won't be far. With that, Violet pulled her into a quick hug and turned to walk around their father. She placed her hand on the front door but paused. Rose, she said without looking back, make sure you take care of Mama. Goodness knows he won't. She calmly opened the door and exited, leaving a seething Papa alone with Rose. The fire burned bright in his eyes. Got anything else to say? Only the terror at the thought of leaving Bonnie to fend for herself kept Rose from following Violet out the front door. No, sir. Good, he said, and if I find out you're lying, it'll be you right behind her. With that, Papa stalked off down the hall and entered his and Mama's room with a slam of the door. Before Rose realized the shaking had begun, it had nearly overtaken her. She sank to the kitchen floor and pulled her knees into her chest, sobbing over everything her life had become. Not so long ago, she'd felt hope at the knowledge that God walked with them through the fire. Now, she couldn't be so sure. Soft footsteps on the wood floor startled her, and she looked up into Mama's light green eyes. Are you all right, Rosie? Mama's hair seemed to gray a little more every month, her skin nearly hanging off her from her lack of appetite. The nightgown she wore was clean due to Rose's recent washing but badly frayed. Violet had mostly taken the reins of Mama's care, and Rose couldn't remember the last time she'd ventured into the dark bedroom. In some ways, it had been easier to pretend Mama was on an extended trip than it was to believe she was right there and had abandoned them. No, Mama, I'm not. The sobs returned and racked her body uncontrollably. Mama sat down beside her on the hard, wooden floor of the kitchen and pulled her in close. Stroking her hair as she had when Rose and Violet were small, she softly sang a lullaby as familiar to Rose as her own name. How long Rose sat with her mother on the floor of the kitchen she couldn't say, but at some point the dark clouds shading her soul began to lift. The darkness outside the window told her it must be later than she thought. Rose took deep breaths and began to wipe her eyes. When she felt her emotions move back under her control, Rose took in her mother's sad expression. Thank you, Mama. You're welcome, dear, Mama said as she smoothed back a lock of flyaway hair. I'm only sorry I can't be the mother you girls deserve. You could still be that mother, Rose said, Bonnie needs you. Mama shook her head. Even coming out of her room had to be exhausting by the worn pallor of the skin around her eyes. I can't, my love, but you can. But what if Edie came to see you? I know she has some ideas that might help. Rose needed her mother to regain the will to fight long enough to help them out of this mess. She didn't want to beg, but she would if she had to. A look of confusion crossed Mama's face. Your father said Dr. Light told him nothing could be done, that melancholy was a disturbance of disposition and nothing could be done. Anger at her father welled up in Rose again at the lie. That's not true, Mama.
It may not bring you back to how you were before Bonnie was born, but it might help a little. Isn't a little progress better than nothing? Mama stood to her feet. I suppose it might be, but I can't talk about this much more right now. You need to get to bed as well, I know how hard you've been working. Leaning down, she pressed a soft kiss to Rose's hair and softly patted back down the hall. Lord, give her the will to live, the will to try. And be with Violet tonight. I don't know where she's gone, but help her find somewhere safe to sleep tonight. In the morning, Rose would go out and find where that place was. She'd bring some of Violet's things and make sure she was safe and cared for. Until then, all she could do was pray the Lord would guide her steps. That night, Rose awoke with a start at the sound of soft steps walking down the hallway. She counted twelve steps before the soft click of the doors open and close sounded as well. Who in the world would be up at this hour? It had to be Papa, but what could he be doing? Curiosity outweighing her reason, Rose pulled on her slippers and a simple day dress as quickly as she could. Keeping her footsteps as soft as possible, she opened her door and moved down the hallway to the front door as well. A quick glance back told her no one had followed her, so she followed the path her father undoubtedly took to the bank. Her guess was correct, and Rose spotted the lit lantern in his office just as an owl hooted and swooped down from the sky. Rose startled, but managed not to scream at the surprise. A few steps closer, Rose looked in the grated window of her father's office and spotted him poring over his ledgers. He looked nearly as flustered as he had early that evening, the coloring of what skin she could see growing redder and redder in the dim lamplight. For a while, he stood and paced the room, talking to himself the way Rose knew he did in the face of a particularly difficult problem. Just as he sat back down in his chair, the door of his office swung open, and three men dressed in dark clothing with bandanas tied around their necks walked in. Who were they? And why would Papa be meeting them in the middle of the night? It felt like the confirmation Rose hadn't wanted that her father was up to no good. Before she got too far into that train of thought, however, one hand clasped her shoulder while the other closed over her mouth. Just as she raised her elbow to plow it into her captor's rib, a familiar whisper split the air. SSH, Rose, it's me. Callum? She whipped around in his arms, still held close to his body. She hissed into the night. What are you doing here? A third voice sounded in another whisper, though still one she'd heard before. I suppose I should ask the both of you that question. Jessie Pritchard crouched just down the outer wall from the bank. Moving closer just as she shot a glance into her father's office where he and one of the three men spoke in raised voices. Rose grit her teeth. My father came home upset that you'd come to investigate him but then left the house. I followed him. Her gaze shot back to Callum. What are you doing here? He pointed at the man inside the office who now towered over Papa in a rather intimidating manner. I was out in the west pasture earlier when I saw that man and his posse ride in under near darkness. They looked like they were in an awful hurry, and I didn't like the idea of them getting into town without Pa knowing. But when they went straight to the bank, I was more worried about who they were coming to meet. He ran his hand through his honey-colored locks. Imagine my surprise when I sneak over to see what I can find out and see you doing the same thing. His eyes bore into hers. You don't need to be here, Rose. It's not safe. Neither of you need to be here, Jesse said in an exasperated tone. But since you are, why don't you shut your mouths so we don't get caught on the business end of a pistol? Jesse approached the window and narrowed his eyes at the leader of the group. With a low growl, he watched as the man pinned Papa against the wall, the back of his forearm to Papa's throat. Rose gasped, but Jesse shook his head. He won't kill him, he said so quietly Rose wondered if he even intended for her to hear. His assertion was correct, as a second later the captor led Papa go, and all three filed out of the room. Papa shuffled back to his office chair and plopped down in it before placing his head in his hands. She'd never seen a more defeated man. Callum kept his hand in Rose's glancing around occasionally to take in all their vulnerable sides. She knew she should probably remove her hand from his, but she simply liked the feeling too much. His touch had always made her feel safe and cherished. Jesse spoke, though never took his eyes off Papa. That's your father, right? 
Yes, she answered, and I assume you're from the treasury? Yep, Jesse said before he turned to Callum. You need to get her home. Those are dangerous men Gilbert's tangled up with, and neither one of you need to let them know you exist. Callum's voice stayed low even as his hand tightened around Rose's. Who are they? That's not important right now. You're the sheriff's son, right? Yes. Then I assume you know the importance of letting an investigation take place as it will. Impeding it will only make things worse for everyone. Callum stared at Jesse long enough that the man turned to look at him. I understand, Pritchard, but I will do anything I need to to keep Rose safe. After a long moment, Jesse put out his hand. Understood. I'm afraid you have me at a disadvantage. I know your father, but I didn't catch your name. Callum Carmichael, he said as he returned Jesse's handshake. And this is Rose Gilbert. We've met, Jesse said with a nod in Rose's direction. I met her and her friend, Helen, was it? I met them as soon as I got off the stage. Despite the seriousness of the moment, Rose smirked at the memory of Helen's appraisal. Helen's decided he's rather handsome. Callum chuckled. If Helen's got her sights on you, just know that resistance is generally futile. She's my cousin. Jesse's face was unreadable, but Rose got the impression Helen's flirtations weren't necessarily welcome. I'll keep that in mind, he said as he stood to his full height to the side of the window. Just remember what I said, stay as far away from this as you can. We'll do our best, Callum said as he took Rose's hand once more and led her down the outside wall of the bank. They reached Rose's front yard, and Callum turned her to face him. His hand raised to touch her cheek softly. Go on in, Rose, and listen to Jesse. Are you the one who tipped off the mayor? Every second they stood in the yard was another second longer Papa might catch them, but she had to know. No, Callum said seriously, but I would have if I'd realized you were in danger. Rose understood. She felt much the same about her sisters. Will I see you tomorrow? Probably not, Callum said, we're busy on the range this week. But family dinner is at my parents' house on Thursday. I'll come by then if I don't see you before. It felt like forever away, but Rose knew it was probably best she didn't see him every day. It was much too hard to say. Goodbye. Good night, Callum. Ride safely. Stepping away, he tipped his Stetson in her direction. Will do, ma'am. Chapter 14 Callum woke the next morning to a foggy head and tired eyes. The rest of the men in the bunkhouse were already awake, but most hadn't left to eat breakfast yet. So as not to be late, Callum swung his legs off his bed and dressed quickly. It had been well past midnight when he finally got to bed last night, but he didn't think any of the hands noticed him come in at such an uncharacteristic time. Pulling on his socks and boots, Callum laced them up quickly before moving to the wash basin and splashing his face with the cool water. In the colder months, a splash from the wash basin was enough to wake even the groggiest man, but it wasn't quite so dramatic when the air outside ran hot enough to make a man sweat by eight in the morning. Morning, Cal, Mateo said from behind Callum. Morning, Mateo, Callum replied as he dried his face. You in the barn today? They rotated barn duty since no one particularly preferred it to the range. Yep. Mateo hesitated only a moment before speaking, his accent thick as it always was when he grew nervous. Listen, I don't mean to cause any problems. Callum tossed the rag back onto the counter. What is it? Mateo ran a hand through his thick, dark hair. I saw you come in, in mighty late last night, and I know the boss doesn't cotton to such things during the week. It's not like you, so I just wanted to make sure everything was all right. He was right. Neither Uncle Jake nor Ray allowed them to stay out all night when they had to work the next day. Grogginess could get a man killed on a ranch. I can't give you many details, brother, but just know I wasn't doing anything immoral. Waving his hand in front of his face, Mateo scoffed. I knew you weren't, I just wanted to make sure there wasn't something wrong. Don't you go needing help and not asking for it. The man was only a couple of years older than Callum, and he'd worked for the ranch nearly as long as Callum had. Thank you, Callum said as he perched his trusty Stetson atop his head. 
should we get going? If we don't get up to the big house soon, all of Aunt Beth's bacon will be gone. That would be a cry and a shame, Mateo said with a grin. The rest of the cowhands had made their way out, and the mass headed up to the main house was full of hungry cowboys. Everyone but Ray, who ate with his family, ate with Uncle Jake and Aunt Beth, one of the few operations Callum knew of that fed their help like family. It inspired loyalty in a way little else could, and Callum hoped to follow suit. Looks like we might get a storm today, Matteo said as he peered off toward the west. I don't like the looks of those clouds. Callum hadn't noticed when they first stepped outside, but he was right. The air was muggier than it normally would be at that time of day, the breeze just a bit higher. We'd best eat quickly and get the herd to the north pasture. It was the one with the fewest trees that might blow over in a storm, by far the safest. Jogging the rest of the way inside, Mateo and Callum found Uncle Jake in his office quickly. After a quick look out his west-facing window, Uncle Jake agreed that time ran short before the storm rolled in. Fellas, Uncle Jake said as he strolled into the dining room, eat up quick. The skies are getting darker by the moment, and I don't want a storm to surprise us with the herd still in the east pasture. Every man nodded their understanding and nearly shoved food into their faces, breakfast burritos by the looks of it. Aunt Beth approached with two in hand for Callum and handed them to him quickly. Nicholas is out tending his crops, and Sarah's likely all alone with Eliza at their cottage. Will you ride out and warn them? Tell Sarah she's welcome to come here for the day. Will do, Aunt Beth, Callum said as he kissed her cheek. Nicholas always rose early and went out to his plot some half mile from the big house to tend to his crops. He didn't want to take time away from his duties as a ranch hand until he turned a profit, so he weeded, watered, trellised, and trimmed during the same times Callum worked on building up his homestead. Malachi and Sarah lived in a cabin on the Circle H property, though Malachi wasn't a cowboy. A lawman through and through, when Malachi turned in his badge as a Texas Ranger to stay home with Sarah and Eliza, he'd hired on with Uncle Matthew as Pine Creek deputy. After a quick trip to the barn to saddle up his horse Rudy, Callum took off in the direction of both his cousin and cousin-in-law. The skies had indeed grown darker as he reached the cabin first. Knocking lightly in case the baby was still asleep, Callum took a step back to wait for Sarah to open the door. To his surprise, Malachi opened it. His holster and badge told Callum he likely wasn't far from leaving, though. Mornin', Callum, he said with a teasing grin. No breakfast at the big house? Nope, I'm afraid I'm not here for food. He gestured off toward the western skies, recognition flashing in Malachi's eyes as he took in the sight. Aunt Beth thought Sarah might want to bring Eliza over to the big house today just in case it gets ugly. Sarah appeared in the doorway, her gray eyes wide as she took in the sight. We'll do that as soon as I go get Eliza up. Thank you for coming to tell us, Callum. I'll saddle up jumper, Malachi said as he went out to the lean-to that housed his mount on days he didn't have time to bring it to the barn. You two can ride with me before I go into town. Worry washed over Sarah's pretty face as she gazed at her husband. Are you sure you can't stay with us today? What if you get caught in it on the road? From the looks of it, Callum said, it'll be a while yet before it hits. The skies are cloudy, but the big wall of clouds over there has a ways to go. Malachi shot Callum a grateful look, then turned back to Sarah. You get Eliza and her things, we'll get going in ten minutes. He held up a hand in Callum's direction. Thanks, Cal. You're welcome, Callum said. I'm headed out to warn Nicholas now, not that he hasn't already noticed. Malachi chuckled as he stepped outside and hurried toward the lean-to. That boy watches the skies more than a wise man in Bible times, I'm sure he knows. Placing his foot in the stirrup and hand atop Rudy, Callum took hold of the reins and clicked his tongue to nudge Rudy forward into a trot. He directed the beast towards Nicholas's garden plot and prayed the weather would hold long enough for everyone to get to safety. I can't believe y'all had a midnight stakeout without me, Helen said as she greased the tins of the muffin pan. I could have been so much help. Rose rolled her eyes. It wasn't a stakeout, and keep your voice down. The bakery had emptied out from their morning rush, but there was always the possibility a customer could walk through the door and hear them. There's no one here, Helen said.
She paused and pursed her lips, a mischievous glint to her eyes. Did Jessie say anything about me? Unsure quite what to tell her, Rose decided to. Um. On the side of protecting her friend's feelings. We didn't really have much time for chatting. There was, after all, quite possibly a crime happening. A crime involving her father, one Rose couldn't help but believe he was deeply involved in. Pouring the blueberry muffin batter into the tins, Helen sighed dreamily. Just imagine, if Jesse brings the Ring of Outlaws to justice and decides to stay in town. It would be just like in this book I read once dash. Helen, Rose said admonishingly. First, Jesse is an auditor, he's not a lawman from one of your stories. Second, if these are outlaws then my father is likely one of them. What will that mean for us? Compassion filled Helen's eyes as she put the bowl down. I'm sorry, that was insensitive of me. Crossing the kitchen, she pulled Rose into an unexpected but welcome hug. If your father goes to prison, know that you're not alone. We'll lose the house, Rose said quietly. It's owned by the bank. Helen pulled back and took Rose's hands in hers. We'll figure it out. Between all of my family, there are plenty of rooms available. Rose hadn't mentioned to Helen that Mr. Warden from the saloon had continued to offer her work as a waitress. Helen simply didn't understand what might drive a woman to place herself in such a situation, but Rose knew it well. If Papa went to jail, it might be her only option. Though, if Papa went to jail, there would no longer be anything keeping her from Callum. But was it fair to him to bring a bedridden mother and two sisters into a new marriage? No, that much was clear. The bell above the door jingled, and Violet strolled in, a smile on her face. Good morning, sister, Helen. I hope you slept well. Violet, Rose exclaimed as she barreled forward into her sister's arms. You're safe. I've been so worried about you. Even if they hadn't had their misadventures the night before, the thought of Violet outside alone would have kept Rose up most of the night. I'm just fine, Violet said. I barely left the house last night when I ran into Lily Hall. I'd no sooner told her what happened than she'd set me up in the cottage on their property. She told me you and Bonnie, even Mama, are welcome there if you need to come. Helen's footsteps sounded behind Violet, her gasp audible. Violet, you've moved out? Kicked out is more like it, Violet said with a smirk. But the Lord provided, and now I don't have to walk on eggshells in my own home anymore. Before Rose could respond, Bonnie skipped through the door. I'm here, Vi. I can't wait to see your new house. It's not really my house, Violet corrected, but they're being incredibly kind to let me stay there and very generous with my rent. They didn't even want to charge me, but I insisted. Bonnie nearly bounced with excitement. Let's go now, it looks like it's going to storm soon, and I don't want to be caught out in it. As if on cue, the wind picked up outside. It was enough to send a woman's skirt flying up if she wasn't careful. Violet studied it a moment more before turning back to Rose. Do you want to come, Rosie? It won't take long to tour, then you can come right back. They weren't due for another influx of patrons for a few hours, generally the mid-afternoon. Rose raised an eyebrow at Helen who shooed them all toward the door. Go on, go see your sister's cottage. I'll hold down the fort here until you return. Thank you, Rose said before remembering the bag she packed for Violet that morning. Oh, I packed some of your clothes for you, as well as a few special things I knew you'd want. Your sewing kit, Bible, journal, things like that. Let me run home and get them, and I'll meet you both at the cottage. Papa should be gone to the bank by now. A scowl crossed Violet's face at the mention of their father, but she masked it quickly. Thank you, Rosie. We'll see you there. Taking Bonnie's hand, they stepped out the door and hurried down the street to avoid getting caught in the downpour that would inevitably come. I'll be back soon, Rose told Helen as she moved out into the gale herself. The wind was relentless, bearing down from the west in a way Rose hadn't seen before. The thought crossed her mind that perhaps they were in for a tornado, but those didn't typically come this late in the season. She climbed the steps to their house, sadly noting that Violet would no longer be there to tend to Mama's plants. Even though Mama had come out to comfort Rose the night before, she didn't hold any illusions that she was now cured of her melancholy.
it was too wonderful a thing to even imagine. The door squeaked slightly as she opened it, but it was nothing compared to the scream Rose let out when she saw Papa lying on the floor, face down. Papa, she exclaimed as she rushed toward him. Papa, wake up. Turning him over onto his back, she examined him for any bleeding or obvious signs of struggle. Had the men from last night come back? A door down the hallway opened, and Mama rushed in with bare feet. Rose, what's happened? She gasped, bringing her hand to her mouth. Tears filled Mama's eyes as she froze, not moving toward Rose and Papa or away from them. I don't know what's happened, but he doesn't appear to have been attacked, Rose said. He's pale, far too pale, but I'll need Edie or Sophie to come see him quickly. Can you come here and be with him? Maybe press a wet rag to his face? Mama didn't move, didn't speak. Her eyes were fastened on Papa, her mouth still open in a silent gasp. Mama. Come back to me. I need your help. Her face visibly jerked as her eyes seemed to regain their life. Why, yes. Of course I will. I'll go for help. Do the best you can for him while I'm gone. See if you can find some smelling salts, but I don't know what else to do. With that, Rose rushed out the door and toward the clinic. A sign on the door sent Rose's heart plummeting into her stomach. Dr. Brown and Nurse Hightower have gone to the Freedman's School. They'll be back in the afternoon. The Freedman's School. That was out on the property of the Circle H, the school Jake and Beth Carson had built for the black children when the school board hadn't allowed them to go to school with the white children. Rose knew Edie set up a clinic there once a month or so to make it easier on their families for non-emergency ailments. Apparently, both the black and Mexican families took advantage of the clinics, as they lived further out from town and many didn't have their own horses or wagons. Rose took a deep breath before taking off toward the livery. She knew she'd have to argue with Pete to get a horse in this weather, but Papa needed Edie now, and she'd steal one if she had to. Chapter 15 Uncle Jake's voice cut through the whipping wind and pouring rain. Is that all of them? Thunder rumbled in the background, and a bolt of lightning flashed mere seconds after. Yes, sir, Callum yelled back. Ray's heading up the rear, and that's all of them out of the north pasture. The rain fell in sheets, whipping across the pasture like nothing Callum had ever seen. He circled back around, making one final check that none of the cattle had fallen behind. As he did so, a figure in the distance caught his eye. The person was on a horse, flying through the gale in a way that surely meant an emergency. Surely, they were racing in for Edie. She and Sophie had set up a clinic at the Freedman School that morning and gotten stuck at the ranch due to the storm. Whatever the need, it had to be serious for someone to risk riding in this. Hello there, he shouted, fighting to be heard. As the figure got closer, their face obscured by the rain, Callum recognized a familiar blue dress. Rose? He nudged Rudy into a gallop and met her at the head of the long path to the Circle H, what's wrong, why are you out in this weather? His heart raced at the fact that her horse could have easily gone down in the mud. Flying debris or a fallen tree could have meant sudden disaster. The worst-case scenarios he drudged up in his head still didn't affect him the way her stricken face did once it came into view. It's Papa, she sobbed, her tears mingling with the rain on her pale face. He collapsed this morning. The sign on the clinic door said Edie was here. As much as Callum wanted to wrap Rose up in a blanket and sit her by his aunt's fireplace, she'd never allow it. One second, he said, before riding a few hundred yards in the direction the rest of the hands had gone. Spotting Matteo, he breathed a sigh of relief. Matteo. Frank Gilbert has collapsed at their house. Get Edie there as soon as possible. Matteo's eyebrows raised as he nodded furiously. Will do, Cal. I'm going back with Rose, Callum said as he turned back around. Be safe. Within seconds, Callum had reached Rose again. Whipping off his heavy leather coat they used only for weather like this, he handed it to her. Take this, Mateo's going to get Edie. I can't take your coat, Callum. You'll get soaked. We don't have time to argue about this, Rose. Please take the coat, or you'll catch your death. 
A boulder settled in Callum's gut at the thought of how long she'd already been out in the gale. Rose's lips pursed as she took the coat from him. Thank you, let's go. They pressed their horses as hard as they could go safely on the ride back, Callum unable to be heard over the downpour even if he wanted to speak. As it was, he wouldn't do anything that might slow them down. Frank Gilbert might deserve a fist to the face, but he was still Rose's father. If he passed, she and her sisters would be in an even more difficult situation. They reached Rose's home quickly, but not so quickly Callum's shirt and trousers weren't nearly soaked through. Were it not for his leather chaps and boots, he didn't doubt every inch of him would be wet. Stopping just outside their fence, Rose moved to dismount the horse she'd no doubt rented from Pete. Just as she swung her right leg over, it seemed her soaked skirts tangled around her legs, causing her to lose her balance. Callum's own feet had only just touched the ground when he spotted her struggle. She let out a strangled cry as she lost her grip on the wet saddle horn, stumbling backwards. Thankfully, Callum reached her in time to break her fall. It was an awkward catch, what with her legs still tangled in her skirts, but a catch nonetheless. Thank you, she said breathlessly. Setting her quickly on her feet, Callum did his best to help her untangle herself while remaining within the bounds of propriety. Not that anyone was outside to see them. You go, Callum said as he took both Rudy's reins and those of her horse. I'll tie off the horses and be inside in a moment. Rose nodded and took off toward the door, Callum following shortly after. When he entered the parlor, it was more crowded than he realized it would be. His father and Malachi stood in the corner, Mr. Gilbert having been taken to the couch. He was awake, and Malachi breathed a sigh of relief. Rose knelt by her father's side, holding his hand and whispering reassurances to the man who was so pale Callum might have thought him dead, were it not for the fact that he spoke back. I'm all right, Rosie, Gilbert said. No need for all this fuss. A whimper from the corner brought Callum's head around and he spotted Mrs. Gilbert in a nightgown and robe sitting in a wingback chair next to the unlit fireplace. Her knees were pulled up to her chest, eyes darting about the room. Mrs. Gilbert, Callum said softly as he approached her and crouched to eye level. Do you remember me? I'm Callum Carmichael. She nodded curtly, her breath short and shallow. Edie's on her way to examine your husband. Callum didn't want to ask any questions lest he spook the already terrified woman. Mr. Gilbert's head popped up at the sound of his voice. His eyes narrowed, and he pulled his hand from Rose's to cross his arms across his chest. It was an odd posture, sitting up on the couch as he was, but Callum reckoned it was meant to be intimidating. Edie was out at the ranch today, Callum answered calmly. Rose rode out to get you some help, and I escorted her back. His muscles tensed, and he silently dared Mr. Gilbert to tell him to leave. There was no way he'd do that until he knew Rose was all right. Rose stood, the hurt in her eyes clear. Her arms hung limp at her sides as she approached Callum. You don't have to stay, she said quietly. We can wait for Edie here. No, Callum replied. I'm not here for him, I'm here for you. Rose cut her eyes quickly towards her father and back to Callum. He doesn't need the extra stress of this as well. Please, go to your parents' house so I know you're safe. I'll come let you know what Edie says when the storm is over. Studying the burgundy rug on the dark wood floors, Callum rubbed the back of his neck. Are you sure? It went against the very fiber of his being, but he'd do so if it would remove some of the worry from Rose. Yes, Rose said with a tiny smile. I'll come find you dash. Her father's voice interrupted the promise, thundering nearly as loudly as the gale outside had. You will not. Rose Gilbert, you'll stay in this house and not leave until I tell you. Mrs. Gilbert whimpered again beside them at the volume. Ignoring Mr. Gilbert, Callum took Rose's hand. Promise me you'll go change before you get sick, if you haven't caught something already. Her fingers were ice cold, her lips pale. I will, Rose said with a quick nod. She moved slowly toward the hallway before turning back to Callum. Thank you. Her meaning was clear. The tear stains on her cheeks nearly broke his heart, but leaving was the best thing he could do so as to not get Gilbert more worked up. Once Rose disappeared into her room, he caught Mr. Gilbert's eye. I'm leaving now, sir.
I hope you feel better soon. He might have spoken through clenched teeth, but he meant the words nonetheless. Stay away from her, boy, Gilbert spat. I already warned you twice. Knowing nothing he said would help the matter, Callum locked eyes with his father. A quick nod from Pa assured him he wouldn't leave until the situation was well in hand, and Callum felt mildly better stepping out into the rain that had only just begun to let up. He untied both Rudy and the dappled mare Rose had rented from the livery, figuring he'd return it and pay the tab so Rose didn't have to. It was so much less than he wanted to do, but it was enough for the moment. By the time Rose finished changing clothes and appeared back in the parlor, Edie had arrived and had somehow lowered her extremely pregnant self to a kneeling position next to Papa. Mama had apparently had enough of people and went back to the bedroom. Edie listened to Papa's heart with her stethoscope, asking questions about his symptoms as she went. Two long leather dusters hung on the coat hooks in the parlor, and Rose imagined they belonged to Edie and Sophie. How long have you been having chest pain? Papa hemmed and hawed before he finally answered the question. It's not all the time, just sometimes. Are you experiencing heightened stress at work that might have caused it? Edie kept her voice even, but Rose knew her well enough to know it was only for the sake of her professional demeanor. Papa shrugged. I imagine it's related to my wife's illness. Fighting the urge to roll her eyes, Rose couldn't help but send a glare in Papa's direction. This wasn't Mama's fault. How dare he blame her? Your wife's. Edie cocked her head to the side. If your wife is ill, why haven't I examined her? Waving a hand in front of his face, Papa huffed. It's more a disease of the mind, nothing you can help. Edie took a deep breath before placing her hand on the couch to stand Sheriff Carmichael stepped forward and helped her get to her feet, but said nothing. Mr. Gilbert, Edie said in a clipped tone, I can help your wife with her melancholy and nerves, but only if you allow me to see her. As for you, she paused as she wrote out a list on her notepad. She handed the list to Sophie who promptly left the room and moved out the front door. Sophie's gone to get you some medication and herbs that I'll ask you to take daily. It's also important that you try to calm some of the stress in your life, possibly starting with letting me treat your wife. Papa shook his head. There's no need. Edie bit her lip before turning to Rose. You know where to find me if you need me. And Mr. Gilbert, I recommend that you take at least two weeks off of work. I don't believe you had a heart attack, but one is likely to come if you don't get some rest. Two weeks? Rose didn't know how in the world they'd survive without Violet's income and Papa's. There wasn't enough laundry in the whole town to make up for both their incomes though, she always had the saloon if she got desperate. Glancing out the window, Rose noted the rain had led up to merely a trickle. Running through her short list of options, a sense of hopelessness set in as she realized the saloon might be her only choice. I can't take two weeks off, Papa said. I'm the only one with the combination to the safe. Sheriff Carmichael cocked his head, eyes narrowed. Surely, you could give the combination to one of your trusted clerks for the time being. No, Papa said quickly, that's not how we do things. Edie shot Sheriff Carmichael a look before speaking. Then will you at least come stay at the clinic for a few days so that Sophie and I can keep a closer eye on you? Generally, if a male patient needs to stay overnight, Papa or one of the men in my family will stay as well. A clap of thunder rumbled in the distance just as Papa's eyes went wide. No, doctor. I can't leave my girls unprotected like that. I'll stay here. Sheriff Carmichael stepped forward, arms crossed in front of his chest. What might they need protection from? Papa didn't respond, and Edie packed the last of her things in her bag. The front door opened again, and Sophie appeared in the doorway with three vials of tonic and a small basket of tea bags. Here you go, Edie. Thank you, Sophie, Edie replied. You can go on home for the day while the rains let up. Papa, Malachi, I think we're all good here. Wait, Rose said as she hurried down the hallway. Grabbing Callum's coat off her bed, she rushed back out to hand it to his father. I don't think I'll be able to leave Papa today, tell him thank you again for me. Sheriff Carmichael's green eyes, so like Callum's, held only compassion. I will, Rose. Thank you.
Rose followed the lawman and Edie out to the front porch. As soon as the door shut, Edie's gaze met hers. I meant what I said about your mama. I won't even charge, but there are herbs that can help with both her nerves and her melancholy. I'm confident she doesn't have to live this way. There's more to it than that, Rose said honestly. I'll do my best, but I doubt Papa will ever allow someone to treat her. Edie's lips pressed into a line, but she nodded. Let me know if he does change his mind. I will, Rose said as she watched Sheriff Carmichael help Edie navigate the slippery steps. A pang of longing for that type of father hit her square in the chest, and she fought back the tears that threatened. At the whinny of their horses, Rose realized she needed to return Pete's horse to the livery. Only, the mare didn't seem to be there anymore. Callum must have taken it back for her, and the kind gesture warmed her chest. Watching Sheriff Carmichael continue his hold on Edie as she navigated the rough stone pathway at nine months pregnant, Rose realized where Callum learned his thoughtfulness. Never in his life would her father have done something so kind without being asked, but Callum likely hadn't even thought twice. It seemed such things were as much a part of his nature as working the range was. The woman who married him would be a lucky girl indeed, and Rose felt a knife to the gut at the idea that it couldn't be her. She'd never ask him to wait for Bonnie to turn 18, and Papa would never allow her to go with them until then. Lord, you know the path we're walking better than even we do. You know Papa's heart, his mistakes, and whatever illegal matters he's gotten into. You know the truth. Father, Scripture tells us the truth will set us free, but all I feel right now is bondage. Show us the truth, and set us free. Chapter 16 Thanks for working with me, Uncle Jake. Callum shifted his weight from one foot to the other in his uncle's office at the Circle H, having ridden back out once the storm quit. Uncle Jake stood and walked around his large oak desk and placed his hand on Callum's shoulder. Of course, take as much time as you need to help them. And please let your aunt and I know if there's anything else we can do. He'd done a good deal with the space since taking it over from Mr. Hyatt. Portraits of Aunt Beth, Malachi, Lily, Simon and Nicholas hung on the back wall. As many books about animal husbandry graced the floor-to-ceiling bookshelves as did those on accounting and best business practices. Trinkets and crafts given to him by his children over the years adorned the shelving as well. I don't even know that she'll let me do anything, Callum grumbled, but I'm going to try. With a nod, Uncle Jake released Callum's shoulder and moved back to where he studied the books for the Circle H, before you leave, make sure you eat something. Beth would have my hide if I sent you back to town on an empty stomach. It was mid-afternoon, but Callum hadn't eaten since breakfast. He'd only stopped by his parents' house long enough to get word from Papa that Rose wouldn't be coming by. After that, he'd saddled Rudy back up and headed back to the ranch and the cash he kept in a box beneath his bed. For years, Callum had lived frugally, saving enough to buy his land the summer before. Since then, he'd been saving most every dime he made with the intention of using it as a down payment for his building loan. He'd planned to go to Hunter's Gap next week to apply for the loan there, but Rose and her family needed the money more if Mr. Gilbert was to be out of work any time at all. If he were being honest, the fact that he'd never given Rose an engagement ring grated on him as well. They'd discussed it and decided it would be better to put the money toward his land and their house, but he'd also saved a little extra with the intent of sliding a ring on her finger at their wedding. After a quick stop in the kitchen and a hug for his Aunt Beth, Callum moved down the steps toward the bunkhouse. If you ignored the wet ground and wind-blown look of the ranch, you'd be hard-pressed to believe the storm from that morning. A few empty buckets were overturned and blown across the ground, Aunt Beth's tomato plants leaned precariously into one another and standing water made getting to the outhouse a trick. But overall, they'd been blessed. No structures, cattle, or cash crops had been irreparably damaged during the storm, and everyone was safe. The sky was blue as could be, the drop temperature a welcome reprieve from the oppressive heat of a Texas June. Within a few days, July would be upon them, then the cattle drive in mid-August. This time last year, Callum would have thought he'd be married to Rose. Maybe they'd have a little one on the way by now. Instead, he trudged through mud and standing water to the cache under his bed, cache he hoped Rose would accept. The bunkhouse was quiet that time of day, 
as most of the other men were out on the range or in the barn. His boots were the only sound. He stooped in front of his neatly made bunk. All the men knew of his stash, but he trusted every man there with his life. They'd never steal from him. Digging under his bed for the small wooden box Simon had carved for him, he opened the latch. Uncle Jake paid them well, not to mention provided room and board. Having saved most every penny he'd made since buying his land and his fencing supplies, Callum had over $500 saved. Rose wouldn't take the lump sum even if she was desperate. He counted out $50 and placed the rest back in the box. Her pride was a tricky thing, and while he would be happy to give her the lot, she'd likely only get angry. No, he had to do this right, or he'd lose all ability to help her. The ride back to town felt shorter than it normally did, his gut churning the whole time at the thought of how to approach the topic with Rose. He prayed the Lord would guide him, knowing there was little else he could do. Rose's house came into view, and Callum hesitated. Should he tie Rudy there or down the street at the mercantile? Hopefully, Mr. Gilbert was sleeping, but his seeing Callum would do Rose no good. After a few minutes of debate, he nudged Rudy down the street to the mercantile, walking back to the house behind the white picket fence. Keeping his footsteps on the steps and porch as quiet as possible, he knocked lightly on the door. It was a moment before soft footsteps sounded, growing louder as they approached. Bonnie opened the door looking chipper as always, her near-permanent smile firmly in place. Hi, Callum. Are you here for Rose? I am, Callum said, is she home? Bonnie shook her head. No, she left a little while ago. I'm not sure where she went. Of course. Of all the scenarios Callum had imagined upon riding to town, he didn't know why he didn't consider Rose's absence. Did she have any laundry with her? I don't think so. Papa's sick and taking a nap. She might have gone to get him some medicine. The girl's innocence was refreshing, and Callum found himself grateful they apparently hadn't shared the details of this morning with her. Reaching out, Callum tweaked her nose like he'd done since she was a child. Thanks, Bon. I'll go find her. With a last tip of his Stetson, Callum moved back out of their yard to stand and look down the street both ways. Where might she have gone? First, he tried the mercantile since it was close by, then the bakery since it seemed logical. Rose was at neither location, and Callum started to grow equal parts frustrated and worried. Suddenly, a feeling settled in his gut that he ought to check the saloon. Worst case scenario, she wasn't there and he could make his way back to the bakery. Walking with purpose, he crossed the half-mile or so stretch of town between the bank and the saloon. Since the saloon sat back from other businesses a bit, he didn't see a single soul out front, nor did a peek through the window yield him any answers. The stage and tables were empty, no noise or crowd as there would be later that evening. The chairs sat atop the tables, the bar deserted as well. He'd almost convinced himself he was being unnecessarily cautious and that Rose would never be so desperate to come here for a job, but just as he stepped back from the window, a flash of strawberry blonde hair appeared in his periphery. Rose took a deep breath before knocking on the back door of the saloon. Conviction pricked her heart that she'd once again taken things into her own hands, but the situation in front of her clouded her vision of all else. A chill ran up her spine, as did a general feeling of discomfort. It was broad daylight, but she'd always felt a little uncomfortable there when neither Annie or the girls were outside. By that time, they were likely upstairs getting in a nap before their late nights. The door creaked open, and Mr. Warden's bald head peered out. Miss Gilbert? Were we expecting you today? No, sir, she said with more confidence than she felt. I'm here to inquire about a job. You've mentioned before you might be willing to hire me on as a waitress. He studied her for a moment. His gaze was interested, but not threatening. Annie will surely be upset with me if I hire you, but come on in and we'll chat. Heat rose in her cheeks at his accurate appraisal of the situation. Following Mr. Warden inside, she realized she'd never been inside the saloon before. He led her through a storage room of sorts, with bottles upon bottles of liquor and crates stacked five high. The main dining room wasn't as intimidating in the daylight as she imagined it would be at night, 
There was no raucous laughter, no cloud of smoke, no leering gazes of men to send her skin crawling. Rose took a deep breath and followed Mr. Warden the rest of the way. He pulled two chairs from atop a table and gestured for her to sit down. Before she got the chance, however, the swinging doors of the saloon burst open and Boots stomped angrily across the plank floor. Callum, looking as angry as she'd ever seen him, stared down Mr. Warden. This won't be happening. He took Rose's arm firmly but not painfully and pulled her towards the door. You'll not be working in a saloon, Rose. His face was pinched, as though he held back ten words for everyone he said. She jerked her arm from his grasp. I thought we established that you don't have a say in my place of employment. If I need a job and choose to work here, I'll do so. Callum paused, running a hand over his face. The redness of his face paled some, and his tone calmed. Please, just come outside and talk to me. Was there even any point? It wasn't like their situation was any different than it had been before. We need the money, Rose said with a huff. Speaking of, Warden cut in, why does your pa have you working so hard? Bank not paying him enough? The suspicion in both his tone and eyes was clear. Callum removed his hat and crunched the brim in both hands. Please, just come outside with me. Leaving Mr. Warden's questions unanswered, Rose surrendered and followed Callum out onto the front porch. He stopped when he reached the railing, returning his Stetson to its perch and gripping the railing until his knuckles turned white. Callum, Rose said softly as she stepped forward, I don't have a choice. He whipped around, eyebrows raised. Don't have a choice? I'm standing right here, I'm your choice. I know you can't marry me right now, but I can wait until Bonnie turns 18. We won't even be 30 yet. There will still be time to have everything we want. I couldn't ask you to do that, Rose said as tears filled her eyes at the gesture. Besides, that doesn't change the fact that we need money now. Callum dug in his pocket and pulled out a small wad of cash. I can help with that. I have more, plenty more, but I didn't think you'd take it all at once. I can help you from now until we can get married. Between you, me and Violet, we can support your family while your father gets better. Violet doesn't live with us anymore, Rose said quietly. Papa kicked her out. Anger flashed in Callum's eyes as he took in her words. What? Rose sighed, willing herself the energy to have this conversation. She stood up to Papa on my behalf, and he kicked her out. Glancing back at the saloon, she shook her head. I can't take your money, Callum. You need that for your ranch. We'll be all right. Your pa doesn't allow any funny business here anyway, all the waitresses do is fill drink orders and flirt a little. Callum's chest puffed out, the redness back in his cheeks. Absolutely not. This money was for our future, and if it means we still have one, then I'll happily spend every dime. Tears filled Rose's eyes and spilled over onto her cheeks. Without warning, Callum wrapped his strong arms around her and pulled her close. His shirt, the same he'd been wearing that morning, had dried and left only the scent of rain and the prairie grass in its place. No one was likely to walk by and see them in such an intimate position this far from the main boardwalk, but Rose didn't care either way. She just sobbed against Callum's chest until it felt like her well was empty. As they slowed, Callum pulled out a handkerchief. Rose took it gratefully, wiping her nose and eyes until the only trace of her crying jack were her undoubtedly puffy eyes. Not pulling back, but twisting her head upwards, her eyes met Callum's. Why won't you give up on me? His face, tense the moment before, softened as he gently took her chin between his thumb and forefinger. He lowered his lips to hers softly for just a moment. You're it for me, Rose. I'll never give up on you. I don't know what the truth is any better than you do, but I'm not abandoning you while we figure it out. Do you think Jesse Pritchard is going to be able to get to the bottom of it? Callum pursed his lips as though he chose his words carefully. Pritchard is apparently one of the best at what he does, but I think there's more to him than we know. I can't put my finger on it, but he's not your typical auditor. Perhaps it's the fact that he carries a pistol, Rose said with a smirk. Callum pulled back just far enough to lead them down the porch steps back into the street. You might be right, but I have a feeling he won't disappoint us.
Feeling guilty, Rose voiced what had been on her mind for days. Does it make me a terrible daughter that I almost wish Papa would get caught so we didn't have to live like this anymore? She didn't even know for certain that Papa was involved in something illegal, but all signs pointed to the affirmative. Stopping in the street, Callum tugged Rose to face him. It doesn't make you terrible to want to see justice done. He's put your life on pause for the past year due to his own mistakes and pride. I don't want to see you hurt, but if he goes to prison, there's nothing stopping your mother from getting help. Except the fact that the bank owns our house, Rose admitted. If that happens, I suppose we'll all have to move in with Violet in the cottage. The idea of all four women in that tiny cottage was almost comical, but Rose wasn't in a jovial mood. Callum ran the backs of his fingers down her cheek. If your father goes to prison, and you're willing, we can get married. I'll happily support the four of you. It was his genuine kindness that had made it impossible to forget Callum in all these months, and Rose knew she'd replay this conversation in her head for years to come. Tightening her grip on his hand, she offered a small smile. Let's just see what happens in the coming days. She hadn't spent much time in recent months seeking God's guidance for much of anything, and she knew that had to change. As hopeless as things felt, it was only with the Lord that the full truth would come to light. Lord, she prayed as she enjoyed one more moment of Callum's embrace, you say the truth will set us free. The bondage of these secrets is close to pulling me under, but I'm also terrified of what will happen to Papa. Guide us both to know your will. Chapter 17 That afternoon, Callum moved down the steps of his mother's house. He'd stopped by for lunch after escorting Rose away from the saloon and to the bakery for her shift, his stomach still in knots over the idea of her working around rowdy drunks every night. He'd been tempted to throw her over his shoulder and haul her out of there himself, but thankfully she'd followed without too much fuss. Their kiss that morning had been brief, but it had solidified one thing in Callum's mind. He had to tell Jesse what he knew about Frank Gilbert. The resolve was as clear to him as anything he'd ever known, as though the Holy Spirit himself led him there. As though summoned by his thoughts, the door to the bank opened, and Jesse Pritchard strolled out. It was nearly closing time for most of the businesses in town, the bustle of those going home for dinner already alive on the street. Dodging a carriage and a large gaggle of teenage girls on his way to Jesse, Callum let out a whistle lest the man get too far away. Jesse, hold on a minute please. Jesse turned, a serious but not bothered look on his face. He nodded before stopping to lean against the boardwalk outside the bank while Callum jogged to catch him. Thanks for waiting, Callum said as he approached. I wanted to speak with you for a minute. Of course, Jesse said with a furrowed brow. He pulled out his timepiece from the pocket of his smart suit and glanced at it. I've got some time before I meet with the mayor, how can I help you? Glancing around, Callum decided he'd rather not have their conversation in front of the bank. Walk with me. Eyebrow raised, Jesse gestured forward. Lead the way. They made an odd pairing as they made their way down the street, the sunshine bright overhead as though that morning storm had never existed. Callum still wore his ranch clothes, a perpetual layer of dust despite the thorough soaking he'd received that morning. Jesse, for his part, wore yet another dark-colored suit. It seemed he had an endless supply. Today, it was dark gray with a blue and gray vest. The bulge on his right hip spoke of the pistol he always carried. Callum thought it curious for an auditor, but that was far from his most pressing issue. I wanted to speak to you about Frank Gilbert. I may have some information that can help you. The stone that settled in his gut that morning seemed to toss around now, but Callum couldn't stand to see Rose in such uncertainty any longer. Even if she decided she hated him for it, he had to tell the truth. Jesse continued looking forward, his face impassive. I thought you might. It seems you're quite taken with his daughter. Denying it was no use, so Callum didn't respond to that. Instead, he launched into the tale of everything he knew. He told Jesse of their engagement and how no one had known, but Rose had suddenly broken things off. He spoke of all Rose had shared about Mr. Gilbert's investing in a mineral rights scam that went belly up and losing the town's money, resulting in all the extra work Rose and Violet had been doing to keep their family afloat. I thought it might be something like that, Jesse responded thoughtfully.
Their books are far from balanced, and I intended to confront Gilbert about it this morning before he had his episode. Up to last summer, they balanced perfectly. Then, it was as though someone tried to cover something up but did it poorly. The frustration in his voice was clear. At least the books are in my possession now, and they can't be altered. There were still pieces to the puzzle Callum couldn't fit together. I still don't know what role the men we saw in Gilbert's office the other night have to do with anything. Jesse paused for a moment, facing Callum for the first time as though appraising his trustworthiness. The men we saw that night are dangerous criminals, but they're involved in scams all over the South. If he's mixed up with them, it's fairly obvious that he's made a deal with the devil. His eyes narrowed as he studied the street once again. Callum's heart raced at the idea of men like that in any kind of proximity to Rose. Who are they? It's a gang led by a man named Jack Pruitt. He's known in many circles as Black Jack, thanks to how he amassed his original fortune in gambling halls across Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Since then, they've moved on to holding up trains, stagecoaches, banks, and other establishments. I'm not sure what their plan is now, but you can bet Jack's got one. Jesse spoke the last few words through clenched teeth, and Callum wondered what his history was with the man they called Black Jack. He knew better than to ask her though. I have to do some more investigating, Jesse continued, I'd like to take a look in their safe tomorrow, see if their actual cash store is anywhere near the number it should be. If it's not, that would confirm your story in a way Gilbert can't talk his way out of. This morning, Gilbert said he was the only one with the combination to the safe. How are you planning to do that? Jesse's eyes twinkled, the first real mirth Callum had seen from the man. I have my ways. Deciding to leave that statement alone, Callum changed topics slightly. When I saw Pa after he left the Gilbert's house, he said Frank had been reluctant to take any time off work. If you don't want any tampering, you might go ahead and check the safe sooner rather than later. Jesse ran a hand through his dark beard, quiet for a moment. You might be right. I assumed Mr. Gilbert's condition was grave, but I suppose not if he's eager to get back to work. No, Callum said. It might be in the future, but he's all right for now. Checking his timepiece once again, Jesse stopped and turned back towards the bank. They've still got about an hour before close. I hate to go in right as they're the busiest, but I also don't want Gilbert to get the chance to hide anything. Mind if I go with you? Callum had no real business going, but he was personally invested in this case. If he could be of any help whatsoever, he'd do it. Jesse looked him over. All right, but only because a witness is always helpful in recalling facts. Not to mention, I may need someone to call in the sheriff. He winked, and Callum followed him back toward the bank. As they approached, two familiar figures approached from the direction of the bakery. Helen chattered away, likely about some dime novel she was reading, while Rose listened politely. Helen held the cash box from the bakery, while Rose held a basket of what Callum could only assume was baked goods. Rose wore the same pink dress she'd worn that morning, and Callum hoped he sensed a little less despair in her. Having her come apart in his arms like that had nearly been his undoing. Afternoon ladies, Callum said as he approached and tipped his hat. Anything in that basket for me? Helen shifted the cash box to one hand and grabbed a muffin out of the basket. Throwing it directly at Callum's face, she giggled as it bounced off his nose and into his hand at just the last second. Blueberry muffin? Taking a bite, Callum decided he wouldn't have minded if she'd thrown the whole basket at him. Don't mind if I do, this is delicious. Helen turned to Jessie, a coy smile on her face. Would you like one, Mr. Pritchard? No, thank you, Miss Jones. I'm fine. Helen's eyes widened for just a moment before she recovered, likely not used to any man turning her down for much of anything. Well, if you change your mind, you know where to find me. Jessie didn't respond, and Callum noticed Rose stifling a grin at his obvious discomfort. After a few seconds of awkward silence, Callum decided to put them all out of their misery. I assume you ladies are headed to deposit today's money? Can we escort you inside? Rose's face lit up, and she nodded. You're welcome to. Callum took a step toward her, offering his arm as they started up the steps to the boardwalk.
With a glance back, Callum chuckled as Jesse merely nodded toward the steps and gestured forward to Helen. After you. His cousin let out a huff and nearly stomped up the steps, taking Callum's other arm just before they moved through the doors. In the reflection in the bank's window, Callum spotted Jesse staring after Helen with both awe and frustration. She'd been known to have that effect on a man. It occurred to Callum that once they got inside, Rose might have questions as to why they were there and especially why he and Jesse went down the hall toward her father's office. He needn't have worried, though, as the bank was so crowded they lost each other as soon as Rose removed her hand from Callum's. He stopped by the door and waited for Jesse to come through, keeping an eye on Rose and Helen as they moved toward the tellers. Wow, Jesse said as he took in the crowd. Business picks up after five. Most of the businesses close at five. Mr. Gilbert keeps the place open until six so folks can get their business taken care of without having to leave their work. It had been a considerate plan, but Callum imagined much of it was due to Mr. Gilbert's own tendency to never leave his place of employment. Jesse nodded before turning back to the crowd. He moved quickly but politely through the fray, reaching the door that led down the hall to a few small rooms and Mr. Gilbert's office. Jesse waved at Mrs. Edna, who nodded back from where she helped John Thompson with his deposit. Opening the door down the long hallways, the hairs on the back of Callum's neck stood up. He chalked it up to being so close to finding the truth about Mr. Gilbert, but something in his gut told him that wasn't all. Helen searched the room, her eyes peeled. Where do you think Callum and Jesse got off to? And why were they together? Seems like an odd friendship. I'm not sure, Rose replied. She'd briefly wondered why Callum would be at the bank this afternoon, but decided she didn't have the mental fortitude to worry about it today. Helen rolled her eyes. I don't know why Jesse has to be so rude to me. I haven't done anything to offend him. Moving forward a few steps in line, Rose pinned Helen with a look. He wasn't rude to you, he just isn't falling all over himself to court you. Maybe he has a sweetheart. Helen's eyes narrowed as she searched the room again. No, I don't think that's it. I see flashes of interest there, but then it's as though he freezes. Perhaps, once he finishes the audit, he'll have a little less on his mind. Once he finishes the audit, he'll go back to D.C. The corner of Helen's mouth quirked up. We'll just have to see about that, won't we? Rather than reminding Helen that she barely knew the man, Rose stayed quiet. Any relationship that played out between Jesse and Helen over the next few weeks would provide entertainment at the least. Helen had opened her mouth to speak again when three loud gunshots pierced the air. Both women hit the floor, as did many others in the crowded building. Trying to get a look without being conspicuous, Rose noted that there were four assailants, all wearing cowboy hats and bandanas that covered everything but their eyes. On the floor. On the floor. Their shouted orders were nearly drowned out by the sound of women's screams and children's cries, but everyone obeyed. Where were Jesse and Callum? Both carried pistols, but that wasn't uncommon in the West. Of the other men in the room, Rose doubted many were armed. John Thompson didn't didn't generally carry a weapon, nor did old man Palmer from the barber shop. If only she'd taken a lesson from Edie and carried a derringer, not that a two-shot derringer would help her against four men. Lord, we can't do this without you. Guide me. Listen up, one of the men roared as he approached the door that went down the hallway. If you'll all do what we say, we might let you out of here alive. Mrs. Edna, the sweet older woman who'd worked for the bank as long as Rose could remember, stood as tall as her short frame would allow behind the counter. Please, she said with a shaky voice, don't hurt anyone. You can have what you want, just please don't hurt anyone. One of the men turned his gun on her. Where's Gilbert? Papa? Were these the men who'd been in his office that night? H, he's not feeling well, Mrs. Edna responded. He's not here today. The man growled. You got the combination to the safe, lady? He approached her then, his height a solid foot greater than hers. I don't, Mrs. Edna said as she sniffed. It nearly broke Rose's heart to hear her so afraid. But you can have anything in the cashbox here. Turning to two of his cronies, the man whipped an arm toward the door.
Go on and break the lock if you have to. We're getting our money today. The men disappeared behind the door, while the one in charge stayed next to Mrs. Edna. You'd better hope they can break the lock, old lady. Or you'll be telling us where Gilbert is. Mrs. Edna stayed silent, and Rose debated what to do. The time it'd take her to try and reach them would be far too long, not to mention the other criminal would likely shoot her before she got there. In fact, the man said as he spat in Mrs. Edna's face, why don't you go ahead and tell us where he is now? Mrs. Edna shook her head, but didn't speak. A brave one, eh? It'll be a shame for me to have to do away with you. He raised his pistol and aimed it straight at Mrs. Edna's face. Rose jumped to her feet. Stop. She rushed forward, willing her heart to slow as he turned the gun on her. I can help you. His eyes narrowed, the only strip of his face visible behind his bandana. You know the combination? No, but I know some numbers we could try. Their birthdays, her parents' anniversaries, she at least had a few options. You Gilbert's girl? I heard you was pretty, but you're a little skinnier than I'd have expected. His eyes raked her up and down, and he lowered his gun and stepped toward her. He ran a hand through her hair until he reached near the bottom. Tightening his grip, he yanked her head backwards and nearly dragged her with him toward the hallway door. Come on, girl. If nothing else, you'll serve as excellent motivation to get Gilbert here. Shoving her in front of him, the outlaw held a firm grip on her hair until he let out a grunt and it loosened. Whatever had caused it, Rose knew she had only a moment to gain her freedom. Kicking backward with all her might, Rose connected with what she imagined was his knee just as he let out a roar. Rose whirled around, blinking a few times at the sight before her. Helen had jumped on the outlaw's back like a spider monkey and clawed at every piece of his face she could reach. In the scuffle, his bandana had come loose, and Rose did indeed recognize the man as the one who'd shoved her father against the wall in his office. He slung Helen off into a heap onto the floor just as his accomplice ran toward them. Rose kicked out again, her foot landing in his abdomen that time. Shots flew again, and the door to the hallway flew open. The front doors of the bank crashed against the wall as well, and Rose barely had time to register Callum and Jesse rush in from the hallway just as Callum's father and Malachi rushed in from the back. The two men who'd gone into her father's office appeared quickly, joining the fight as well. Fists flew, kicks were placed, and handcuffs were whipped out by the lawmen in the room. Jesse landed a punch to the jaw of the man who'd grabbed Rose's hair, the criminal's face alight with recognition. You, he'd growled just before he raised his pistol and fired a shot. Helen screamed, as did many of the other women in the room, but Jesse clutched his arm and not his chest. The fight lasted only a moment, but to Rose it felt like an eternity. As the pandemonium died down, Rose realized one of the four men had gotten away, the one who'd seemed to be in charge and had known Jesse. The rest struggled against their captors, but didn't best them. Helen rushed forward to Jesse. Are you all right? I'll go for Edie. She started toward the door, but Callum stopped her. I'll go, Callum said. You stay here until we know the coast is clear. He rushed out the doors into the sunlight, while Jesse clutched the bloody sleeve of his gray suit jacket. A grimace marred his face, but it softened slightly as Helen approached him again, tearing a piece of her dress to tie around his wound. Chapter 18 It had been nearly two weeks since Gilbert's episode and the attempted bank robbery. Rose's father had healed fairly well, the most therapeutic event seeming to be his full confession of harboring stolen goods for Black Jack's gang. Callum sat in the jailhouse with Pa, Malachi, and Jesse. He sipped on a cup of bitter coffee, but the last few weeks had made the coffee a necessity. Uncle Jake had been gracious to allow him to spend a little more time in town to ensure Rose and her family were doing well, but he tried to keep up with his chores at the ranch as well. It made for some late nights. Though, he had to admit, his nights likely weren't as late as that of Lily and Edie, both having had their new little girls within the last week. So you're certain Black Jack will be coming back to finish what he started, even though the stolen goods have been confiscated? The thought turned his gut, but he had to keep giving up control and surrendering to the Lord. Callum wasn't sure he'd ever completely let go of his desire to fix everything for those he loved, 
but the Lord's plans had proved much better than his own ever could have been. Unfortunately, Jesse responded grimly. He's got many more men than those who were captured, and Jack Pruitt holds a grudge like no other. He'll come back, if only to make those he sees as having wronged him pay for their misdeeds. His jaw clenched, and Callum couldn't help but believe it might be personal. Malachi stood and walked over to the window, staring out onto Main Street. How long until Gilbert's hearing? If he's locked up, maybe it'll deter Jack from seeking revenge. Two weeks, Pa said, and the judge granted him house arrest until then since he's still recovering from his illness. He's cooperated well, and we already have his confession recorded in our notes. I don't imagine he'll serve a long sentence, maybe a few years. He might be a fool, but he's not a hardened criminal. Malachi poured himself a cup of coffee from the pot on the small stove. What are Mrs. Gilbert and the girls going to do in the meantime? Everyone turned to Callum, expecting him to have the answer. It was a fair assumption, as he'd worked to determine that very thing since that day at the bank. Rose's father has finally given his blessing for us to get married, and he apologized for his role in our struggles up to now. He'd broken down on the Gilbert's couch a few nights before, stirring Callum's compassion despite his ardent dislike of the man. Alex and Lily have agreed to let Mrs. Gilbert and Violet stay in the parsonage once they vacate the home the bank owns after the trial. Once we marry, Bonnie will come with us, and Rose will continue to raise her as our own. It hadn't been their plan in the fall, but Callum couldn't imagine asking Rose to leave the sister she'd all but raised from infancy. It felt a little odd, planning what they'd do after marrying without even being engaged yet, but Callum had been mulling over some options in his mind. As of now, they thought they might marry in a few weeks at the church. Pa raised an eyebrow. And Mrs. Gilbert's all right with that? She's doing better now that the truth is out and Edie's been treating her with some herbs and tonics for her melancholy and nerves, but she recognizes that she has very little relationship with Bonnie. Rose is, for all intents and purposes, her mother. Hopefully, Mrs. Gilbert will get to a point where she can fill some version of the role she once had, but that won't be for some time. For now, staying in town rather than more or less isolated on the ranch is better for her healing. Hopefully, the small cabin I'm working on will be enlarged before long and she can move out with us if she'd like. The cabin was another reason Callum had gotten little sleep the past few weeks. The ranch hands had all been generous with their time, working on it every spare minute they had. The cattle drive was next month, and they didn't have much time. As it was, the place was nearly livable with one bedroom and a small loft for Bonnie. He'd add on as quickly as they could to give Mrs. Gilbert the option of staying with them. He'd been approved for the building loan from the bank in Hunter's Gap, but it would take some time for them to expand as everyone was busy preparing for the cattle drive. In the midst of their struggle, it had been impossible to see God's hand on the situation. Now that he had some perspective, it couldn't be clearer. Not only had Mr. Gilbert been willingly meeting with Alex, but Rose had been able to let go of the hurt she'd held against him. Violet, on the other hand, still harbored bitterness toward her father. It was something Callum and Rose had committed to praying for in the coming days. Jesse ran a hand through his dark hair. I'm glad the truth is out, but I know it's torn that family apart. Speaking of torn apart, Malachi said, how's the arm? Jesse moved it around in a circle. It's much better. Jack isn't a great shot, his eyes are his weakness. He just grazed me. Not that it matters much, as I'll just be pushing paper for the foreseeable future as acting bank president. The familiarity Jesse seemed to share with Black Jack Pruitt was interesting, and the look on his father's face bespoke similar thoughts. I don't envy you that job, Callum said. I can't imagine the mess you'll have to clean up from Gilbert's tenure. He actually did an impeccable job with the books right up until he invested in the mineral rights scam, Jesse replied. They have a good system in place, so we just need to get back to it. The Treasury Department has agreed to give us some of the money Gilbert lost so as to not leave folks' bank accounts empty. It took some convincing, but I think it'll buy us some time before there's a town uprising. I still can't believe folks were as understanding as they were, Malachi said. I was sure we'd need to bring Gilbert in to keep him safe, but you did a good job defusing that powder gig, Jesse. We're thankful you took the job as acting bank president, Pa said. 
I can't think of anyone else who'd do it better. Jesse shrugged his shoulders. It works out for me too. I don't normally stay in one place for long, and it'll be a nice change of pace. Plus, I'd like to be here when Jack decides to return. Leaning back in his chair, Pa furrowed his brow. How is it you know so much about Black Jack Pruitt? I know he's a bank robber and the Treasury Department keeps up with those, but I'd think you know a bit more about him than your average auditor. Jesse paused for a moment, glancing out the window before turning back to speak. First, I'm not your average auditor. I have an interesting set of skills and experiences that help me slough out fraud and take down organized bank crimes. Pa pursed his lips in thought. And second? Second, Jesse said, Jack Pruitt is my half-brother. Rose and her mother moved about the kitchen in a bit of a daze. They'd spent the last two weeks packing everything they owned with no clear direction on where it all would go. As Rose packed Mama's wedding china, the beautiful white dishes with blue flowers adorning the perimeter, she thought about the limited space at both the small cabin Callum was building and the cottage at the parsonage. Neither of them had anything in the way of excess space or storage, so Rose had no idea where the carefully packed crates of dishes, pots and pans, and all the frippery they'd added to make the house a home would go. Papa appeared in the doorway and watched them for a moment with a frown. Staring at his feet, he croaked out his words. I'm sorry. This is all my fault. It was, but now wasn't the time for Rose to agree. We've been through hard times before, Mama said, we'll get through this. Oddly enough, despite all that faced them, Mama seemed to have found the will to rejoin them in a way she hadn't in years. Rose would be forever grateful for the herbs and tonics Edie had given her, as well as the many prayers that the church had prayed on her behalf. Papa sighed. I just worry what will happen to you girls once I'm in prison. I wonder if we shouldn't have just left everything and run so Jack could never get hold of any of you again. Flushing at the idea of leaving Pine Creek and Callum, Rose straightened her shoulders. Running away and hiding doesn't solve anything. Mama and Violet will be at the cottage, and I don't know many men who'd cross Pastor Alex. Bonnie and I'll be on the ranch, within yelling distance of over twenty cowboys. We're going to be all right. Not to mention, she was done hiding, and she'd not be running. If Papa had chosen to leave, he'd have done so without her and Bonnie. The man who stood before her was a shell of the man he'd once been, and Rose didn't imagine he'd put up the fight for Bonnie he once would have. Leaving Mama and Violet at the cottage had been a tough decision, but it was the best one for the time being. Perhaps, after Mama healed a little more, they'd have built another room onto the cabin as initially Bonnie would be sleeping in the loft. I have to admit, Papa said, your young man has proven me wrong on many levels. Before I was against the relationship because of who his pa was, I still didn't think he was good enough for you. I was mistaken. The admission, however gruff it might have been, was a big step for Papa. Without his job at the bank anymore, Papa didn't dress to impress in suits every day. He wasn't allowed to leave the house, so his daily attire was more that of a day laborer than a bank president. It humanized him somehow, though that also may have been the heavy dose of humility he'd been served. I'll go finish packing our room, Papa said. I'm only leaving the things out we'll need until the trial. Rose's ears perked up at the mention of a trial. Do you have a date yet? She didn't want Papa to go to prison any sooner than he inevitably would, but it felt a little like closing one chapter and beginning a new one. No, but Sheriff Carmichael thinks it should be soon, within the next week or two. He crossed the room and pulled Rose into an awkward hug. I'm sorry I couldn't be the father you deserved. You and your sisters deserved so much better. He paused and pinned Mama with his gaze, eyes full of regret. You deserved better as well. Rose wouldn't deny the facts, he had done them wrong. Somewhere in the last few weeks, she'd begun to see some small grace in the reality of her father's shortcomings. She could hate him, goodness knew Violet did, but hate felt like a bigger burden than forgiveness. The truth has come to light, Papa. We can't move backwards, all we can do is move forward and accept help where it's offered. The fact that Rose was willing to accept any help at all was nothing short of a miracle, as only a few months ago she'd have run as far and fast as she could in the opposite direction.
How have your meetings with Pastor Alex been going? Better than I would have imagined, Papa said. I suppose sometimes it takes a man having everything taken from him to see what matters. He's been kind to walk through scriptures of redemption with me. Tears pricked Rose's eyes at the hope that her father would come to a real faith in the Lord that would change bring him to his knees. That's good, Papa. I'm glad. A light knock sounded at the door, and they all turned that direction. It's probably Callum, Papa said. I'll get it. Callum had been by at least once a day since everything had happened, though Rose wasn't sure how with all his work at the ranch. Sometimes, it was first thing in the morning. Other times it was in the evening, at the moment it was early afternoon. There were days he found her in the bakery, days he found her continuing with laundering for others, and days he found her at home. Accepting money from Callum and his family had felt a bit like a knife in Rose's gut, but there was no way they'd have gotten by the last couple of weeks without it. The board of the bank had graciously allowed the family a few extra weeks in the only home Rose had known for years, but as soon as Papa was convicted they'd have to leave. A familiar deep voice drifted through the entryway and into the kitchen just before Callum followed Papa inside. Mrs. Gilbert, he said with a polite nod before turning a smile to Rose. I thought I might steal Rose for a walk. Mama nodded, though her smile still didn't quite reach her eyes. Of course, she replied. You two have fun. Reaching over the crate of dishes, Rose kissed Mama on the cheek. I'll be back before dinner. Take your time, Mama said. Callum, you're welcome to stay if you'd like. I've got a roast on. The smell wafted through the house as it simmered with carrots, onions, and potatoes that Callum's aunt and uncle had brought by. It likely grated on Papa to take such help as well, but he didn't have much choice. Without a paycheck, they'd starve but for the kindness of their friends and neighbors. I'd like that, ma'am, Callum said as he tipped his chin in her direction. Raising his right elbow, Callum offered it to Rose. Would you like to accompany me on a walk, milady? Giggling, Rose stepped forward. Of course, good sir. His arm felt solid and strong, comforting in a way only he had been the past few months. Even when they'd been separated, knowing he cared about her enough to check in had given her some measure of peace on the turbulent waters they'd traversed. When they left the yard and kept going straight, Rose imagined he planned to walk by the creek, though he didn't say specifically. How has your day been? Callum pursed his lips, as though choosing his words carefully. Enlightening. I can't share any more for the time being, but there's more to Jesse Pritchard than we once knew. Raising an eyebrow, Rose turned her attention to Callum. More? Is he untrustworthy? It would be difficult to find someone else to act as bank president on such short notice if Jesse couldn't do the job. No, I don't believe so. He just has a past. Rose thought for a moment. I suppose he'd fit right in with your family. You're not wrong about that. Speaking of which, Callum said as removed his arm from Rose's grasp. They'd reached a part of the creek that ran near town and stopped under a large oak tree that shaded the grass and summer wildflowers. I'd like you to be part of that family, officially. Rose stifled a grin. I thought I already was, aren't we planning to marry at the church in a few weeks? Papa wouldn't be able to attend, Mama likely wouldn't leave the house either, but Bonnie and Violet would be there. Rose had pushed down disappointment at the fact her parents wouldn't be there, despite the hurt Papa had caused. We were, Callum said thoughtfully, but I have a better idea. Suspicious, Rose cocked her head to the side. And what might that be? Callum hesitated for a moment. I know you want to keep the ceremony small, but how about we make it even smaller? I thought we might marry in your house, right there in the parlor, so your parents could attend. His eyes filled with compassion, and Rose didn't think she'd ever met a man so kind. Tears spilled over onto her cheeks as she flew into his arms and pressed a kiss to his cheek. That sounds perfect, but won't you miss not having more of your family there? Callum winked before pulling her lips to his. As he closed the distance, he winked. You just leave that to me, how does Sunday sound? Epilogue I now pronounce you Mr. and Mrs. Callum James Carmichael. Alex beamed as he announced the couple.
Callum, you may kiss your bride. Both sets of parents, Violet, Bonnie, Edie, Helen and Emily all burst into applause as Callum cupped Rose's face in his calloused hands. He wanted to savor this moment, the one so unlike what they'd planned back in the fall, and gazed into her forest green eyes. They all stood in the Gilbert's parlor, a cozy gathering of their nearest and dearest. As much as Callum would have loved his entire family to see them exchange vows, he had to admit the intimate group was special in its own right. Lowering his lips to roses, he took in the scent of lavender from the bouquet she'd carried earlier. He savored the taste of her, not lingering long enough to embarrass her, but taking his time. As he pulled back, Rose's cheeks flushed as the cheers around them continued. A light sheen of tears in her eyes highlighted their already brilliant shine, her smile brighter than he'd seen it in ages. I love you, she mouthed. Always have, Callum answered, always will. Raising his hand in hers and facing their families, both went to her parents as his family shuffled outside. There would be plenty of time for hugs and congratulations at the celebration his family had planned at the ranch, but this moment was about Rose saying, goodbye, to her father. She'd see him again before he left, but the trial was only a handful of days away. It was likely he'd go away for a few years at least, and she'd not be living at home his last few days of freedom. Bonnie had chosen to stay with Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert until the trial but would then move out to the ranch. It made Rose a bit anxious at first, but then she'd realized that it would give Bonnie a little time to spend with their mother now that she'd begun steps toward healing. Mr. Gilbert pulled Rose into his arms, tears flowing down his cheeks. You look beautiful, Rosie. I'm happy for you, and thank you for doing this here. His eyes met Callum's over Rose's head, and Callum nodded. Rose still had a ways to go in healing from the hurt her father caused, but he'd known she'd regret it if he hadn't been present when they made their vows. After another round of hugs from Rose's family, Callum took her hand and led her outside. Come on, Mrs. Carmichael. I have something to show you. Rose eyed him suspiciously, but followed nonetheless. What have you been up to? You'll see, Callum said as he opened the door. There, in the street in front of Rose's parents' house stood his entire family and many of their friends from town. Somehow, even Edie and Lily had pulled themselves out of the fog of having newborns and each held their little ones cradled in their arms. The Thompsons attended, as did many of their school friends, and many families from church. They cheered and threw flower petals in the air as Callum and Rose walked out. Rose gasped. Did you do all this? I'd love to take credit for it, Callum said, but this was mostly Helen. We're all going back to the ranch for a reception. Blinking away tears, Rose placed her hand in his. Thank you. Later that evening, as the sun set on the Circle H, Callum and Rose moved toward the drinks table after dancing the last four songs. Helen stood beside it, a frustrated look on her face. The couple stood beside her, hands clasped, while Callum handed Rose a cup of the mint lemonade Aunt Beth made. What's with the long face? I know you've got a line of fellas waiting to dance with you. He caught Rose's eye and raised a brow. She shrugged, apparently his bride had no more knowledge as to Helen's foul mood than he did. The line of young men waiting wasn't an exaggeration. From the chatter he'd heard but not paid much heed, Helen had been turning men down left and right that evening. Known for her propensity to flirt, it was a little out of character. Maybe, Helen said with a huff, but not the one I want to dance with. Rose nodded in understanding, and Callum's eyes followed her gaze until they stopped on Jesse where he stood with Mayer and Mrs. Hinson. Knowing what he knew about Jesse's family, he wasn't sure how he felt about Helen being too interested. Rose took Helen's hand in hers. I'm sorry, Helen. But maybe it's for the best. Jesse isn't planning on staying here long term. Helen shrugged. Maybe, but I just felt this pull with him. It's like Mama always described how she felt when she met Papa. Callum didn't want to break anyone's confidence, but Helen was like a bull when she wanted something. Maybe you should turn your sights on someone else, Callum suggested gently. There might be more to Jesse than you realize. Helen threw a smirk over her shoulder as she turned and headed in the direction of her parents. That's what I'm counting on. Watching his cousin leave, Callum couldn't help but shake his head. Do you think she heard a word we said? 
Rose chuckled as Callum pulled her into his arms. It's doubtful, but she'll have to trust the Lord knows better than she does. Maybe she'll learn that lesson faster than we did. Closing the distance between their lips with a grin, Callum agreed. Here's hoping. The end. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, subscribe to my channel so you never miss an upload.